Section 1 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoli from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoli from Italy and Switzerland. Introduction by Julie de Marguerite. Translated by Grace Wallace. Introduction in Preface. Felix Mendelssohn Bartoli. Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi was born at Hamburg on the 3rd of February, 1809. The name to which he was destined to add such luster was already high in the knolls of fame. Moses Mendelssohn, his grandfather, a great Jewish philosopher, one of the most remarkable men of his time, was the author of profound metaphysical works, written both in German and Hebrew. To this great power of intellect, Moses Mendelssohn added a purity and dignity of character worthy of the old Stoics. The epigraph on the bust of this ancestor of the composer shows the esteem in which he was held by his contemporaries. Faithful to the religion of his fathers, as wise as Socrates, like Socrates teaching the immortality of the soul, and like Socrates leaving a name that is immortal. One of Moses Mendelssohn's daughters married Frederick Schlegel, and swerving from the religion in which both had been brought up, both became Roman Catholics. Joseph Mendelssohn, the eldest son of this great old man, was also distinguished for his literary taste, and has left two excellent works of very different characters, one on Dante, the other on the system of a paper currency. In conjunction with his brother, Abraham, he founded the baking house of Mendelssohn Company at Berlin, still flourishing under the management of the sons of the original founders, brothers and cousins of Felix, the subject of this memoir. George Mendelssohn, the son of Joseph, was also a distinguished political writer and professor in the University at Bonn. With such an array of intellectual ancestry, the Mendelssohn of our day came into the world at Hamburg on the 3rd of February, 1809. He was named Felix, and a more appropriate name could not have been found for him, for in character, circumstance, and endowment he was supremely happy. Goethe, speaking of him, said the boy was born on a lucky day. His first piece of good fortune was in having not only an excellent virtuous woman for his mother, but a woman who, besides these qualities, possessed extraordinary intellect and had received an education that fitted her to be the mother of children endowed as hers were. She professed the Lutheran creed in which her children were brought up. Being of a distinguished commercial family and an heiress, her husband added her name of Bartoldi to his own. Madame Mendelssohn Bartoldi's other children were... Fanny, her firstborn, whose life is entirely interwoven with that of her brother Felix, and Paul and Rebecca, born some years later. When yet a boy, Felix removed with his parents to Berlin, probably at the time of the foundation of the banking house. The Prussian capital has often claimed the honor of being his birthplace, but that distinction really belongs to Hamburg. His extraordinary musical talent was not long in developing itself, his sister Fanny, his soul's friend and constant companion, almost as richly endowed as himself, aroused his emulation and they studied music together first as an art and then as a science, to be the foundation of future works of inspiration and genius. Zelter, severe and classic, profoundly scientific, inexorable for all that was not true science, became the teacher of these two gifted children, in composition and in counterpoint. For pianoforte playing, Roger was the professor, though some years later, Moshe's added the benefit of his counsels, and Felix was fond of calling himself the pupil of Moshe's, with whom in after life he contracted a close friendship. Zelter was extremely proud of his pupil, soon discovering that instead of industrious and intelligent child, one of the greatest musical geniuses ever known was dawning on the world. When he was but fifteen, Zelter took the young musician to Weimar, and secured for him the acquaintance and goodwill of Goethe, which, as long as Goethe lived, seemed to be the necessary consecration of all talent in Germany. By this time, not only was he an admirable performer on the piano, possessed of a talent for improvisation and a memory so wonderful, that not only could he play almost all Bach, Handel, Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven by heart, but he could also, without hesitation, accompany a whole opera from memory provided he had but seen the score once. The overture to Midsummer's Night's Dream, 
so popular now in every country, was composed before he was 17, and was played for the first time as a duet on the piano by his sister Fanny and himself on the 19th of November, 1826. This is indeed the inspiration of youth with its brilliancy, its buoyancy, its triumphant joy, full of the poetry of a young heart, full of the imagination of a mind untainted by the world. It was not till some years after that Mendelssohn completed the music to Shakespeare's great play. In 1827, Felix left the University of Berlin with great honors, and has left as a specimen of his knowledge a correct, graceful, and elegant translation of Terence's comedy of Andrea, a work greatly approved of by Goethe. He excelled in gymnastics, was an elegant writer, and like Lord Byron, a bold and accomplished swimmer. The year he left the university, he went to England, where Harrietta Sontag was in the height of her fame. He played in several concerts where she sang, as well as with Moschles, his old friend and teacher, now established in London. On his return to Germany in 1830, he visited Goethe at Weimar, and there planned his journey to Italy, a country which all men of genius yearn after, as the promised land of inspiration. When in Rome, Felix Mendelssohn began the grand cantata of the Vaupture's Neat, to Goethe's words, at which he worked for some years. On his return from his travels, Mendelssohn, who had now all the assurance and self-possession of an artist, was appointed chapel master at Dusseldorf, a position which gave him the direction of the grand musical festivals held at the time in the city in Aix-la-Chapelle. It was during his residence in Dusseldorf that he composed his oratorio of St. Paul and also the first set of his Songs Without Words for the piano, where the music, by its varied expression and its intensity, alone told the story of the poet. These compositions were a novelty for pianoforte players, and it inaugurated a new style full of interest, gradually setting aside the variations and sonatas which had become so meaningless and tedious. The oratorio of St. Paul was not given until 1836, when it was produced at Dusseldorf under his own special superintendence. Mendelssohn composed very rapidly, but he was cautious to give his works to the public until they thoroughly satisfied his judgment most critical to which they could be submitted. In the later part of 1836, having gone to Frankfurt to direct a concert of Cecilia Verin, he became acquainted with Cecilia Jean Renaud, a beautiful and accomplished girl, the second daughter of a clergyman of the Reformed Church. In the spring of 1837, she became his wife. The marriage had been delayed some months by Mendelssohn's ill health. He had begun to feel the first symptoms of the nervous disease, affecting the brain, from which he was destined henceforth to suffer, and of which, finally, he was fated to die. After his marriage, he undertook the direction of Leipzig concerts. All over Germany, Mendelssohn was in requisition. His immense genius as a composer, his great skill as a conductor, his gentle, fascinating manners, gave him extraordinary popularity. It was England, however, after all, who appreciated him the most. Sacred music seems to appeal especially to the English taste. Haydn, Handel, Beethoven have, have all found more patronage and appreciation in England than in their own country. So it was with Mendelssohn. The greatest musical triumph ever achieved was the performance of the oratorio of Elijah, giving at Birmingham, the work on which Mendelssohn's fame will rest. He was nine years in composing this oratorio, and notwithstanding the most flattering ovation, Mendelssohn's serene temperament was not moved to vanity or conceit. In the very moment of his success, he sat down modestly to correct many things that had not satisfied him. The trio for three female voices without accompaniment, one of the most beautiful pieces in the oratorio, was added by the composer after the public had declared itself satisfied with the work as it originally stood. Elijah was produced in 1847, but Mendelssohn had been several times in England before this, playing at the ancient and philharmonic concerts. At that time, the resort of the elite in London. It was during one of these visits in 1842 that Prince Albert, who was a German and musician, had sought his acquaintance, introduced him to Queen Victoria. The visit was entirely devoid of formality, for without any previous announcement, the prince conducted Mendelssohn from his private apartments to the Queen's study. 
where they found her surrounded by papers, just terminating her morning's work. The queen receiving him most graciously apologized to the composer for the untidiness of the room, beginning herself to put in order and laughingly accepting his assistance. After some agreeable conversation, Mendelssohn sat down to the piano and played whatever the queen asked of him. When at length he rose, Prince Albert asked the queen to sing, and gracefully choosing one of Mendelssohn's own compositions, she complied with the request. Mendelssohn, of course, applauded, but the queen laughingly told him that she had been too frightened to sing well. Ask La Blanche. La Blanche was her singing master, added the queen. He will tell you that I can sing better than I have done today. Prince Albert and the Queen were ever warm patrons and friends of Mendelssohn. During all this time so brilliantly filled up, Mendelssohn's health was continually and gradually declining. His nervous susceptibility was such that he was often obliged to abstain from playing for weeks together. His gentle and affectionate wife, watching him and keeping him as much as possible from composition. This was a very difficult task, for Mendelssohn was a great worker. Even when traveling, he would take out pen and ink from his pocket and compose at one corner of the table whilst the dinner was getting ready. Little was Mendelssohn prepared, either mentally or physically at this time, to bear the one great sorrow that overwhelmed this happy life, on which the sun of prosperity had ever shone. His sister Fanny, to whom many of his letters are written, and who has been the companion of his studies, possessing the same tastes and a great deal of the same genius, his sister Fanny, who was the nearest and dearest affection of his life, was suddenly taken from him. She had married and was living in Frankfurt, where she was the ornament of society, in this enlightened and art-loving city, when in the midst of a rehearsal of Faust, a symphony of her own composition, she was struck by apoplexy and fell back dead in her chair. There is no doubt that this shock considerably increased the disease from which Mendelssohn was suffering, and though he used to rally and even appear resigned, this sorrow, until the day of his death, lay heavily at his heart. Again, he tried to find health and peace in travel. He went to Switzerland with his wife, who strove to keep him from all occupation and labor, but he would gently urge her to let him work. This time is not far off when I shall rest. I must make the most of time given to me. I know not how short a time it may be, he would say to her. On his return from Switzerland, in Baden-Baden, he went to Berlin, and once more all that remained of this tenderly attached family were united for a short time. At length he returned to his home in Leipzig, serene as ever, but worn to a shadow by the acute and continued pains in the head for which he could obtain no relief. On the 9th of October he went to the house of a friend, one of the artists of the Leipzig concerts, and entreated her to sing for him a song he had that night composed. By a strange coincidence, the song began with these words, Vanished has the light of day. It was Mendelssohn's last composition, the last music he heard on earth, for whilst the lady was singing it, he was seized with vertigo and was carried insensible back to his house. He recovered, however, comparatively from this attack, with a second stroke of apoplexy placed his life in extreme peril, and a third, on the 3rd of November, made him utterly unconscious. Towards nine o'clock on the evening of the 4th, 1847, he breathed his last, going to his everlasting rest as easily and as calmly as a tired child sinks to sleep. He was in the 39th year of his age. Mendelssohn's death was looked upon throughout Germany as a public calamity. The funeral ceremonies at Leipzig were of a most imposing character, and all the way from Leipzig to Berlin, where the corpse was taken, to be buried in the family vault, the most touching honors greeted it. Nearby, all the crowned heads of Europe wrote letters of condolence to his widow. Mendelssohn, as a musician, is profoundly original. In his oratorios, Paul and Elijah, he has swerved from the conventional religious style, eschewing all fugues. His oratorios are full of power and contain great dramatic effects at once grand and solemn. His other music is remarkable for the sweetness of its melodies, its earnest simplicity. His instrumentality is scientific without being pedantic or heavy, and utterly devoid of antiquated formalism. Though pathetic often, there is always a vigor and life in all his inspirations. 
the low mourn for a wail that runs through all Chopin's works, arising from a morbid condition of health and heart, is never felt in Mendelssohn. There is none of the bitter sweetness, the long suffering that artists' lives entail and that artists infuse into their works. For Mendelssohn was a happy man from first to last. Mendelssohn, the happy, the born born on that lucky day, has left a life record that amid the gloom, heart-wrenching, and often degrading history of artists, shines with a chaste and holy life. Nature, the word and circumstance, has done everything for him. To the great and all-sufficient gift of his musical genius he had many others. He had the eye of a painter, the heart of a poet. His intellect was of the highest order. He was tall, handsome, graceful. His social position was one of the finest in Berlin, rich and surrounded by the tenderest family affections. With all these advantages, with all the success that attended him, with all the flattery lavished on him, Mendelssohn was never vain or proud, and throughout his life was utterly free from envy. His fine, fearless, childlike spirit led him through the world, unconscious of evil, undaunted by it. With all the temptations that must have assailed the young, handsome, rich man, there is not one moment of his life over which his friends would wish to draw a veil. On such a life as that of Felix Mendelssohn, it is good for everyone to look. For once, genius is not set forth as a dazzling screen to hide and excuse disorder and crime. But genius, that one great gift from heaven, was employed as heaven would have directed it. Each action, each succeeding year of his life, bringing forth in various but harmonious ways that extraordinary moral and intellectual worth, that rare beauty of character that endeared him to all who know him, and ensured him that rare beauty of character that endeared him to all who knew him, ensured him the unvarying love of kindred and friends, and the admiration of the whole world. Preface Last year, a paragraph was inserted in the newspapers requesting anyone who possessed letters from Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi to send them to Professor Droysen or to myself, with the view of completing a selection of his correspondence which we contemplated publishing. Our design in this was twofold. In the first place, we wished to offer the public in Mendelssohn's own words, which always so truly and faithfully mirrored his thoughts the most genuine impression of his character. And secondly, we thought that the biographical element contained in such a correspondence might be of infinite use in the compilation of a memoir, which we reserve for a future day, and serve as its precursor and basis. There are difficulties, however, post the immediate fulfillment of our original purpose to its full extent, and at present it is impossible to decide when these can be removed. I have, therefore, formed the resolution to carry out my plan in the meantime, within more circumscribed limits, but which leaves me unfettered. On Mendelssohn's return from his visit to England in the year 1829, he came to Berlin for a short time to attend a family festivity, and thence in 1830 proceeded to Italy, returning through Switzerland to France, and in the beginning of 1832 visiting England for the second time. This period, which to a certain degree forms a separate section of his life, and which, through the vivid impressions it made, assuredly exercised an important influence on Mendelssohn's development. We may mention that he was only one in twenty at the commencement of his journey, supplies us with a number of letters addressed to his parents, to his sisters Fanny and Rebecca, as well as to myself. I have also added some communications of the same date to various friends, partly entire, and partly in extracts, and now present them to the public in their original integrity. Those who are personally acquainted with Mendelssohn, and who wish once more to realize him as he was in, when in life, and those also who would be glad to acquire a more definite idea of his individuality than can be found in the general inferences deduced from his musical creations, will not lay down these letters dissatisfied. Along with this particular source of interest, they offer a more universal one, as they prove how admirably Mendelssohn's superior nature and perceptions of art mutually pervaded and regulated each other. With this view, it appeared to me a duty to give the public these letters, stored up in the peaceful home for which they were originally destined and exclusively intended. 
and thus to make them accessible to a more extended circle. They begin by a visit to Goethe. May his words then accompany these letters as an appropriate convoy. Be sure the works of mighty men, the good, the faithful, the sublime, stored in the gallery of time, repose a while to wake again. Paul Mendelssohn Bartoli, Berlin, March 1861 End of section 1section two of letters of felix mendelssohn bartoldi from italy and switzerland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. letters of felix mendelssohn bartoldi from italy and switzerland translated by grace wallace section two may twenty first eighteen thirty through june sixth eighteen thirty Weimar, May 21st, 1830. Never in the whole course of my travels do I remember a more glorious and inspiring day for a journey than yesterday. At an early hour in the morning, the sky was gray and cloudy, but the sun presently burst forth. The air was cool and fresh, and being Ascension Sunday, the people were all dressed in their best. In one village, I saw them crowding into churches as I passed, in another, coming away from divine service, and, last of all, playing at bowls. The gardens were bright with tulips, and I drove quickly past, eagerly looking at everything. At Weisenfels they gave me a little basket carriage, and at Nomburg an open drochki. My efforts, including my hair and cloak, were piled upon it behind. I brought a few bunches of lilies of the valley, and thus I traveled on through the country, as if on a pleasure excursion. Some collegians came up behind me in Naumburg and envied me. When we drove past President G., seated in a small carriage, which evidently had some difficulty in containing him, and his daughters, or wives, in short, two ladies with him, who appeared equally envious of my position, we actually trotted up to Cousin Hill, for the horses scarcely drew bridle and overtook several heavily laden carriages, the drivers of which no doubt also envied me, for I was really to be envied. The scenery had a charming air of spring, so cheerful and gay and blooming, the sun sank solemnly behind the hills, and presently we came up with the Russian minister in his suite, in two heavy carriages, each with four horses in true ponderous official array, and my light drotsky darted past him like a hare. In the evening I got a pair of restive horses so that I had my little annoyance also, according to my theory, enchanting pleasure, and not a single bar did I compose all day, but enjoyed complete idleness. It was a delicious day and one I shall not soon forget. I close this description with the remark that the children in Erhardsburg dance merrily around hand in hand, just like ours do at home, and that appearance of a stranger did not in the least disturb them. In spite of his distinguished air, I should have liked to join their game. May 24th. I wrote this before going to see Goethe early in the forenoon, after a walk in the park, but I could not find a moment to finish my letter to now. I shall probably remain here for a couple days, which is no sacrifice, for I never saw the old gentleman so cheerful and amiable as on this occasion, or so talkative and communicative. My especial reason, however, for staying two days longer is a very agreeable one, and makes me almost vain, or I ought to say proud, and I do not intend to keep it a secret from you. Goethe, you must know, sent me a letter yesterday addressed to an artist here, a painter, which I am to deliver myself, and Otilia confided to me that it contains a commission to take my portrait, as Goethe wishes to place it in a collection of likenesses he has recently commenced of his friends. This circumstance gratified me exceedingly, as, however, I have not yet seen that complacent artist who is to accomplish this, nor has he seen me. It is probable that I shall have to remain here until the day after tomorrow. I don't in the least regret this, for, as I have told you, I live a most agreeable life here, and thoroughly enjoy the society of the old poet. I have dined with him every day, and am invited again today. This evening there is to be a party at his house where I am to play. It is quite delightful to hear him conversing on every subject, and seeking information on all points. I must, however, tell you everything regularly and in order, so that you may know each separate detail. Early in the day, I went to see Delia, who, though still delicate and often complaining, I thought more cheerful than formerly, and quite as kind and amiable as ever towards myself. 
We have been constantly together since then, and it has been a source of much pleasure to me to know her more intimately. Ulrika is more agreeable and charming than formerly. A certain earnestness pervades her whole nature, and she has now a degree of repose and a depth of feeling that render her one of the most attractive creatures I have ever met. The two boys, Walter and Wolf, are lively, studious, cordial lads, and to hear them talking about Grandpa's Faust is most pleasant. But to return to my narrative, I sent Zilter's letter at once to Goethe, who immediately invited me to dinner. I thought him a very little changed in appearance, but rather silent and apathetic. I think he wished to see how I demeaned myself. I was vexed, and thought that possibly he was always now in this mood. Happily, the conversation turned on the Frauen in Weimar, and on the chaos a humorous paper circulated among themselves by the ladies here. I have soared so high as to be a contributor to this undertaking. All at once the old man became quite gay, laughing at the two ladies about their charities and intellectualism, and their subscriptions and hospital work, which he seems cordially to detest. He called on me to aid him in his onslaught, and as I did not require to be asked twice, he speedily became just what he used to be, and at last more kind and confidential than I have ever seen him. The assault soon became general. The robber bride, of these, he said, contained all that an artist these days required to live happily, a robber and a bride. Then he attacked the young people of the present day for their universal tendency to languor and melancholy, and related the story of a young lady to whom he had once paid court, and who also felt some interest in him. A discussion on the exhibitions followed, and a fancy and bazaar for the poor, where the ladies of Weimar were the shop women, and where he declared it was impossible to purchase anything because the young people made a private agreement amongst themselves, and hid the different articles till the proper purchaser appeared. After dinner, he at once began, Gut Kinder, whose big Kinder, Musimel, Stieg sein, Tolles Volk, etc., his eyes looking those of a drowsy old lion. Then he begged me to play to him, and said it seemed strange that he had heard no music for so long, that he supposed we had made great progress, but he knew nothing of it. He wished me to tell him a great deal on the subject, saying, Do let us have a little rational conversation together. And turning to Utilea, he said, No doubt you have already made your own wise arrangements, but they must yield to my express orders, which are, that you must make tea here this evening, and that we may all be together again. When in return she asked if it would not make him too late, as Rimir was coming to work with him, he replied, As you gave your children a holiday for their Latin today, they might hear Felix play. I think you might also give me one day of relaxation for my work. He invited me to return to dinner, and I played a great deal to him in the evening. My three Welsh pieces, dedicated to three English sisters, have great success here, and I am trying to rub up my English. As I had begged Goethe to address me as thou, he desired Otilia to say to me on the following day that in case I must remain longer than to the two days I had fixed, otherwise he could not regain the more familiar habit I wished. He repeated this to me himself, saying that he did not think I should lose much by staying a little longer, and invited me always to dine with him when I had no other engagement. I have consequently been with him every day, and yesterday I told him a great deal about Scotland and Hingstenberg and Spontini, and Hegel's aesthetics. He sent me to Tierfurth with the ladies, who had prohibited my driving Berka because a very pretty girl lived there, and he did not wish to plunge me into misery. I thought of myself. This was indeed the Goethe whom people will one day say, that he was not one single individual, but consisted of several little Goetheden. I am to play over to him today various pieces of Bach, Haydn, and Mozart, and thus lead him on. As he said, to the present day, I should indeed have put very foolish to have regretted my delay. Besides, I am a conscientious traveler, and have seen the library, Iphigenia in Olis, Homo has struck out all the octaves, etc. Felix. Weimar, May 25th, 1830. I have just received your welcome letter, written on Ascension Day. I cannot help myself, but must still write to you from this place. I will soon send you, dear Fanny, a copy of my symphony. I am having it written out here and mean to forward it to Leipzig, where perhaps it will be performed, with strict orders to deliver it into your own hands as soon as possible. Try to collect opinions as to the title I ought to select, Reformation Symphony, 
Confession Symphony, Symphony for a Church Festival, Juvenile Symphony, or whatever you like. Write to me on this subject, and instead of a number of stupid suggestions, send me one clever one. Still, I should rather like to hear some of the nonsensical ones, sure to be devised on the occasion. Yesterday evening, I was at a party at Goethe's and played alone the whole evening. The concert stick, the invitation à la valse, and Weber's Polonaise in C, and my Scotch sonata. It was over by ten o'clock, but I of course stayed till twelve o'clock, when we had all sorts of fun, dancing and singing. So you see I lead a most jovial life here. The old gentleman goes into his room regularly at nine o'clock, but as soon as he is gone, we begin our frolics and never separate before midnight. Tomorrow my portrait is to be finished, a large black crayon sketch, and very like, but I look rather sulky. Gerta is so friendly and kind to me that I don't know how to thank him sufficiently, or what to do to deserve it. In the forenoon he likes me to play to him the compositions of the various great masters, in chronological order, for an hour, and also tell him the progress they have made, while he sits in a dark corner, with Jupiter Tunans, his old eyes flashing on me. He did not wish to hear anything of Beethoven's, but I told him that I could not let him off, and played the first part of the symphony in C minor. It seemed to have a singular effect on him. At first he said, This causes no emotion, nothing but astonishment. It is grandiose. He continued, grumbling in this way, and after a long pause he began again. It is very grand, very wild. It makes one fear that the house is about to fall down, and what it must be when played by a number of men together. During dinner, in the midst of another subject, he alluded to it again. You know that I dine with him every day, when he questions me very minutely, and is always so gay and communicative after dinner, that we generally remain together alone for an hour while he speaks on uninterruptedly. I have no greater pleasure than when he brings out engravings and explains them to me, or gives an opinion of Annani or Lamartine's elegies, or the theatre of Pretty Girls. He has several times lately invited people, which he rarely does now, so that most of the guests had not seen him for a long time. I then play a great deal, and he compliments me before all these people, and gone stupend is his favorite expression. Today he has invited a number of Weimar beauties on my account, because he thinks I ought to enjoy the society of young people. If I go up to him on such occasions, he says, My young friend, you must join the ladies and make yourself agreeable to them. I am not, however, devoid of tact so I contrived to have him asked yesterday whether I did not come too often. He growled out the Otelia, who put the question to him, that he must now begin to speak to me in good earnest, for I had such clear ideas, and that he hoped to learn much from me. I became twice as tall in my own estimation when Otelia repeated this to me. He said to me himself yesterday, and when he declared that there were many subjects he had at heart that I must explain to him, I said, oh, certainly, but I thought, this is an honor I can never forget. Often is the very reverse. Felix. Munich, June 6th, 1830. It is a long time since I have written to you, and I fear you may have been anxious on my account. You must not be angry with me, for it is really no fault of mine, and I have been not a little annoyed about it. I expedited my journey as well as I could, inquiring everywhere about diligences, and invariably receiving false information. I traveled through one night on purpose to enable me to write to you by this day's post, of which I was turned at Nuremberg, and when at last I arrive, I find that no post leaves here today. It is enough to drive one wild, and I feel all out of patience with Germany and her petty principalities, her different kinds of money, her diligences which require an hour and a quarter for a German mile, and her Thuringian forests, where there is incessant rain and wind, Nay, even with her Fidelio this evening, for, though dead beat, I must do my duty by going to see it, when I would far rather go to bed. Pray do not be angry with me, or scold me for my delay in writing. I do assure you that this is the very night while I was traveling. I thought I saw peeping through the clouds the shadow of your threatening finger, but I shall now proceed to explain why I could not write sooner. Some days after my last letter from Weimar, I wished, as I told you, to set off for this place, and did so during dinner to Goethe, who made no reply. After dinner, however, he withdrew with Otelia into the recess of a window, and said, You must persuade him to remain. She endeavored to prevail on me to do so, and walked up and down in the garden with me. 
I wished, however, to show that I was a man of determination, so I remained steady to my resolve. Then came the old gentleman himself, and he said he saw no use in my being in such a hurry, that he had still a great deal to tell me, and I had still a great deal to play to him. And what I had told him as to the object of my journey was really all nonsense. Weimar was my present object, and he could not see that I was likely to find in d'Hote anywhere else what I could not obtain here. I would see plenty of hotels in my travels. He talked on in this style, which touched my heart, especially as Ottilia and Ulrich added their persuasions, assuring me that the old gentleman much more often insisted on people going away than on their remaining. And as no one can be so sure of enjoying a number of happy days, that he can afford to throw away those that cannot fail to be pleasant. And as they promised to go with me to Jena, I resolved not to be a man of determination and agreed to stay. Seldom in the course of my life have I so little regretted any resolution as on this occasion, and the following day was by far the most delightful that I have ever passed in Goethe's house. After an early drive, I found old Goethe very cheerful. He began to converse on various subjects, passing from the Muetta de Portici to Walter Scott, and thence to the beauties of Weimar, to the students and the robbers, and so on to Schiller. Then he spoke on uninterruptedly for more than an hour, with the utmost animation, about Schiller's life and writings, and his position in Weimar. He proceeded to speak of the late Grand Duke, and of the year 1775, which he designated as the intellectual spring of Germany, declaring that no man living could describe it so well as he could. Indeed, it had been his intention to have devoted the second volume of his life to this subject. But what with botany and meteorology and other stuff of the same kind, for which no one cared a straw, he had not yet been able to fulfill his purpose. He proceeded to relate various anecdotes of the time when he was director of the theatre, and when I wished to thank him, he said, It is mere chance, it all comes to light incidentally, called forth by your welcome presence. These words sounded marvelously pleasant to me. In short, it was one of those conversations that a man can never forget so long as he lives. Next day, he made me a present of a sheet of the manuscript of Faust, and at the bottom of the page he wrote, to my dear young friend, F. N. B., mighty yet delicate master of the piano, a friendly souvenir of happy May days in 1830, J. W. von Goethe. He also gave me three letters of introduction to take with me. If that relentless Fidelio did not begin at so early an hour, I could tell you much more, but as it is, I have only time to detail my farewell interview with the old gentleman. At the very beginning of my visit to Weimar, I spoke of a print taken in Adrian von of a peasant family praying, which nine years ago made a deep impression on me. When I went at an early hour to take leave of Goethe, I found him seated beside a large portfolio. He said, So you are actually going away? I must try to keep all right till you return. But at all events, we won't part now without some pious feelings, so let us once more look at the praying family together. He told me that I must sometimes write to him. Courage, courage, I mean to do so from this very place. And then he embraced me, and we drove off to Denna, where the Fromans received me with much kindness, and where the same evening I took leave of Otilia in Ulrika and came here. Nine o'clock. Fidelio was over, and while waiting for supper, I had a few words. Shenchu is very much gone off. The quality of her voice has become husky. She repeatedly sang flat, yet there were moments where her expression was so touching that I wept in my own fashion. All the others were bad and there was also much to censure in the performance. Still, there's great talent in the orchestra, and the style in which they played the overture was very good. Certainly our Germany is a strange land, producing great people, but not appreciating them, possessing many fine singers and intellectual artists, but none sufficiently modest or subordinate to render their parts faithfully and without false pretension. Marzalina introduces all sorts of flourishes into her part. Jacquino is a blockhead, the minister a simpleton, and when a German like Beethoven writes an opera, then comes a German like Stunz, Poisson, or whoever I may have been, and strikes out the ritournelle in simply unnecessary passages. Another German adds a trombone part to his symphonies, a third declares that Beethoven is overloaded, and thus a great man is sacrificed. Farewell, be happy and merry, and may my heartfelt wishes to you be fulfilled. Felix. End of section 2
Section 3 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. Translated by Grace Wallace. Music provided by Project Gutenberg. June 14th through September 28th, 1830. Munich, June 14th, 1830. My dearest sister, I received your letter on the 5th this morning. I see from it that you are not yet quite well. I wish I were with you and could see you and talk to you, but this is impossible, so I have written a song for you expressive of my wishes and thoughts. You were in my mind when I composed it, and I was in a tender mood. There is indeed nothing very new in it. You know me well, and what I am. In no respect am I changed, so you may smile at this and rejoice. I could say and wish many other things for you but none better. And this letter, too, shall contain nothing else. You know that I am always your own, and may it please God to bestow on you all that I hope and pray. Music transcribed. August 11th, 1830. Dearest Mother, How a traveling musician bore his bad luck in Stylesburg. A fragment from the unwritten journal of Count F. M. B. Continuation. After I finished my last letter to you, a regular day of misfortunes commenced for me. I took up my pencil so entirely destroyed two of my pet sketches taken in the Bavarian mountains that I was obliged to tear them from my book and to throw them out the window. This provoked me exceedingly, so to divert my mind, I went to Capuchin Hill. Of course I contrived to lose my way, and at the very moment when I at last found myself on the summit, it began to rain so furiously that I was forced to run down again, with all speed under the shelter of an umbrella. Well, I resolved at all events to have a look at the monastery at the foot of the hill, so I rang the bell, when suddenly I recollected that I had not sufficient money to give the monk who was to show the building. And this is a kind of thing that they take highly amiss, I hurried away without waiting till the porter appeared. I then closed my packets of letters from Leipzig and took it myself to the post, but there I was told that it must first be examined at the custom house, so thither I went. They kept me waiting a whole hour till they composed a certificate of three lines and behaved so saucily that I was forced to quarrel with them. Hang Salzburg, I thought, so I ordered horses from Ischel, where I hoped to escape from all my bad luck. No horses were to be had without a permission from the police. I went to the police office. No permission can be granted till you bring your passport. Why pursue the subject? After innumerable delays and running about hither and thither, the wished-for post-carriage arrived. My dinner was over, my luggage ready, and I thought that at last all was in good train. My bill and the servant's fees were paid. Just as I reached the door, I saw two handsome open carriages approaching at a foot's pace and the people of the inn hurrying to receive the travellers, who were following on foot. I, however, paid no attention to the new arrivals, but jumped into my carriage. I observed that at the same moment one of the travelling carriages drew up close to mine, and that a lady was seated in it. But what a lady! That you may not instantly jump to the conclusion that I had suddenly fallen in love, which would have been the crowning point of my unlucky day, I must tell you that she was an elderly lady, but she looked very amiable and benevolent. She wore a black dress and a massive gold chain when she paid the postillion his fare. Heaven knows why I continued to arrange my luggage instead of driving off. I did look across continually at the other carriage, and though the lady was an entire stranger to me, I felt a strong inclination to address her. It might be mere imagination on my part, but I do think she too looked at the dusty traveller in his student's cap. At length she got out of the carriage and stood close to the door of my vehicle, leaning her hand on it and I required all my knowledge of the common properties of travelling not to get out myself and say to her, Dear lady, what may your name be? Routine, however, conquered, and I called out with an air of dignity, Postilion, go on. 
on which the lady quickly withdrew her hand and we set off. I felt in no very pleasant humor, and while thinking over the events of the day, I fell asleep. A carriage with two gentlemen passing us woke me up, and the following dialogue ensued between the postillion and myself. I. These gentlemen are coming from Ischel, and so I shall probably find no horses there. He. Oh, two carriages that stopped at the inn were also from Ischel. Still, there is no doubt you will get horses. I. Are you sure they came from Ischel? He. Quite sure. They go there every year, and were here last summer also. I drove them. It is the Baroness from Vienna. Heavens, thought I. And she is dreadfully rich and has such handsome daughters. When they went to Berchtesgaden to visit the mines, I drove them. And very nice they looked in their miners' dresses. They had a grand estate, and yet they speak to us quite familiarly. Halt, I cried. What name? Don't know. Perennia? Not sure. Drive back, said I, in a resolute tone. If I do, we shall not reach Ischel tonight, and we have got to go over the worst hill. You can learn the name at the next stage. I hesitated, and we drove on. They did not know the name at the next stage, nor at the following one either. At length, at the end of seven long, wearisome hours, we arrived, and before I left the carriage, I said, Who were the party who drove to Salzburg this morning in two carriages? And received a quiet reply. Baroness Perenia, she proceeds to Gastein early tomorrow morning, but returns four or five days hence. Now I had arrived at a certainty, and I also spoke to her driver, who said that none of the family were here. The two gentlemen I met in a carriage on the road were the sons of the Baroness, the very two I had never seen. In addition to all this, I remembered the wretched portrait that I had once got a glimpse of at our Aunt H's, and the lady in the black dress was Baroness Perenia. Heaven knows when I may have another opportunity of seeing her. I do not think that she ever could have made a more pleasing impression on me, and I shall not assuredly soon forget her attractive appearance and her kind expression of countenance. Nothing is more satisfactory than a presentiment. We all experience them, but we never discover till too late that they really were presentiments. I would have returned then and there, and travelled through the night, I reflected that I should only overtake her at the very moment of her departure, or that possibly she might have left Salzburg before my arrival, and that I should frustrate all the plan of my journey to Vienna. At one moment I thought of going to Gastein, but I could not help feeling that Salzburg had treated me very badly, so I once more said adieu, and went to bed very crestfallen. Next morning I desired that her empty house should be pointed out to me, and made a sketch of it for you, dear mother. My bad luck, however, was still growling in the distance, for I could find no favorable spot to take my sketch from. Besides, they charged me more than a ducat at the inn for one night's entertainment, etc., etc. I gave utterance to various anathemas, both in English and German, and drove away, laying aside among the things of the past, Ischel, Salzburg, Baroness, Peraria, and the Trouncy, until I came on here, where I have taken a day's rest. Tomorrow I intend to purpose my journey and DV to sleep in Vienna the day after. I will write to you further from thence, and thus ended my day of misfortunes, truth, and no poetry. Not even the leaning the hand against the door of my carriage is invention, all is a portrait taken from life. The most incomprehensible thing is that I should have totally overlooked Flora, who it seems was also there. For the old lady in a tartan cloak who went into the inn was Frau von W., and the old gentleman with green spectacles who followed her could not well have been Flora. In short, when things once take a wrong turn, they will have their course. I can write no more today, for my disappointment is still too recent. In my next letter, I shall describe Salzkammergut and all the beauties of my journey yesterday. How right Devriant was to advise me to take this route. The Traunstein also and the Traun Falls are wonderfully fine. And after all, the world is a very pleasant world, and it is fortunate for me that you are in it, and that I shall find letters from you the day after tomorrow, and possibly much that is agreeable besides. Dear Fanny, I mean now to compare my non nobis in the symphony in A minor. Dear Rebecca, if you could hear me singing Im Warm Thal in spasmodic fashion, you would think it rather deplorable. You could sing it better. Oh, Paul. You can declare that you understand Stein Golden, W. W. Golden, Heavy Golden, Light Golden, Conversations Golden, and the Devil and his Grandmother's Golden. I don't, one bit. I wish, therefore, that you were with me, but for many reasons besides this one. Farewell. Petersburg, September 27th, 1830. Dear Brother, Peals of bells, drums, and music, 
Carriages on carriages, people hurrying in all directions, everywhere gay crowds. Such is the general aspect around me, for tomorrow is the coronation of the king, which the whole city has been expecting since yesterday, and are now imploring that the sky may clear up and wake bright and cheerful. For the grand ceremony, which ought to have taken place yesterday, was obliged to be deferred on the counts of the torrents of rain. This afternoon, the sky is blue and beautiful, and the moon is now shining down tranquilly on the tumult of the city. Tomorrow, at a very early hour, Crown Prince is to take his oaths, as King of Hungary, in the large marketplace. He is then to go to church in grand procession, attended by a whole array of bishops and nobles of the realm, and afterwards rides up to Kringsberg, which lies opposite my window, in order to wave his sword towards the bank of the Danube in the four quarters of the globe, in token that he takes possession of his new realm. This excursion has made me acquainted with the new country, for Hungary with her magnates, her high dignitaries, her oriental luxury, and also her barbarism is to be seen here, and the streets offer a spectacle which is to me both novel and striking. We really seem here to approach closer to the east, the miserably obtuse peasants or serfs, the troops of gypsies, the equipage, and the retainers of the nobles overloaded with gold and gems, for the grandees themselves are only visible through the closed windows of their carriages, then the singularly bold national physiognomy, the yellow hue, the long moustaches, the soft foreign idiom, all this makes a most multi-impression in the world. Early yesterday, I went alone through the streets. First came a long array of jovial officers on spirited little horses, behind them a crew of gypsies making music, succeeded by Vienna fashionables with eyeglasses and kid gloves, conversing with a capuchin monk, then a couple of uncivilized peasants in long white coats, their hats pressed down on their foreheads, and their straight black hair cut even all around. They have reddish-brown complexions and languid gait, and an indescribable expression of savage stupidity and indifference. They came a couple of sharp, acute-looking students of theology, in their long blue coats, walking arm in arm, Hungarian proprietors in their dark blue national costume, court servants, a number of carriages every moment arriving, covered in mud. I followed the crowd as they slowly moved on up the hill, and so at last I arrived at the dilapidated castle, which commands an extensive view of the whole city and the Danube. People were looking down all sides from the ancient white walls and from the towers and balconies. In every corner, boys were scribbling their names on the walls for the benefit of posterity, and in a small chamber, perhaps once a time a chapel or sleeping apartment, an ox was in the act of being roasted whole, and as it turned on the spit, the people shouted with delight. A succession of cannons bristled before the castle, destined to bellow forth their appropriate thunders at the coronation. Below on the Danube, which runs very rapidly here, darting with the speed of an arrow through the pontoon bridge, lay a new streamer that had just arrived, laden with strangers. Then the extensive view of the flat but wooded country, the meadow overflowed by the Danube, of the embankments and streets swarming with human beings, and the mountains clothed with Hungarian vines. All this was not a little strange and foreign. Then the pleasant contrast of living in the same house with the best and most friendly people in the world, and finding novelty doubly interesting in their society. These were really among the happy days, dear brother, that a kind providence so often and so richly bestows on me. September 28th, 1 o'clock. The king is crowned. The ceremony was wonderfully fine. How could I ever try to describe it to you? An hour hence, we will all drive back to Vienna, and thence I pursue my journey. There is a tremendous uproar under my window, and the burgher guards are flocking together, but only for the purpose of shouting, Viva! I pushed my way through the crowd, while our lady saw everything from the windows, and never can I forget the effect of all this brilliant and almost fabulous magnificence. In the great square of the hospitallers, the people were closely packed together, for there were oaths, for there the oaths were to be taken on a platform hung with cloth, and afterwards the people were to be allowed the privilege of tearing down the cloth for their own use. Close by was a fountain spreading red and white Hungarian wine. The Gerandiers could not keep back the people. Only Lucky Hackney Coach had stopped for a moment and was instantly covered with men, who clambered on the spokes of the wheel and on the roof and on the box, swarming on it like ants. So that was the coachman, unable to drive on without becoming a murderer and forced to wait quietly where he was. When the procession arrived, which was received bareheaded, I had the utmost difficulty of taking off my hat and holding it above my head. An old Hungarian, however, behind me, whose view it interceded, quickly devised a remedy, for without ceremony he made a snatch at my unlucky hat, and in an instant flanned it to the size of a cap. Then they yelled as if they had all been spitted, and fought for the cloth. In short, they were a mob, 
but my magyars the fellows looked as if they were born noblemen and privileged to live at ease looking very melancholy but writing like the devil when the procession descended the hill first came the court servants covered with embroidery the trumpeters and kettle drums the heralds and all that class and then suddenly galloped along the street a mad comte en plein carrière his horse plunging and capering and the comparisons edged with gold the count himself a mass of diamonds rare herons plumes and velvet embroidery though he had not yet assumed his state uniform being bound to ride so madly count sander is the name of this furious cavalier he has an ivory sceptre in his hand with which he urged on his horse causing it each time to rear and make a tremendous bound forwards when his wild career was over a procession of about sixty more magnates arrived on the same fantastic splendor with handsome colored turbans twisted mustaches and dark eyes one rode a white horse covered with a gold net another a dark gray the bridle and housing studded with diamonds then came a black charger with purple cloth caparisons one magnate was attired from head to foot in sky blue thickly embroidered with gold a white turban and a long white dolman another in cloth of gold with purple dolman and all riding so boldly and fearlessly with such defiant gallantry that it was quite a pleasure to look at them at length came the hungarian guards with esterhazy at their head dazzling in gems and pearl embroidery how can i describe the scene you ought to have seen the procession deploy and halt in the spacious square and all the jewels and bright colors and the lofty golden mitre of the bishops and the crucifixes glittering in the brilliant sunshine like a thousand stars well to-morrow god willing i proceed on my journey now dear brother you have had a letter so pray write soon and let me hear how you are getting on so you have had an emute in berlin and that too an emute of taylor's apprentices what did it all mean once more i send you my farewell from germany my dear parents and brother and sisters i am leaving hungary for italy and thence i hope to write to you more frequently and more at leisure be of good cheer dear paul and go forwards in a confident spirit rejoice with those that rejoice and do not forget the brother who is wandering about the world yours felix End of section 3section four of letters of felix mendelssohn bartoli from italy and switzerland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. letters of felix mendelssohn bartoli from italy and switzerland translated by grace wallace music provided by project gutenberg october tenth through october twenty third venice october tenth eighteen thirty italy at last and what i have all my life considered as the greatest possible felicity is now begun and i am basking in it the day has been so fruitful in enjoyment that i must now that it is evening endeavour to collect my thoughts a little to write to you my dear parents and to thank you for having bestowed such happiness on me you also dear brother and sisters are often in my thoughts how much i wish for you paul to be to be with me here once more to enjoy your delight in our rapid travels by sea and by land i should like to prove to you hensel that assumption of the blessed virgin is the most divine work ever produced by the hands of man you are not here however so i am obliged to vent my enthusiasm in bound italian to the laquais de place who stands still and listens i shall however become quite confused if things are to go on as they have done on the first day where every hour brought with it so much never to be forgotten that i do not know where to find sufficient grasp of intellect to comprehend it all properly i saw the assumption then a whole gallery of paintings at the manafrini palace then a church festival in the church where hangs titian st peter afterwards st mark's in the afternoon i had a row on the adriatic and visited the public gardens where people lie on the grass and eat i then returned to the piazza of st mark where in the twilight there is an immense crowd and crush of people and all this i was obliged to see to-day because there is so much that is novel and interesting to be seen to-morrow but now i must relate methodically how i came hither by water for as telemachus says to do so by land would be no easy matter so i begin my history at gratz which is certainly the most tiresome hole in the world and where you yawn all day and why should i have stayed a single day longer on account of a heat relation how can a traveller with any experience possibly accept of a brother who is also an ensign in the place of a charming mother and sister in short the man did not know what to do with me for which i forgive him freely and shall not defame him to his mother when i perform the promise to write to her but he took me to the theatre and saw rybach the most wretched silly objectionable piece that the late Gutzebu ever wrote and moreover he declared it to be very good and very amusing 
and this is not to be forgiven, for even this Schreibach has such faux goût or fumé that it could not even please a cat. But at all events, I left for Gretz, for here I am in Venice. My old Vittorino woke me up at four o'clock in the dark, and the horse crawled off with us both. I thought of you, dear father, at least a hundred times during our journey of two days. You would certainly have gone wild with impatience, and possibly assaulted the coachman also, for at every little declivity he got slowly off the box, deliberately put on the drag, and crept up the smallest hill at a snail's pace. Then he thought fit to walk besides the horses for a time, to stretch his legs. Every possible conveyance passed us on the road, even when drawn by dogs or donkeys, and when at last, at a steep hill, the fellow put on two oxen as leaders, whose pace exactly corresponded with that of his horse, I had the greatest difficulty of not belaboring him. Indeed, I did so more than once. But he then gravely assured me that we were going at a capital pace, and that I had no means of proving the contrary. Moreover, he always passed the night in the most detestable pothouses, starting at four o'clock in the morning. So on arriving at Crickenford, I was fairly worn out. But when in answer to my question as to the time the Venetian diligence set off, I received the answer, in an hour hence, I seemed to revive. I was promised a place, and I also got a good supper. The diligence, indeed, did not arrive for two hours after its time, having been detained by the deep snow on the summering, but still came at last. Three Italians were in sight, and chattered so that I would scarcely get to sleep, but my storing fairly silenced them after a time. At last morning broke, and as we drove into Rashuta, the driver said that on the other side of the bridge there, that no one understood a word of German. I therefore took leave of my mother tongue for a long time to come, and we drove over the bridge. The style of the houses immediately beyond was entirely different. The flat roofs, with their convex tiles, the deep windows, the high white walls, and lofty square towers, all betokened another land. The pale olive faces of the men, the innumerable beggars who besieged the carriage, the various small chapels, brightly and carefully painted on every side with flowers, the nuns, monks, and so forth, were all symptomatic of Italy. The monotonous character of the whole scenery, however, and of the road we were traveling, passing through bare white rocks, along the banks of a river with a rough, rocky bed, and a summer creeping along in form of a tiny brook, certainly does not seem characteristic of Italy. I purposely made this passage rather meager, in order that the subject might be more distinctly heard, says Abbot Vulgar, and I almost think that Providence has done pretty much the same here, for when we passed Uspeda de Lato, the subject did come out well, and a fine sight it was. I had imagined that the first impression of Italy would be like that of a sudden explosion, violent and startling. I have not, hitherto, found this to be the case. The effect produced on me has been rather that of a genial warmth, mildness and cheerfulness, and an indescribable sensation of pervading content and satisfaction. After passing Ospedalato, we entered a plain, leaving the blue mountains behind us. The sun shone bright and warm through the foliage of the vines, the road winding through orchards, in which the trees were connected by trailing boughs. I felt as if I were at home again, and knew every object, and was once more about to take possession of it all. The carriage, too, seemed to fly over the smooth road, and towards evening we arrived at Udina, where we passed the night, when for the first time I ordered my supper in Italian, my tongue skating as if on slippery ice, first gliding into English, and then stumbling afresh. Moreover, next morning I was famously cheated, but I did not in the least care, and on we went. It happened to be Sunday, and on every side people were coming along in bright southern costumes and flowers, the women with roses in their hair. Light single-horse carriages drove past, and men were riding to church on donkeys. At the inns, groups of idlers were to be seen in the most picturesque, indolent attitudes. Among others, one man placed his arm quietly around his wife's waist, and swung round with her, and then they went on their way. This sounds trivial enough, and yet it had a pretty effect. Venetian villas now were occasionally visible from the road, and by degrees became more frequent, till, at length, our way led past houses, trees, and gardens like a park. The whole country had a gay festive air, as if a prince were expected to make his grand entry, and the vine branches with their rich purple grapes hanging in festoons from the trees made the most lovely of all festive wreaths. The inhabitants were all gaily dressed and adorned, and a few scattered cypresses only enchanted the general effect. In Treviso there was an illumination, paper lanterns suspended in every part of the great square, and a large gaudy transparency in the centre. 
some of the most lovely girls were walking about, in their long white veils and scarlet petticoats. It was quite dark when we arrived at Mestre last night, when we got into a boat and in the dead calm gently rowed across to Venice. On our passage thither, where nothing but the water is to be seen, in distant lights, we saw a small rock which stands in the midst of the sea. On this a lamp was burning. All the sailors took off their hats as we passed, and one of them said, This was Madonna of Tempests, which are often most dangerous and violent here. We then glided quietly into the great city, under innumerable bridges, without sound of post-horns or rattling wheels or toll-keepers. The passage now became most thronged, and numbers of ships were lying near, past the theatre, where gondolas in long rows lie waiting for their masters, just as our own carriages do at home, then into the great canal, past the church of St. Mark, the Lions, the Palace of Doges, the Bridge of Sighs. The obscurity of night only enchants my delight on hearing the familiar names and seeing the dark outlines. And so I am actually in Venice. Well, today I have seen the finest pictures in the world, and have at last partially made the acquaintance of a very admirable man, whom hitherto I only knew by name. I allude to a certain Signor Gigioni, an inimitable artist, and also to Pordenone, who paints the most noble portraits, both of himself and many of his simple scholars, in such a devout, faithful, and pious spirit, that you seem to converse with him and feel an affection for him. Who would not have been confused by all this? But if I am to speak of Titian, I must do so in a most reverent mood. Till now, I never knew that he was the felicitest artist I had this day seen him to be, that he thoroughly enjoyed life, and in all its beauties and fullness, the picture of Paris proves. But he has fathomed the depth of human sorrow, as well as the joys of heaven. His glorious entombment, and also the assumption, fully invents this. How Mary floats on the cloud, while waving movements seem to pervade the whole picture. How you see at a glance her very breathing, her awe her, and piety, and in short a thousand feelings. All words seem poor and commonplace in comparison. The three angels, too, on the right of the picture, are the highest order of beauty, pure, serene loveliness, so unconscious, so bright, and so seraphic, but no more of this, or I must perforce become poetical, or indeed am so already, and this does not at all suit me, but I shall certainly see it every day. I must, however, say a few words about the entombment as you have the engraving. Look at it, and think of me. This picture represents the conclusion of a great tragedy, so still, so grand, and so acutely painful. Magdalena is supporting Mary, fearing that she will die of anguish. She endeavors to lead her away, but looks round herself once more, evidently wishing to impart this spectacle indelibly on her heart, thinking that it is for the last time. It surpasses everything, and then the sorrowing of John, who sympathizes and suffers with Mary, and Joseph, who absorbs in his piety and occupied with the tomb, directs and conducts the whole, and Christ himself, lying there so tranquil, having endured to the end, then the blaze of brilliant color and the gloomy molted sky. It is a composition that speaks to my heart and fills me with enthusiasm, and will never leave my memory. I believe few things that I have yet to see in Italy will affect me so deeply, but you know that I am devoid of all prejudices, and I give you a fresh proof of this by telling you that the Notre Dame of St. Peter, from which I expect it the most, pleased me the least of the three. It does not strike me of being a complete whole. The landscape, which is very fine, seemed to me to predominate too much. Then I was dissatisfied with the whole disposition of the picture of two victims and only one murderer, for the small figure in the distant background does not remedy this. I cannot bring myself to consider it a martyrdom, but probably I am in error, and I intend to study it more carefully tomorrow. My contemplation of it, besides, was disturbed by someone stumbling most sacrilegiously on the organ, and these secret forms were forced to listen to such miserable opera finales. But this matters not. Where such pictures are, I require no organist. I play the organ in my thoughts for myself, and feel a little irritated by such trash as I should be an ignorant rabble. Titian, however, was a man well adapted to improve others, so I shall try to profit by him, and to rejoice that I am in Italy. At this moment, the gondoliers are shouting to each other, and the lights are reflected in the depths of the waters. One is playing a guitar and singing to it. It is a charming night. Farewell, and think of me in every happy hour, as I do of you, Felix. To Professor Zelter. Venice, October 16th, 1830. Dear Professor, I have entered Italy at last, and I intend this letter to be the commencement of a regular series of reports, which I propose transmitting to you of all that appears to me particularly worthy of notice. Though I only now for the first time write to you, I must beg you to impute the blame to the state of the constant excitement in which I live, both in Munich and Vienna. It was needless for me to describe to you the parties in Munich, 
which I attended every evening, and where I played the piano more unremittingly than I ever did in my life before. One soirée even succeeded another so closely that I really had not a moment to collect my thoughts. Moreover, it seemed it would not have particularly interested you, for after all, good society, which does not offer materials for the smallest epigram, is equally vapid in a letter. I hope that you have not taken amiss my long silence, and that I may expect a few lines from you, even if they contain nothing save that you are well and cheerful. The aspect of the world at this moment is very bleak and stormy, and much that was once thought durable and unchangeable has been swept away in the course of a couple days. It is then doubly welcome to hear well-known voices to convince us that there are certain things which cannot be annihilated or demolished but remain firm and steadfast. You must know that I am at this moment very uneasy at not having received any news from home for some weeks past. I found no letters from my family, either at Trieste or here, so a few lines from you, written in your old fashion, would both cheer and gratify me, especially as it would prove that you think of me with the same kindness that you have always done from my childhood to the present time. My family no doubt told you of the exhilarating impression made on me by the first sight of the plains of Italy. I hurry from one adjournment to another, hour by hour, and constantly see something novel and fresh. But immediately on my arrival, I discovered some masterpieces of art, which I study with deep intention and contemplate daily for a couple hours at least. These are three pictures by Titian, the presentation of Mary as a child in the temple, the Assumption of the Virgin, and the Entombment of Christ. There is also a portrait by Gigio Giona representing a girl with a cistern in her hand, plunged in thought, and looking forth from the picture in serious meditation. She is apparently about to begin a song, and you feel as if you must do the same, besides many others. To see these alone would be worth a journey to Venice, for the fruitfulness, genius, and devotion of the great men who painted these pictures seems to emanate from them afresh as often as you gaze at their works, and I do not much regret that I have scarcely heard any music here. For I suppose I must not venture to include the music of the angels in the assumption encircling Mary with joyous shouts of welcome, one gaily peating the tambourine, a couple others blowing away on strange crooked flutes, while another charming group are singing, or the music floating in the thoughts of the cistern player. I have only once heard anything on the organ, and miserable it was. I was gazing at Titian's martyrdom of St. Peter in the Franciscan church. Divine service was going on, and nothing inspires me with more solemn awe than when on that very spot for which they were originally created and painted, those ancient pictures, in all their grandeur, gradually steal forth out of the darkness in which the long lapse of time has veiled them. As I was earnestly contemplating the enchanting evening landscape with its trees and angels among the boughs, the organ commenced. The first sound was quite in harmony with my feelings, but the second, third, and in fact all the rest, quickly roused me from my reveries and sent me straight home for the man was playing in church and during divine service and in the presence of respectable people thus music transcribed the martyrdom of St. Peter actually close beside him. I was therefore in no great hurry to make the acquaintance of the organist. There is no regular opera here at the moment, and the gondoliers no longer sing, Lucio stanzas. Moreover, what I have hitherto seen of modern Venetian art consists of poems framed and glazed on the subject of Titian's pictures, or Rinaldo and Armidia by a new Venetian painter, or a Saint Cecilia by a ditto, besides various specimens of architecture in no style at all. As all these are totally insignificant, I cling to the ancient masters and study how they worked. Often, after doing so, I feel a musical inspiration, and since I came here, I have been busily engaged in composition. Before I left Vienna, a friend of mine made me a present of Luther's hymns, and on reading them over, I was again so much struck by their power that I intended to compose music for several next winter. I have nearly completed here the choral, O Stifa Note, and four voices a cappella, and the Christmas hymn, Von Himmel Hoch, is already in my head. I wish also to set the following hymns to music. Ach Gott, von Himmel sei der Rhein, wir glauben all an ein Gott, wir frei und Frieden, mitten wir im Leben sind, and finally, ein feste Berg. Later, however, it is my intention to compose for a choir and orchestra. Pray write to me about this project of mine, and say whether you approve of my retaining the ancient melodies in them all, but not adhering to them too strictly. For instance, if I were to take the first verse of Von Himmel Hoch as a separate grand chorus, besides this, I am hard at work at an orchestral overture, and if an opportunity for an opera offered, it would be most welcome. I finished two pieces of sacred music in Vienna, a choral in three movements for a 
chorus and orchestra, O habt wo blut und wuden, and an Ava Maria for a choir of eight voices a cappella. The people I associated with were so displeased and frivolous that I became quite spiritually minded and conducted myself like a divine among them. Moreover, not one of the best pianofortes there, male or female, ever played a note of Beethoven, and when I hinted that he and Mozart were not despised, they said, So you are an admirer of classical music? Yes, said I. Tomorrow I intend to go to Bologna to have a glance at the St. Cecilia, and then proceeded by Florence to Rome, where I hope, D.V., to arrive eight or ten days hence. I will then write to you more satisfactorily. I only wish to make a beginning today, and to beg you not to forget me, and kindly to accept my heartfelt wishes to your health and happiness. Your faithful Felix. Florence, October 23rd, 1830. Here I am in Florence. The warm air and sky bright. Everything is beautiful and glorious. Verblieb thy Erde, as Goethe says. I have now received your letter on the third, by which I see that you are all well, and my anxiety was needless, that you are going on as usual in thinking of me. So I feel happy again, and can now see everything and enjoy everything, and am able to write to you. In short, my mind is at rest on the main point. I made my journey here amid a thousand doubts and fears, quite uncertain whether to go direct to Rome, because I did not expect any letters at Florence, Fortunately, however, I decided on coming here, and now it is of no consequence how the misunderstanding arose that caused me to wait for letters in Venice, where you had written to Florence. All I can promise is to endeavor in future to be less over-anxious. My driver pointed out a spot between the hills, on which lay a blue mist, and said, Coflense. I eagerly looked towards the place, and saw the round dome looming out of the mist before me, and the spacious wide valley in which the city is situated. My love of travel revived when at last Florence appeared. I looked at some willow trees, as I thought, besides the road, and the driver said, Buono olio, and then I saw that they were hanging full of olives. My driver, as a genius, is undoubtedly a most villainous knave, thief, and impostor. He has cheated me and half starved me, and yet I think him almost amiable from his enthusiastic animal nature. About an hour before we arrived in Florence, he said that the beautiful scenery was now about to commence. And true it is, the fair land of Italy does first begin then. There are villas on every height, and decorated old walls, with sloping terraces of roses and alloys, flowers and grapes and olive leaves, the sharp points of cypresses, and the flat tops of pines, all sharply defined against the sky. Then handsome square faces, busy life on the roads on every side, and at a distance in the valley, the blue city. So I drove confidently into Florence in my little open carriage, and though I looked shabby and dusty, like one coming from the Apennines, I cared little for that. I passed recklessly through all the smart equipages from which the most refined English ladies looked at me. While I thought it may one day actually come to pass, you who are now looking down on the hotel may shake hands with him, the only difference being a little clean linen and so forth. By the time we came to the Battiste Olio, I no longer felt diffident, but gave orders to drive to the post, and then was really happy, for I received three letters, yours of the 22nd and the 3rd, and my father's also. I was now quite delighted, and as we drove beside the Arno, du Schneider celebrated hotel, the world seemed once more a very pleasant world. End of section 4、section、five of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. Translated by Grace Wallace. October 24th through November 8th, 1830. October 24th. The Apennines are really not so beautiful as I had imagined, for the name always suggested to me richly wooded, picturesque hills covered with vegetation, whereas they are merely a long chain of melancholy bleak hills. The little Ventura there is not gratifying to the eye. There are no dwellings to be seen, or merry brooks or rills, only an occasional stream, its broad bed dried up, or a little water channel. And to this the shameful roguery of the inhabitants. Really, at last, I became quite confused and perplexed by the insistent cheating, and could scarcely discover for what object they were lying. I therefore, once for all, invariably protested against every demand they made, and declared that I would not pay at all if they asked more than I chose to give. So in this way I managed very tolerably. Last night I was again in grand quarters. I had made an arrangement with a vetturino for board and lodgings. And all I required. The natural consequence was that the fellow took me to the most detestable little inns and actually starved me. 
So late yesterday, we arrived at a solitary pothouse, the filth of which no pen can describe. The stair was strewed with heaps of dried leaves and firewood. Moreover, the cold was intense, and they invited me to warm myself in the kitchen, which I agreed to do. A bench was placed for me beside the fire. The whole troop of peasants were standing about, also warming themselves. I looked quite regal from my bench on the hearth among this rough set of fellows, who, in their broad-leaved hats, lit up by the fire, and babbling in their incomprehensible dialect, looked vastly suspicious characters. I made them prepare my soup under my own eyes, giving, moreover, good advice on the subject. But, after all, it was not edible. I entered into conversation with my subjects from my throne on the hearth, and they pointed out to me a little hill in the distance, incessantly vomiting forth flames, which had a singular effect in the dark. Atikoso is the name of the hill. And then I was conducted to my bedroom. The landlord took off the sackcloth sheets and said, Very fine linen, but I slept as sound as a bear, and before falling asleep I said to myself, now you are in the Apennines. The next morning, after getting no breakfast, my veterino civilly asked me how I liked my night's entertainment. The fellow talked a great deal of nonsense about politics and the present state of France, abused his horse in German for being born in Switzerland, and spoke French to the beggars who swarmed around the cabriolet, while I corrected many a fault in his pronunciation. October 25th. I now intend to go once more to the Tribune, to be inspired with feelings of reference. There is a particular place where I like to sit, as the little Venus de Medici is directly opposite, and above, that of Chichen, and by turning rather to the left, I have a view of the Madonna del Cardello, a favorite picture of mine, and which invariably reminds me of La Belle Jardinière, and seems to be La Belle Jardinière, and seems to me a kindred creation, which is very faithful, and the face has, I think, a most disagreeable and even ordinary expression. In gazing thus, however, the two Venuses, their loveliness inspires a feeling of piety. It is as if the two spirits, who could produce such creations, were flying through the hall and grasping you as they passed. Titian must have been a marvelous man, enjoyed his life and his works. The Stofer Medici is not to be cited, and the divine Nioba, with all her children. While we gaze at her, we can find no words. I have not been to the Pitti Palace, which possesses the Saint Ezekiel, and the Madonna della Sedia of Raphael. I saw the gardens of the palace yesterday in sunshine. They are superb, and the thick solid stems of the myrtles and laurels, and the innumerable cypresses, made a strange exotic impression on me. But when I declare that I consider beeches, limes, oaks, and firs ten times more beautiful and picturesque, I think I hear Hensel exclaim, Oh, the northern bear! October 30th. After the soft rain of yesterday, the air is so mild and genial that I am at this moment seated at the open window writing to you, and indeed it is pleasant enough to see the people going about the streets, offering the prettiest baskets of flowers, fresh violets, roses, and pinks. Two days ago, being satisfied with all pictures, statues, faces, and museums, I resolved to take a long walk till sunset. So after buying a bunch of narcissuses and heliotropes, I went up the hill through the vineyards. It was one of the most delightful walks I ever remember. Everyone must feel revived and refreshed at the sight of nature in such a garb as this, and a thousand happy thoughts passed through my mind. First of all, I went to a villa called Bello Sigiardo, where hence the whole of Florence and its spacious valley are to be seen, and I thoroughly enjoyed the view of the superb city and its massive towers and palaces. But most of all, I admired the countless villas, covering every hill and every acclivity as far as the eye can reach, as if the city extended beyond the mountains into the far distance. And when I took up a telescope and looked down on the valley through the blue mists, every portion of it seemed thickly dotted with bright objects and white villas, while such a large circle of dwellings inspired me with a feeling of home and comfort. I proceeded far over the hills to the highest point I could see, on which stood an ancient tower, and when I reached it I found all the people throughout the building busily engaged in making wine, drying grapes, and repairing casks. It proved to be Galileo's tower, from which he used to make his discoveries and observations. From here also there was a very extensive view, and the girl who took me to the roof of the tower related a number of stories in her peculiar dialect, which I scarcely understood at all. But she afterwards presented me with some of her sweet dried grapes, which I ate with great gusto. And so I went on to another tower I saw at a distance, but could not manage to find my way. And examining my map as I went along, I stumbled on a traveller busily searching his map also. The only differences between us being that he was an old Frenchman with green spectacles who dressed me thus. 
He kissed Esminiato a monte, signor? With admirable decision, I replied, si, signor. And it turned out that I was right. A.F. immediately recurred to my memory, as she had advised me to see this monastery, which is indeed wonderfully fine. When I tell you I went from there to the Bobili Gardens, where I saw the sunset, and at night enjoyed the brightest moonlight, you may imagine how much I was invigorated by my ramble. I will write to you about the pictures here some other time, for today it is too late, as I have still to take leave of Pitti Palace in the Great Gallery, and to gaze once more at my Venus, who is not indeed mentioned before ladies, but whose beauty is truly divine. The courier goes at five o'clock, and God willing, I shall be in Rome the day after tomorrow. From thence you shall hear again. Felix. Rome, November 2nd, 1830. I refrain from writing longer in this melancholy strain, for just as your letter, after a lapse of fourteen days, has saddened me, my answer will have the same effect on you fourteen days hence. You would write to me in the same style, and so it might go on forever. As four weeks must pass before I can receive any answer, I feel that I ought to restrict myself to relating events past and present, and not dwell too much on the particular frame of my mind at the moment, which is indeed usually sufficient manifest in the native given, which is indeed usually sufficiently manifest in the narrative given, and the various occurrences described. I have scarcely yet arrived at the conviction that I am now actually in Rome, and when yesterday, just as day was breaking, I drove across a bridge with statues under a deep blue sky, and in dazzling white moonlight, the courier said, Fonte mole, and it seemed to me like a dream, and at the same moment, I saw before my sickbed in London a year ago, in my rough Scotch journey in Munich and Vienna, and the pines on these hills. The journey from Florence to Rome has very few attractions. Siena, which is, I understand, worth seeing, we passed through during the night. It was unpleasant to see a regular government courier compelled to take a military escort, which was doubled at night. Still, it must be absolutely necessary, as he is obliged to pay for it. In these days, this ought to not be the case. In the meantime, everything progresses, and there are moments when the bound forwards is actually visible. I was still in Florence, waiting for the departure of the post, reading a French newspaper, when at the very moment the bell sounded, and I read among the advertisements, Via de Sayabencas. Many reflections occur to me as to so many men of renown gradually vanishing from our sight, and our great geniuses having such homage paid to them after their death, and yet during their life, La Fontaine's novels and French vaudevilles alone make any impression on their fellow countrymen, while we only strive to appreciate the very refuse of French, and to neglect Beaumarchais and Rossiot. However, it matters little after all. The first thing connected with music that I met with here was the Tor Jesu by Cron, which the Abate here, Fortunato Santini, has translated faithfully and admirably into Italian. It appears that the music of this heretic has long set along with the translation to Naples, where it is to be produced this winter at a great festival, and I hear that the musical world there are quite enchanted with it, and are studying the work with infinite love and enthusiasm. I understand that the abate has been long impatiently expecting me, because he hopes to obtain considerable information for me about German music, and thinks I may also have a score of box passion. Thus music progresses onward, as sure to pierce through as the sun. If mists still prevail, it is merely a sign that the springtime has not yet come, but come again it must and will. Farewell, and from my heart I say, may a merciful providence preserve you all in health and happiness. Felix. Rome, November 8th, 1830. I must now write to you of my first week in Rome, how I have arranged my time, and how I look forward to the winter, and what impression the glorious objects by which I am surrounded have made on me. But this is no easy task. I feel as if I were entirely changed since I came here. Formerly, when I wished to check my haste and impatience to press forward, and to continue my journey more rapidly, I attributed this eagerness merely to that force of habit, but I am now fully persuaded that it arose entirely from my anxiety to reach this goal. Now that I have at last obtained it, my mood is so tranquil and joyous, and yet so earnest, that I shall not attempt to describe it to you. What it is, is that thus works on me I cannot exactly define. For the awe-inspiring Colosseum, and the brilliant Vatican, and the genial air of spring, all contribute to make me feel thus, and so do the kindly people." my comfortable apartments, and everything else. At all events, I am different from what I was. 
I am better in health and happier than I've been for a long time, and take delight in my work and feel an inclination for it that I expect to accomplish much more than I anticipated. Indeed, I have already done a good deal. If it pleases Providence to grant me a continuation of this happy mood, I look forward to the most delightful and productive winter. Picture yourself in a small house with two windows in front in the Piazza di Spagna, number five, which all day long enjoys the warm sun, and an apartment on the first floor where there's a good Viennese grand piano. On the table are some portraits of Palestrini, Allegri, etc., along with the scores of their works, and a Latin psalm book from which I am to compose no novis, such is my present abode. The capital is too far away. Besides, I had a great dread of the cold air, which here I have no cause to guard against. For when I look out my window in the morning across the square, I see every object sharply defined in the sunshine against the blue sky. My landlord was formerly a captain in the French army, and his daughter has the most splendid contralto voice I ever heard. Above me lives a Prussian captain, with whom I talk politics. In short, the situation is excellent. When I come into the room early in the morning, and see the sun shining so brightly on the breakfast table, you see I am marred as a poet, I feel so cheerful and comfortable. For it is now far on in the autumn, and who in our country at this season looks for warmth, or bright sky, or grapes and flowers? After breakfast I begin my work, and play and sing and compose till near noon. Then Rome, in all of her vast dimensions, lies before me like an interesting problem to enjoy. But I go deliberately to work, daily selecting some different object appertaining to history. One day I visit the ruins of the ancient city. Another I go to the Borghese Gallery, or to the Capitol, or St. Peter's, or the Vatican. Each day is thus made memorable, and as I take my time, each object becomes firmly and indelibly expressed on me. When I am occupied in the forenoon, I am willing to leave off, and should like to continue my writing. But I say to myself that I must see the Vatican, and when I am actually there, I equally dislike leaving it. Thus each of my occupations causes me most genuine pleasure, and one enjoyment follows another. Just as Venice, with her past, reminded me of a vast monument, her crumbling modern palaces, and the perpetual remembrance of former splendor, causing sad and discordant sensations, so does the past of Rome suggest the impersonation of history. Her monuments elevate the soul, inspiring solemn yet serene feelings, and it is a thought fraught with exultion that a man is capable of producing creations which, after the lapse of a thousand years, still renovate and animate others. When I have fairly imprinted an object like this on my mind, and each day a fresh one, twilight has usually arrived and the day is over. I then visit my friends and acquaintances when we mutually communicate what each has done, which means enjoyed here, and are reciprocally pleased. I have been most evenings at Benjamin's and Huber's, where German artists usually assemble, and I sometimes go to the Shadows in the Abate Santini. The Abate Santini is a valuable acquaintance for me, as he has a very complete library of ancient Italian music, and he kindly gives or lends me anything I like, for no one can be more obliging. At night he makes either Alborn or me accompany him home, and as an Abate, being seen alone at night in the streets would bring him into evil repute. That such youngsters as Alborn and I should act as duenas to a priest of sixty is diverting enough. The Duchess of gave me a list of old music, which she was anxious to procure copies of if possible. Santini's collection contains all this, and I am much obliged to him for having furnished me with copies, for I am now looking through them all and becoming acquainted with them. I beg you will send me for him as a token of my gratitude, the six cantatas of Sebastian Bach, published by Marx at Simrock, or some of his pieces for the organ. I should, however, prefer the cantatas. He already has the Magnificat, and the Motets, and others. He has translated Signet dem Herrn ein neues Lied, and intended to be executed at Naples, for which he deserves a reward. I am writing to Zelter all particulars about the Papal singers, whom I have heard three times, in the Quirinal, in the Monte Cavallo, and once in San Carlo. I look forward with delight to seeing Gusen. We shall have much to discuss together, and I have likewise an idea that he has got some work for me, and I can contentiously undertake it. I will do so gladly, and render it all the justice in my power. 
Among my home pleasures, I include that of reading, for the first time, Goethe's Journey to Italy, and I must avow that it is a source of great satisfaction to me to find that he arrived in Rome the very same day that I did, that he also went first to the Quirino and heard a requiem there, that he was seized with the same fit of impatience in Florence and Bologna, and felt the same tranquil, or as he calls it, solid spirit here. Indeed, everything that he describes I exactly experienced myself, so I am pleased. He speaks in detail of a large picture of Titian's in the Vatican, and declares that its meaning is not to be devised. Only a number of figures standing beautifully grouped together. I fancy, however, that I have discovered a very deep sense in it, and I believe that whoever finds the most beauties in Titian is sure to be most in the right, for he was a glorious man, though he has not had the opportunity of displaying and diffusing his genius here, as Raphael has done in the Vatican. Still, I can never forget his three pictures in Venice, and to these I may add the one in the Vatican, which I saw for the first time this morning. If any one could come into the world with full consciousness, every object around would smile on him, in the same vivid life and animation that these pictures do on us. The school of Athens and the Disputa and the Peter stand before us precisely as they were created, and then the entrance through the splendid open arches, whence you can see the Piazza of St. Peter's in Rome, and the blue Alban hills, and above our head figures from the Old Testament, and a thousand bright little angels, and arabesques of fruit, and garlands of flower, and then on to the gallery. You may well be proud, dear Hansel, for your copy of Transfiguration is superb, the pleasing emotion which seizes me, when I see for the first time some immortal work, and the pervading idea and chief impression it inspires, I did not experience on this occasion from the original, but from your copy. The first effect of this picture today was precisely the same that yours had previously made on me. It was not till after considerable research and contemplation that I succeeded in finding out anything new to me. On the other hand, the Madonna di Foligno dawned on me in the whole splendor of her loveliness. I have passed a happy morning in the midst of all these glorious works. As yet I have not visited the statues, but have reserved my first impression of them for another day. End of section 5《セクション6 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland》Translated by Grace Wallace Music provided by Project Gutenberg November 9th through November 30th, 1830 November 9th, Morning Thus every morning brings me fresh anticipations, and every day fulfills them. The sun is again shining on my breakfast table, and I am now going to my daily work. I will send you, dear Fanny, by the first opportunity what I composed in Vienna, and anything else that may be finished, and my sketchbook to Rebecca. But I am far from being pleased with it this time, so I intend to study attentively the sketches of the landscape painters here, in order to acquire, if possible, a new manner. I tried to produce one of my own, but it will not do. Today I am going to the Lateran, and the ruins of ancient Rome, and in the evening, to a kind English family, whose acquaintance I made here. Pray send me a good many letters of introduction. I am exceedingly anxious to know numbers of people, especially the Italians. So I live on happily, and think of you in every pleasant moment. May you also be happy, and rejoice with me at the prospect which lies before me here. Felix M.B. Rome, November 16th, 1830. Dear Fanny, No post left the day before yesterday, and I could not talk to you, so when I remembered that my letter must necessarily remain two days before it left Rome, I felt it impossible to write. But I had thought of you at times without number, and wished you every happiness, and congratulated myself that you were born a certain number of years ago. It is, indeed, cheering to think what charming, rational beings are to be found in the world, and you are certainly one of these. Continue cheerful, bright, and well, and make no great change in yourself. I don't think you require to be much better. May good fortune ever abide with you. And now I think that these are all my birthday good wishes, for really it is not fair to expect that a man of my caliber should wish you also a fresh stock of musical ideas. Besides, you are very unreasonable in complaining of any deficiency in that respect. Probacco. If you have the inclination, you certainly have sufficient genius to compose. 
and if you have no desire to do so, why grumble so much? If I had a baby to nurse, I certainly should not write any scores, and as I have to compose non nobis, I cannot unluckily carry my nephew about in my arms. But to speak seriously, your child is scarcely six months old yet, and you can think of anything but Sebastian, not Bach. Be thankful that you have him. Music only retreats when there is no longer a place for her, and I am not surprised that you are not in a natural mother. However, you have my best wishes on your birthday, for all that your heart desires, so I may as well wish you half a dozen melodies into the bargain, not that this will be of much use. In Rome here, we celebrated the 14th of November, by the sky shining in blue and festive array, and breathing on us warm, genial air. So I went on pleasantly towards the capital and into the church, where I heard a miserable sermon from, who was no doubt a very good man, but to my mind has a most morose style of preaching, and any one who could irritate me on such a day, in the capital, and in a church, must have an especial talent for so doing. I afterwards went to call on the Bonson, who had just arrived. He and his wife received me most kindly, and we conversed on much that was interesting, including politics and regrets for your absence. I propose, my favorite work that I am now studying is Goethe's Lily Spark, especially three portions. Car ich mich in in Bram, then in la Minute, and best of all, die ganze Luft ist warm, ist Blütenwall, where decidedly clarinets must be introduced. I mean to make it the subject of a scherzo for a symphony. Yesterday, we had dinner at Bonson's. We had, among others, a German musician. Oh, heavens, I wish I were a Frenchman. The man said to me, Music must be handled every day. Why, replied I, which rather embarrassed him. He also spoke of earnest purpose, and said that Spohr had no earnest purpose, but that he had distinctly discerned gleams of an earnest purpose in my tu et petrus. The fellow, however, as a small property at Franscati, and is about to lay down the profession of music. We have not got so far as that yet. After dinner came Quito Eger's Senf, both then a painter, and then two more and others. I played the piano, and they asked for pieces by Sebastian Bach, so I played numbers of his compositions, which were much admired. I also explained clearly to them the mode in which the passion is executed, for they seem scarcely to believe it. Bonson possesses it, arranged for the piano. He showed it to the papal singers, and they said before witnesses that such music could not possibly be executed by human voices. I think the contrary. It seems, however, that Trathevine is about to publish the score of The Passion of St. John. I suppose I must order a set of studs for Paris à la Bach. Today, Bonson is to take me to Bellini's, whom he has not seen for a year, as he never goes out except to hear confessions. I am glad to know him, and shall endeavor to improve my intimacy with him, for he can solve many an enigma for me. Old Santini continues as kind as ever. When we are together in society, if I praise any particular piece, or am not acquainted with it, next morning he is sure to knock gently at my door, and to bring me the piece in question, carefully wrapped up in a blue pocket handkerchief. I, in return, accompany him home every evening and we have a great regard for each other. He also brought me his Te Deum, written in eight parts, requesting me to correct some of the modulations, as G major predominates too much, so I mean to try if I cannot introduce some A minor or E minor. I am now very anxious to become acquainted with a good many Italians. I visit at the house of a certain Maestro di San Giovanni Letterno, whose daughters are musical, but not pretty, so this does not count for much. If, therefore, you can send me letters, pray do so. I work in the morning. At noon I see and admire, and thus the day glides away till sunset. But I should like in the evening to associate with the Roman world. My kind English friends have arrived from Venice. Lord Harrowby and his family are to pass the winter here. Shadov, Mindenmann, Busen, Tibelschus all receive every evening. In short, I have no lack of acquaintances, but I should like to know some Italians also. The present, dear Fanny, that I have prepared for your birthday is a psalm for chorus and orchestra, no nobis domine. You know the melody well. There is an air in it which has a good ending, and the last chorus will, I hope, please you. I hear the next week I shall have an opportunity of sending it to you, along with a quantity of new music. I intend now to finish my overture, and then, DV, to proceed with my symphony. A pianoforte concerto, too, that I wish to write for Paris, begins to flow in my head.
If Providence kindly bestows on me success and bright days, I hope we shall enjoy them together. Farewell, may you be happy. Felix. Rome, November 22nd, 1830. My dear brother and sisters, You know how much I dislike, at a disadvantage of 200 miles and 14 days' journey from you, to offer good advice. I mean to do so, however, for once. Let me tell you, therefore, of a mistake in your conduct, and in truth the same that I once made myself. I do assure you that never in my life have I known my father write in so irritable a strain as since I came to Rome, and so I wish to ask you if you cannot devise some domestic recipe to cheer him a little. I mean by forbearance in yielding to his wishes, and in this manner by allowing my father's view of any subject to predominate over your own. Then, not to speak at all on topics that irritate him, and instead of saying shamefully, say unpleasant, or instead of superb, very fair. This method has often a wonderfully good effect, and I put it, with all of submission to yourselves, whether it might not be equally successful in this case. For, with the exception of the great events of the world, ill-humor often seems to me to proceed from the same cause that my father's did when I chose to pursue my own path in my musical studies. He was then in a constant state of irritation, incessantly abusing Beethoven and all visionaries, and this often vexed me very much, and made me sometimes very unamiable. At that very time something new came out, which put my father out of sorts, and made him, I believe, not a little uneasy, so long, therefore, as I persisted in extolling and exalting my Beethoven, the evil became daily worse, and one day, if I remembered rightly, I was even sent out of the room. At last, however, it occurred to me that I might speak a great deal of truth, and yet avoid the particular truth obnoxious to my father. So the aspect of affairs speedily began to improve, and soon all went well. Perhaps you may have in some degree forgotten that you ought now, and then to be forbearing, and not aggressive. My father considers himself both much older and more irritable than, thank God, he really is. But it is our duty always to submit our opinion to his, even if the truth be as much on our side as it often is on his, when opposed to us. Strive, then, to praise what he likes, and do not attack what is implanted in his heart, more especially ancient established ideas. Do not commend what is new till it has made some progress in the world, and acquired a name, for till then it is a mere matter of taste. Try to draw my father into your circle, and be playful and kind to him. In short, try to smooth and to equalize things, and remember that I, who am now an experienced man of the world, never yet knew any family, taking into due consideration all defects and failings, who have hitherto lived so happily together as ours. Do not send me any answer to this, for you would not receive it for a month, and by that time no doubt some fresh topic will have arisen. Besides, if I have spoken nonsense, I do not wish to be scolded by you and if I have spoken properly, I hope you will follow my good advice. November 23rd. Just as I was going to set to work at the Hebrides, arrived R. B., a musical professor from Magdeburg. He played me over a whole book of songs and an Ave Maria, and begged to have the benefit of my opinion. I seemed in the position of a juvenile nester, and made him some insipid speeches, but this caused me the loss of a morning in Rome, which is a pity, the choral Mitin wir im Leben sind is finished, and is certainly one of the best sacred pieces that I have yet composed. After I have completed the Hebrides, I think of arranging Ando Solomon for future performance, with proper curtailments, etc. I then purpose writing the Christmas music to Van Himmelhoff, the symphony in A minor, perhaps also some pieces for the piano, the concerto, etc., just as they come into my head. I own I do sadly miss some friend to whom I could communicate my new works, and who could examine the score along with me, and play a bass or a flute, whereas now when a piece is finished I must lay it aside in my desk, without its giving pleasure to any one. London spoiled me in this respect. I can never again expect to meet altogether such friends as I had there. Here I can only say the half of what I think, and leave the best half unspoken. Whereas there it was not necessary to say more than the half, because the other half was a mere matter of course, and already understood. Still, this is a most delightful place. We young people went lately into Albano, and set off in the most lovely weather. 
The road to Franscati passed under a great aqueduct, its dark brown outlines standing out sharply defined against the clear blue sky. Thence, we proceeded to the monastery at Grata Ferrata, where there are some beautiful frescoes by Domenicino, then to Marino, very picturesquely situated on a hill, and proceeding along the margin of the lake, we reached Castle Gandolfo. The scenery, like my first impression of Italy, is by no means so striking or so wonderfully beautiful as it is generally supposed, but most pleasing and gratifying to the eye, and the outlines undulating and picturesque, forming a perfect whole with its entourage and distribution of light. Here I must deliver an eulogy on monks. They finish a piece at once, giving it tone and color, with their wide loose gowns, their pious meditative gait, and their dark aspect. A beautiful shady avenue of evergreen oaks runs along the lake from Castel Gandolfo to Albano, where monks of every order are swarming, animating the scenery and yet marking its solitude. Near the city, a couple of begging monks were walking together. Further on, a whole troop of young Jesuits. Then we saw an elegant young priest in a thick reading. Beyond this, too, were standing in the woods with their guns, watching for birds. Then we came on a monastery, encircled by a number of small chapels. At last, all was solitude. But at that moment appeared a dirty, stupid-looking capuchin, laden with huge nosegays, which he placed before the various shrines, kneeling down in front of them before proceeding to decorate them. As we passed on, we met two prelates engaged in eager conversation. The bell for vespers was ringing in the monastery of Albano, and even on the summit of the highest hill stands a passionist convent, where they are only permitted to speak for a single hour daily, and occupy themselves solely in reading the history of the Passion of Christ. In Albano, among girls with pitchers on their heads, vendors of flowers and vegetables, and all the crowd in tumult, we saw a coal-black dumb monk returning from Monte Cavo, who formed a singular contrast to the rest of the scene. They seem to have taken entire possession of all this splendid country, and form a strange melancholy ground tone for all that is lively, gay, and free, and the ever-living cheerfulness bestowed by nature. It is as if men, on that very account, required a counterpoise. This is not, however, my case, and I need no contrast to enable me to enjoy what I see. I am often with Bonsen, and as he likes to turn the conversation on the subject of his liturgy and its musical portions, which I consider very deficient, I am perfectly plain-spoken, and give him a straightforward opinion. And I believe this is the only way to establish a mutual understanding. We have had several long, serious discussions, and I hope we shall eventually know each other better. Yesterday, Palestrina's music was performed at the Boyson House, as on every Monday, and then for the first time I played before the Roman musicians in Corpore. I am quite aware of the necessity in every foreign city of playing so as to make myself understood by the audience. This makes me feel rather embarrassed, and such was the case with me yesterday. After the papal singers finished Palestrina's music, it was my turn to play something. A brilliant piece would have been unsuitable, and there had been more than enough of serious music. I therefore begged Astolfi, the director, to give me a theme, so he lightly touched the notes with one finger thus. Music transcribed. Smiling as he did so, the black frocked abati pressed round me and seemed highly delighted. I observed this, and it inspired me so much that towards the end I succeeded famously. They clapped their hands like mad, and Bunsen declared that I had astounded the clergy. In short, the affair went off well. There is no encouraging prospect of any public performance here, so society is the only resource, which is finishing its troubled waters. Yours, Felix. Rome, November 30th, 1830. To come home from Bonsens by moonlight, with your letter in my pocket, and then to read it through leisurely at night, this is a degree of pleasure I wish many may enjoy. In all probability, I shall stay here the whole winter, and shall not go to Naples till April. It is so delightful to look round on every side, and to appreciate it all properly. There is much that must be thought over, in order to receive a due impression from it. 
I have also within myself so much work requiring both quiet and industry, that I feel anything like haste would be utter destruction. And though I adhere faithfully to my system, to receive each day only one fresh image into my mind, still I am sometimes compelled, even then, to give myself a day of rest, that I may not become confused. I write you a short letter today, because I must for the present adhere to my work, and yet I cannot refrain from calling all the beauty that lies at my feet. The weather, too, is brutal and cold, so that I am not in a very communicative mood. The Pope is dying, or possibly dead, by this time. We shall soon get a new one, said the Italians coolly. His death will not affect the carnival, nor the church festivals, with their pomps and processions and fine music. And as there will be, in addition to these, solemn requiems, and the lying in state at St. Peter's, they care little about it, provided that it does not occur in February. I am delighted to hear that Mantius sings my songs and likes them. Give him my kind regards, and ask him why he does not perform his promise and write to me. I have written to him repeatedly in the shape of music. In the Ave Maria and in the choral, Os Taifa note, some passages are composed expressly for him, and he will sing them charmingly. In the Ave, which is a salutation, a tenor solo takes the lead of the choir. I thought of a disciple all the time. As the piece is in A major, it goes rather high at the words, Benediacta tu. He must prepare his high A. It will vibrate well. Ask him to sing to you a song I sent to Davrian from Venice. Von Schlechtem Liebenswadel. It is expressly of mingled joy and despair. No doubt he will sing it well. Show it to no one, but confide it solely for forty eyes. Ritz, too, never writes, and yet I am constantly longing for his violin and his depth of feeling when he plays which all recurs to my mind when I see his welcoming writing. I am now working daily on the Abridis and will send it to Ritz as soon as it is finished. It is quite a piece to suit him, so very singular. Next time I write, I will tell you more of myself. I work hard and lead a pleasant, happy life. My mirror is stuck full of Italian, German, and English visiting cards, and I spend every evening with one of my acquaintances. There is a truly Babylonian confusion of tongues in my head for English, Italian, German, and French are all mixed up together in it. Two days ago, I again extemporized before the papal singers. The fellow had contrived to get hold of the most strange, quaint theme for me, wishing to put my powers to the test. They called me, however, l'insoperabili professorone, and are particularly kind and friendly. I have much wished to have described to you the Sunday music in the Sistina, a soiree at Trelonia's, the Vatican, St. Onofrino, Guido's Aurora, and a good small matters, but I reserve them for my next letter. The post is about to be sent off, and this letter with it. My good wishes are always with you, today and ever. Yours, Felix. End of section 6. Section 7 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland. Translated by Grace Wallace. Music provided by Project Gutenberg. December 10th and 11th, 1830. Rome, December 10th, 1830. Dear Father, It is a year this very day since we kept your birthday at Hensel's, and now let me give you some account of Rome as I did at the time of London. I intend to finish my overture to the Einsame Insa as a present to you, and if I write under it the 11th December, when I take up the sheets, I shall feel as if I were about to place them in your hands. You would probably say that you could not read them, but still I should have offered you the best it was in my power to give, and though I desire to do this every day, still there is a peculiar feeling connected with a birthday. Would I were with you, I need not offer you my good wishes, for you know them all already, and the deep interest I, and all of us, take in your happiness and welfare, and that we cannot wish any good for you, that is not reflected doubly on ourselves. Today is a holiday. I rejoice in thinking how cheerful you are at home, and when I repeat to you how happily I live here, I feel as if I were also a felicitation. A period like this, when serious thought and enjoyment are combined, is indeed most cheering and invigorating. 
Every time I enter my room, I rejoice that I am not obliged to pursue my journey on the following day, and that I may quietly postpone many things till tomorrow. That I am in Rome. Hitherto, much that passed through my brain was swept away by fresh ideas, each new impression chasing away the previous one. While well, here, on the contrary, they are all in turn properly developed. I never remembered having worked with so much zeal, and if I am to complete all that I have projected, I must be very industrious during the winter. I am indeed deprived of the great delight of showing my finished compositions to one who could take pleasure in them, and enter into them along with me. This impels me to return to my labors, which please me most when I am fairly in the midst of them. And now this must be combined with the various solemnities and festivals of every kind, which are to supplant my work for a few days, and to enjoy all I possibly can. I do not allow my occupation to prevent this, and shall then return with fresh zeal to my composition. This is indeed a delightful existence. My health is as good as possible, though the hot wind, called here the Shirako, rather attacks my nerves, I find I must beware of playing the piano much, or at night, Besides, it is easy for me to refrain from doing so for a few days, as for some weeks past I have been playing almost every evening. Byonsen, who often warns me against playing if I find it prejudicial, gave a large party yesterday, where nevertheless I was obliged to play. But it was a pleasure for me, for I had the opportunity of making so many agreeable acquaintances. Torsvalden, in particular, expressed himself in so gratifying a manner with regard to me that I felt quite proud for I honor him as one of the greatest of men, and always have revered him. He looks like a lion, and the very sight of his face is invigorating. You feel at once that he must be a noble artist. His eyes look so clear, as if with him every object must assume a definite form and image. Moreover, he is very gentle and kind, and mild, because his nature is so superior, and yet he seems to be able to enjoy every trifle. It is a real source of pleasure to see a great man, and to know that the creator of works that will endure forever stands before you in person, a living being with all his attributes and individuality and genius, and yet a man like others. December 11th, morning. And now your actual birthday has arrived. A few lines of music suggested themselves to me on the occasion, and though they may not be worth much, the congratulations I have been in the habit of offering or of quite as little value. Fanny may add the second part. I have only written what occurred to my mind as I entered the room, the sun shining on your birthday. Music transcribed. <laughs> Wilson has just been here, and begs me to send you his best regards and congratulations. He is all kindness and courtesy towards me, and as you wish to know, I think I may say that we suit each other remarkably well. The few words you wrote about P recalled him to my memory in all his offensiveness. The Abate Santini ought to be an obscure man compared with him, for he never attempts to magnify his own importance by impertinence or self-sufficiency. P is one of those great collectors who make learning in libraries distasteful to others by their narrow-mindedness, whereas Santini is a genuine collector, in the best sense of the word, caring little whether his collection be of much value in a pecuniary point of view. He therefore gives everything away indiscriminately, and is only anxious to procure something new, for his chief object is the diffusion and universal knowledge of ancient music. I have not seen him lately as every morning now he figures, ex officio, in his violet gown at St. Peter's. But if he has made use of some ancient text, he will say so without scruple, as he has no wish to be thought the first discoverer. He is, in fact, a man of limited capacity, and this I consider great praise in a certain sense, for though he is neither a musical nor any other luminary, and even bears some resemblance to Lessing's inquisitive friar, 
Still, he knows how to confine himself within his own sphere. Music itself does not interest him much, if he can only have it on his shelves. And he is, and esteems himself to be, simply a quiet, zealous collector. I must admit that he is fatiguing, and not altogether free from irritability. Still, I love anyone who adopts and perseveres in some particular pursuit, prosecuting it to the best of his ability, and endeavoring to perfect it for the benefit of mankind. And I think everyone ought to esteem him just the same, whether he chance to be tiresome or agreeable. I wish you would read this aloud to P. It always makes me furious when men who have no pursuit presume to criticize those who wish to effect something, even on a small scale. So on this very account, I took the liberty of rebuking lately a certain musician in society here. He began to speak of Mozart, and as Bonson and his sister love Palestrina, he tried to flatter their tastes by asking me, for instance, what I thought of the worthy Mozart and all his sins. I, however, replied that so far as I was concerned, I should feel only too happy to renounce all my virtues in exchange for Mozart's sins, but that, of course, I could not venture to pronounce on extent of all his virtues. The people all laughed and were highly amused. How strange it is that such persons should feel no awe of so great a name. It is some consolation, however, that it is the same in every sphere of art. As the painters here are quite as bad, they are most formidable to look at, sitting in their Café Greco. I scarcely ever go there, for I dislike both them and their favorable places of resort. It is a small dark room, about eight feet square, where on one side you may smoke, but not on the other. So they sit around on benches, with their broad-leaved hats on their heads, and their huge mastiff behind them, their cheeks and throats, and the whole of their faces covered with hair, puffing forth clouds of smoke, only on one side of the room, and saying rude things to each other, while their mastiffs swarm with vermin. A neckcloth or a coat would be quite innovations. Any portion of the faces visible through the beard is hid by the spectacles. So they drink coffee and speak of Titian and Pudione, just as if they were sitting beside them, and also wear beards and wide awakes. Moreover, they paint such sickly Madonnas and feeble saints and such milksop heroes that I feel the strongest inclination to knock them down. These infernal critics do not even shrink from discussing Titian's picture in the Vatican, about which you asked me. They say that it has neither subject nor meaning, yet it never seems to occur to them that a master who had so long studied a picture with due love and reverence must have had quite as deep an insight into the subject as they are likely to have, even with their colored spectacles. And if in the course of my life I accomplish nothing but this, I am at all events determined to say the most harsh and cutting things to those who show no reverence towards their masters, and then I shall at least have performed one good work. But there they stand and see all the splendor of those creations, so far transcending their own conceptions, and yet dare to criticize them. In this picture there are three stages, or whatever they are called, the same in the transfiguration. Below, saints and martyrs are represented in suffering and abasement. On every face is depicted sadness, nay, almost impatience. One figure, in rich episodical robes, looks upwards, with the most eager and antagonized longing, as if weeping, but he cannot see all that is floating above his head, but which we see, standing in front of the picture. Above, Mary and her child are in a cloud, radiant with joy, and surrounded by angels, who have woven many garlands. The holy child holds one of these, and seems as if about to crown the saints beneath, but his mother withholds his hand for the moment. The contrast between the pain and the suffering below, whence Saint Sebastian looks forth out of the picture, with such gloom and almost apathy, and the lofty, unalloyed exultation in the clouds above, where crowns and psalms are already awaiting him, is truly admirable. High above the group of Mary hovers the Holy Spirit, from whom emanates a bright streaming light, thus forming the apex of the whole composition. I have just remembered that Goethe, at the beginning of his first visit to Rome, describes and admires this picture, but I no longer have the book to enable me to read it over and to compare my description with his. He speaks of it in considerable detail. It was at that time in the Quirinal and subsequently transferred to the Vatican. Whether it was painted on a given subject, as some allige or not, is of no moment. Titian has imbued it with his genius and his poetical feeling, and has thus made it his own. 
I like Shadov much, and am often with him. On every occasion, especially in his own department, he is mild and clear judging, doing justice with due modesty to all that is truly great. He recently said that Titian has never painted an indifferent or uninteresting picture, and I believe he is right, for life and enthusiasm and the soundest vigor are displayed in all his productions, and where these are, it is good to be also. There is one singular and fortunate peculiarity here, for all the objects have been, a thousand times over, described, discussed, copied, and criticized, in praise or blame, by the greatest masters and the most insignificant scholars, cleverly or stupidly, still they never fail to make a fresh and sublime impression on all, affecting each person according to his own individuality. Here we can take refuge from man in all that surrounds us. In Berlin, it is often exactly the reverse. I have this moment received your letter of the 27th, and am pleased to find that I have already answered many of the questions it contains. There is no hurry about the letters I asked for, as I have now made almost more acquaintances than I wish. Besides, late hours, and playing so much, do not suit me in Rome, so I can await the arrival of these letters very patiently. It was not so at the time I urged you to send them. I cannot, however, understand what you mean with your allusion to the coteries, which I ought to have outgrown, for I know that I, and all of us, invariably dreaded and detested what is usually so called, that is, a frivolous exclusive circle of society, clinging to empty outward forms. Among persons, however, who daily meet, where their mutual objects of interest remain the same, who have no sympathy with public life, and this is certainly the case in Berlin, with the exception of the theater, it is not unnatural that they should form themselves a gay, cheerful, and original mode of treating passing events, and that this should give rise to a peculiar and perhaps monotonous style of conversation, but this by no means constitutes a coterie. I feel convinced that I shall never belong to one, whether I am in Rome or Wittenberg. I am glad that the last words I was writing, when your letter arrived, chanced to be that in Berlin, you must take refuge in society from all that surrounds you, thus proving that I had no spirit of coterie, which invariably estranges men from each other. I should deeply regret your observing anything of the kind in me, or in any of us, except indeed for the moment. Forgive me, my dear father, for defending myself so warmly, but this word is most repugnant to my feelings, and you say in your letters that I am always to speak out what I think in a straightforward manner, so pray do not take this amiss. I was in St. Peter's today, where the grand solemnities called the absolutions have begun for the Pope, and which last till Tuesday, when the cardinals assemble in conclave. The building surpasses all powers of description. It appears to me like some great work of nature, a forest, a mass of rocks, or something similar, for I never can realize the idea that it is the work of man. You strive to distinguish the ceiling as little as the canopy of heaven. You lose your way in St. Peter's, you take a walk in it, and ramble till you are quite tired, when divine service is performed enchanted there. You are not aware of it till you come quite close. The angels in the baptistry are monstrous giants, the doves colossal birds of prey. You lose all idea of measurement with the eye or proportion, and yet who does not feel his heart expand when standing under the dome and gazing up at it, present a monstrous catafalque has been erected in the nave in this shape the coffin is placed in the centre under the pillars the thing is totally devoid of taste yet it has a wondrous effect the upper circle is thickly studded with lights so are all the ornaments the lower circle is lighted in the same way and over the coffin hangs a burning lamp and innumerable lights are blazing under the statues the whole structure is more than a hundred feet high and stands exactly opposite the entrance. The guards of honor and the Swiss march about the quadrangle, and in every corner sits a cardinal in deep mourning, attended by his servants, who hold large burning torches, and then the singing commences with responses. In the simple and monotonous tone, you no doubt remember. It is the only occasion when there is any singing in the middle of church and the effect is wonderful. Those who place themselves among the singers, as I do, and watch them, are forcibly impressed by the scene, for they all stand round a colossal book from which they sing, and this book is in turn lit up by a colossal torch 
that burns before it, while the choir are eagerly pressing forward in their vestments in order to see and sing properly. And Bayani, with his monk's face, marking time with his hand, and occasionally joining in the chant with a stenorian voice. To watch all these different Italian faces was most interesting. One enjoyment quickly succeeds another here, and it is the same in all their churches, especially in St. Peter's, where by moving a few steps the whole scene is changed. I went to the very furthest end, whence there was indeed a wonderful coup d'oeil. Through the spiral columns of the high altar, which is confessedly as high as the palace in Berlin, far beyond the space of the cupola, the whole mass of the catafic is in the diminished perspective, with its rows of lights and numbers of small human beings crowding round it. When the music commences, the sounds do not reach the other end for a long time, but echo and float in the vast space, so that the most singular and vague harmonies are borne towards you. If you change your position and place yourself right in the front of the catafique, beyond the blaze of light and the brilliant pageantry, you have the dusky cupola replete with blue vapor. All this is quite indescribable. Such is Rome. This has become a long letter, so I must conclude. It will reach you on Christmas Day. May you all enjoy it happily. I send each of you presents, which are to be dispatched two days hence and will arrive in time for the anniversary of your silver wedding day. Many glad festivals are thus crowded together, and I scarcely know whether to imagine myself with you today, or to wish you, dear father, all possible happiness, or to arrive with my letter at Christmas, is not to be allowed by my mother to pass through the room with the Christmas tree. I am afraid I must be contented with thinking of you. Farewell all. May you be happy. Felix. I have just received your letter which brings me the intelligence of Goethe's illness. What I personally feel at this news I cannot express. This whole evening his words, I must try to keep all right till your return, have sounded continually in my ears, to the exclusion of every other thought. When he is gone, Germany will assume a very different aspect for artists. I have never thought of Germany without feeling heartfelt joy and pride that Goethe lived there. And the rising generation seem for the most part so weakly and feeble that it makes my heart sink within me. He is the last, and with him closes a happy, prosperous period for us. This year ends in solemn sadness. End of section 7 Section 8 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland, translated by Grace Wallace, December 20th, 1830 through January 17th, 1831. Rome, December 20th, 1830. In my former letter, I told you of the most serious aspect of Roman life, but as I wish to describe to you how I live, I must now tell you of the gaieties that have prevailed during the week. Today we have the most genial sunshine, a blue sky, and a transparent atmosphere, and on such days I have my own mode of passing my time. I work hard till eleven o'clock, and from that hour till dark I do nothing but breathe the air. For the first time, for some days past, we yesterday had fine weather. After, therefore, working for a time in the morning at Solomon, I went to the Montepiccio where I rambled about the whole day. The effect of this exhilarating air is quite magical, and when I arose today and again saw bright sunshine, I exulted in the thoughts of the entire idleness I was again about to indulge in. The whole world is on foot, reveling in a December spring. Every moment you meet some acquaintance with whom you lounge about for a time, then leave him, and once more enjoy your solitary reverie. There are swarms of handsome faces to be seen. As the sun declines, the appearance of the whole landscape and every hue undergo a change. When the Ave Maria sounds, it is time to go to the church at Trinita de Monti, where French nuns sing, and it is charming to hear them. I declare to heaven that I am become quite tolerant, and listen to bad music with edification. But what can I do? The composition is positively ridiculous, the organ playing even more absurd. But it is twilight, and the whole of the small bright church is filled with persons kneeling, lit up by the sinking sun each time that the door is opened. Both the singing nuns have the sweetest voices in the world, quite tender and touching, more especially when one of them sings the responses in her melodious voice, which we are accustomed to hear chanted by priests in a loud, harsh, 
monotonous tone. The impression is very singular. Moreover, it is well known that no one is permitted to see the fair singers. So this caused me to form a strange resolution. I have composed something to suit their voices, which I observed very minutely, and mean to send it to them. There are several modes to which I can have recourse to accomplish this. That they will sing it, I feel quite assured, and it will be pleasant to hear my chant performed by persons whom I never saw, especially as they must in turn sing it to the Barbaro Tedesco, whom they also never beheld. I am charmed with this idea. The text is in Latin, a prayer to Mary. Does not this notion please you? After church, I walk again on the hill until it is quite dark, where Madame Vernet and her daughter, and pretty Madame V, for whose acquaintance I have to thank Rosel, are much admired by us Germans, and we form groups around them, or follow or walk beside them. The background is formed by haggard painters with terrific beards. They smoke tobacco on the Monte Piccio, whistle to their huge dogs, and enjoy the sunset in their own way. I am in a frivolous mood today. I must relate to you, dear sisters, every particular of a ball I lately attended, and where I danced with a degree of zeal I never did before. I had spoken a few fair words to the maître de danse, who stands in the middle here and regulates everything. Consequently, he allowed the gallop to continue for more than half an hour, so I was in my element, and pleasantly conscious that I was dancing in the Palazzo Albani in Rome, and also with the prettiest girl in it, according to the verdict of the competent judges, Torvaldsen, Vernet, etc. The way in which I became acquainted with her is also an anecdote of Rome. I was at Torlonia's first ball, though not dancing, as I knew none of the ladies present, but merely looking at people. Suddenly someone tapped me on the shoulder, saying, So you are admiring the English beauty? I am quite dazzled. It was Torvaldin himself, standing at the door, lost in admiration. Scarcely had he said this, when we heard a torrent of words behind us. Mais où est-ce qu'elle donc, ce petit anglais? On m'a envoyé pour la regarder perbaco. It was quite clear that this little thin Frenchman, with stiff grey hair and a ribbon of the Legion of Honour, must be Horace Vernet. He now discussed the youthful beauty with Torvaldin in the most earnest and scientific manner and it was quite a pleasure to me to see these two old masters admiring the young girl together, while she was dancing away, quite unconcerned. They were then presented to her parents, but I felt very insignificant, as I could not join in the conversation. A few days afterwards, however, I was with some acquaintances whom I knew through the Atwoods at Venice, they having invited me for the purpose of presenting me to some of their friends, and these friends turned out to be the very persons I had been speaking of, so your son and brother was highly delighted. My pianoforte playing is a source of great gratification to me here. You know how Torsvaldin loves music, and I sometimes play to him in the morning while he is at work. He has an excellent instrument in his studio, and when I look at the old gentleman and see him kneading his brown clay and delicately fining off an arm or a fold of drapery, in short, when he is creating what we must all admire when completed, as an enduring work, then I do indeed rejoice that I have the means of bestowing any enjoyment on him. Nevertheless, I have not fallen into arrear with my own task. The Hebrides is completed at last, and a strange production it is. The chant for the nuns is also in my head, and I think of composing Luther's choral for Christmas. But on this occasion, I must do so quite alone. It will be a more serious affair this time, and so will the anniversary of your silver wedding day, when I intend to have a great many lights, and to sing my leaderspiel, and to have a peep at my English baton. After the new year, I intend to resume instrumental music, and to write several things for the piano, and probably a symphony of some kind, for two have been haunting my brain. I have lately frequented a most delightful spot, the tomb of Cecilia Medella. The Sabina Hills has a sparkling of snow, but it was glorious sunshine. The Alban Hills were like a dream or a vision. There is no such thing as a distance in Italy, for all the houses on the hills can be counted, with their roofs and windows. I have thus inhaled this air to satiety, and tomorrow, in all probability, will be more serious occupations will be resumed, for the sky is cloudy and it is raining hard. But what a spring this will be! December 21st. This is the shortest day and very gloomy, as might have been anticipated, so today nothing can be thought of but fugues, quarrels, balls, etc. But I must say a few words about Guido's Aurora, which I often visit. It is a picture of the very type of haste and impetus, where surely no man ever imagined such hurry and tumult, such sounding and clashing. 
Painters maintain that it is lighted from two sides. They have my full permission to light theirs from three if it will improve them. But the difference lies elsewhere. I really cannot compose a tolerable song here, for who is there to sing it to me? But I am writing a grand fugue, Wir glauben all, and sing it to myself in such a fashion that my friend the captain rushes downstairs in alarm, puts in his head, and asks what I want. I answer, a counter theme. But how much I do really want, and yet how much I have got. Thus life passes onwards. Felix. Rome, December 28th, 1830. Rome in wet weather is the most odious, uncomfortable place imaginable. For some days past, we have had incessant storms and cold, and streams of water from the sky. And I can scarcely comprehend how, only one week ago, I could write you a letter full of rambles and orange trees, and all that is beautiful. In such weather as this, everything becomes ugly. Still, I must write to you about it. Otherwise, my previous letter would not have the advantage of contrast. And of that there is no lack. If in Germany we can form no conception of the bright winter days here, quite as little can we realize a really wet winter day in Rome. Everything is arranged for fine weather, so the bad is born like a public calamity, and in hope of better times. There is no shelter anywhere. In my room, which is usually so comfortable, the water pours in through the windows, which will not shut fast, and the wind whistles through the doors, which will not close. The stone floor chills you in spine of double mattings, and the smoke from the chimney is driven into the room, because the fire will not burn. Foreigners shiver and freeze here like tailors. All this is, however, actual luxury when compared with the streets, and when I am obliged to go out, I consider it a positive misfortune. Rome, as everyone knows, is built on seven large hills, but there are a number of smaller ones besides, and all the streets are sloping, so the water pours down them and rushes towards you. Nowhere is there a raised footpath or trottoir at the stair of the Piazza di Spagna. There is a flood like the great waterworks in Williams Hill, and the Tiber has overflowed its banks and inundated the adjacent streets. This, then, is the water from below. From above come violent showers of rain, but that is the least part. The houses have no water spouts, and the long roofs slant precipitously, but, being of different lengths, this causes an incessant violent inundation on both sides of the street, so that, go where you will, close to the houses, or in the middle of the streets, beside a barber shop or a palace, you are sure to be deluged, and, quite unawares, you find yourself standing under a tremendous shower bath, the water pelting on your umbrella, while a stream is running before you that you cannot jump over, so you are obliged to return the way you came. This is the water overhead. Then the carriages drive as rapidly as possible, and close to the houses, so that you must retreat into the doorways till they are passed. They not only splash men in houses, but each other, so that when two meet, one must drive into the gutter, which, being a rapid current, the consequences are lamentable. Lately I saw an abate hurrying along, whose umbrella chancing to knock off the broad-brimmed hat of a peasant, it fell with a crown exposed to one of these deluges. And when the man went to pick it up, it was quite filled with water. Excuse, said the abate. Padoni, said the peasant. The hackney coaches, moreover, only ply till five o'clock, so if you go to a party at night, it costs you a scudo. Fiat gestitia e fiat mundus. Rome in rainy weather is vastly disagreeable. I see by a letter of Jeffrey's that one I wrote him from Venice, and which I took to the post myself on the 17th of October, had not reached him on the 19th of November. It would appear also that another which I sent the same day from Munich had not arrived. Both these letters contained music, and this accounts for the loss. At that very time in Venice, they carried off all my manuscripts to the custom house. After visiting my effects at night, shortly before the departure of the post, I only received them again here. After much worry and writing backwards and forwards, everyone assured me that the cause of this was a secret correspondence being suspected in the manuscript music. I could scarcely credit such intolerable stupidity. But as my two letters from Venice containing music have not arrived, and these only, the thing is clear enough. I intend to complain of this to the Austrian ambassador here, but it will do no good, and the letters are lost, which I must regret. Farewell. Felix. Rome, January 17th, 1831. For a week past, we have had the most lovely spring weather. 
young girls are carrying about nosegays of violets and anemones, which they gather early in the morning at the Villa Pamphili. The streets and squares swarm with gaily attired pedestrians. The Ave Maria has already been advanced twenty minutes, but what has become of the winter? Some little time ago it indeed reminded me of my work, to which I now mean to apply steadily, for I own that during the gay social life of the previous weeks I had rather neglected it. I had nearly completed the arrangements of Solomon and also my Christmas anthem, which consists of five numbers. The two symphonies also begin to assure a more definite form, and I particularly wish to finish them here. Probably I shall be able to accomplish this during Lent, when parties cease, especially balls, and spring begins, and then I shall have both time and inclination to compose, in which case I hope to have a good store of new works. Any performance of them here is quite out of the question. The orchestras are worse than any one could believe. Both musicians and a right feeling of music are wanting. The two or three violin performers play just as they choose and join in when they please. The wind instruments are tuned either too high or too low, and they execute flourishes like those we are accustomed to hear in farmyards, but hardly so good. In short, the whole forms a Dutch concert, and this applies even to the compositions with which they are familiar. The question is whether all this could be radically reformed by introducing other people into the orchestra, by teaching the musicians time, by instructing them in first principles. I think in that case the people would no doubt take pleasure in it. So long, however, as this is not done, no improvement can be hoped for. And everyone seems so indifferent on the subject that there is not the slightest prospect of such a thing. I heard a solo on the flute, where the flute was more than a quarter tone too high. It set my teeth on edge, but no one remarked it. And when at the end a shake came, they applauded mechanically. If it were even a shade better with regard to singing, the great singers have left this country. La Blanche, David, Rolanda, Pizzeroni, etc. sing in Paris. And the minor ones who remain copy their inspired moments, which they caricature in the most insupportable manner. We in Germany may perhaps wish to accomplish something false or impossible, but it is, and always will be, quite dissimilar. Just as a Sisabio will forever be odious and repulsive to my feelings, so it is also with Italian music. I may be too obtuse to comprehend either, but I shall never feel otherwise. And recently, at the Philharmonic, after the music of Passini, Bellini, where the Cavalier Ricci begged me to accompany him in non più andrai, the very first notes were so utterly different and so infinitely remote from all the previous music that the matter was clear to me then, and never will it be equalized, so long as there is such a blue sky and such a charming winter as the present, in the same way that the Swiss can paint no beautiful scenery, precisely because they have it the whole day before their eyes. Les aliments créent la musique comme un orfeo d'état, c'est spontané, and I accept the axiom. I lately heard some musicians here talking of their composers, and I listened in silence. One quoted, but the others interrupted him, saying he could not be considered an Italian, for the German school still clung to him, and he had never been able to get rid of it. Consequently, he had never been at home in Italy. We Germans say precisely the reverse of him, and it must not be a little trying to find yourself so entre deux without any fatherland. So far as I am concerned, I stick to my own colors, which are quite honorable enough for me. Last night, a theater that Torlonia has undertaken and organized was opened with a new opera of Pacini's. The crowd was great, and every box filled with handsome, well-dressed people. Young Torlonia appeared in stage box with his mother, the old duchess, and they were immensely applauded. Bravo Torlonia, grazie grazie. Opposite him was Jerome, with his suite covered with orders. In the next box, Samerlov, etc. Over the orchestra is a picture of time pointing to the dial of the clock, which revolves slowly, and is enough to make one melancholy. Bassini then appeared at the piano and was kindly welcomed. He had prepared no overture, so the opera began with a chorus, accompanied by strokes on an anvil tuned in the proper key. And the corsair came forward, sang his aria, and was applauded, on which the corsair above and the maestro below bowed. This pirate is a contralto, sung by Mademoiselle Mariani. A variety of airs followed, and the piece became very tiresome. This seemed to be also the opinion of the public. 
For when Passini's grand finale began, the whole pit stood up, talking to each other as loud as they could, laughing and turning their backs on the stage. Madame Sarievo fainted in her box and was carried out. Passini glided away from the piano, and at the end of the act, the curtain fell in the midst of a great tumult. Barbara Blua, followed by the last act of the opera. As the audience were now in a mood for it, they hissed the whole ballet from the very beginning, and accompanied the second act also with hooting and laughter. At the close, Dorlonia was called for, but he would not appear. This is the matter-of-fact narrative of a first performance at the opening of a theatre in Rome. I had anticipated much amusement, so I came away considerably out of humour. Still, if the music had made furore, I should have been very indignant, for it is so wretched that it is really beneath all criticism, but that they should turn their backs on the favourite Pini, whom they wished to crown in the capital, parody his melodies, and sing them in a lucrative style. This does, I confess, provoke me not a little, and is likewise a proof of how low such a musician stands in the public opinion. Another time they will carry him home on their shoulders, but this is no compensation. They would not act thus in France with regard to Boyardieu. Independent of all love of art, a sense of propriety would have prevented their doing so. But enough of this subject, for it is too vexatious. Why should Italy still insist on being the land of art, while it is in reality the land of nature, thus delighting every heart? I have already described to you my walks on the Monte Pizzio. I continue them daily. I went lately with the Voltards to Ponte Numentano, a solitary, dilapidated bridge in the spacious green Capania. Many ruins from the days of ancient Rome, and many watchtowers from the Middle Ages, are scattered over this long succession of meadows. Chains of hills rise towards the horizon, now partially covered with snow, and fantastically varied in form and color by the shadows of the clouds. And there is also the enchanting, vapory visions of the Alban hills, which change their hues like a chameleon as you gaze at them. You can see for miles little white chapels glittering on the dark grounds of the hills, as far as the Passionist convent on the summit, and when you can trace the road winding through the thickets, and the hills sloping downwards towards the lake of Albano, while a hermitage peeps through the trees. The distance is equal to that from Berlin to Potsdam, I say is a good Berliner, but that is a lovely vision, I say in earnest. No lack of music there. It echoes and vibrates there on every side not in the vapid, tasteless theatres. So we rambled about, chasing each other in the campagna, and jumping over the fences, and when the sun went down we drove home, feeling so weary, and yet so self-satisfied and pleased, as if we had done great things, and so we have, if we rightly appreciated it all. I have now applied myself again to drawing, and have latterly put in some tints, as I should be glad to be able to recall some of these bright hues, and practice quickens the perceptions. I must now tell you, dear mother, of a great, very great pleasure I recently enjoyed, because you will rejoice with me. Two days ago, I was for the first time in a small circle with Horace Vernet, and played there. He had previously told me that his most favorite and esteemed music was Don Juan, especially the duet and the commendore, commendatore at the end. And as I highly approved of such sentiments on his part, the result was that while playing a prelude to Weber's concert stuc, I imperceptibly glided further into extemporizing. I thought I would please him by taking these themes, and so I worked them up fancifully for some time. This caused him a degree of delight far beyond what I ever knew my music would produce in any one, and we became at once more intimate. Afterwards, he suddenly came up to me and whispered that we must make an exchange, for that he was also an improvisatore, and when I was naturally curious to know what he meant, he said it was his secret. He is, however, like a little child, and could not conceal it for more than a quarter of an hour. When he came in again, and taking me into the next room, he asked me if I had any time to spare, as he had stretched and prepared a canvas, and proposed painting my portrait on it, which I was to keep in memory of this day, or to roll it up and send it to you or to take it with me, just as I choose. He said he should have no easy task with his um, improvisation, but at all events he would attempt it. I was only too glad to give my consent, and cannot tell you how much I was enchanted with the delight and enthusiasm he evidently felt in my playing. It was in every respect a happy evening. As I ascended the hill with him, all was so still and peaceful, and only one window lit up in the large dark villa. Fragments of music floated on the air, 
and its echoes in the dark night, mingled with the murmuring of fountains, were sweeter than I can describe. Two young students were drilling in the anteroom, while the third acted the part of lieutenant, and commanded in good form. In another room, my friend Montfort, who gained the prize for music in the conservatorium, was seated at a piano, and others were standing round, singing a chorus, but it went very badly. They urged another young man to join them, and when he said that he did not know how to sing, his friend rejoined, Est-ce que ça fait? C'est toujours un fois de plus. I helped them as best I could, and we were well amused. Afterwards, we danced, and I wish you could have seen Louise Vernet dancing the saltarella with her father. When at length she was forced to stop for a few minutes, and snatched up a tambourine, playing with the utmost spirit, and relieving us, you could have scarcely any longer move our hands. I wish I had been a painter, for what a superb picture she would have made. Her mother is the kindest creature in the world, and her grandfather, Charles René, who paints very splendid horses, danced a quadrille the same evening with so much ease, king so many entrechats, and varying his steps so gracefully, that it is a sad pity he should actually be seventy-two years of age. Every day he rides and tires out two horses, paints and draws a little, and spends the evening in society. In my next letter, I must tell you of my acquaintance with Robert, who has just finished an admirable picture, The Harvest, and also describe my recent visits with Bjornsen to the studios of Cornelius Kolk, Overbeck, etc. My time is fully occupied, for there is plenty to do and to see. Unluckily, I cannot make time elastic, however much I may try to extend it. I have as yet said nothing of Raphael's portrait as a child, and Titian's nymphs bathing, who in a piquant enough fashion are designated sacred and profane love, one being in full gala costume, while the other is devoid of all drapery. Of my exquisite Madonna di Foligio, or Francesco Zia, the most guileless and devout painter in the world. Of poor Gildo Reni, whom the bearded painters of the present day treat with such contempt, and yet he painted a certain aurora, and many other splendid objects besides. But what avails description? It is well for me that I can revel in the sight of them. When we meet, I may perhaps be able to give you a better idea of them. Yours, Felix. End of section 8. Section 9 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland. Translated by Grace Wallace. February 1st through March 1st, 1831. Rome, February 1st, 1831. I intended not to write to you till my birthday, but possibly two days hence I may not be in a writing mood, and must drive all fancies away by hard work. It does not seem probable that the papal military band will surprise me in the morning, and as I have told all of my acquaintances that I was born on the 25th, I think the day will glide quietly by. I prefer this to a trivial half-and-half -half celebration. I will place your portrait before me in the morning and feel happy in looking at it and thinking of you. I shall then play over my military overture and select my favorite dish for dinner, from the carte à the lepre. It is not improbable to be obliged to do all this for oneself, both on birthdays and other days. I feel isolated enough, and am rather partial to the other extreme. At night, the Tolones are so obliging as to give a ball to 800 persons. On Wednesday, the day before, and on Friday, the day after my birthday, I am invited to the house of some English friends. During the previous week, I have been busily engaged in sightseeing and revisited many well-known objects. Thus, I was in the Vatican, the Farancina, Corsini, the Villa Lante, Borghese, etc. Two days ago, I saw the frescoes for the first time in the Bartoldi's house, insomuch as the English ladies who reside there, and who have transformed the painted saloon into a sleeping apartment with a four-post bed, would never hitherto permit me to enter it. So this was my first visit to my uncle's house. When at last I saw his pictures, the view of the city, it was a noble regal idea to have these frescoes, and the execution of such a sublime thought, in spite of every kind of impediment and annoyance, simply in order that the design should be carried out, seemed to me very charming, but to turn to an entirely different subject. In many circles here, it is the fashion to consider piety and dullness synonymous, 
and yet they are very different our german clergyman here is not behindhand in this respect there are men in rome with an amount of fascination credible to the sixteenth century but quite monstrous in the present day they all wish to make converts abusing each other in a christian manner and each ridiculing the belief of his neighbor till it is quite too sad to hear them as if to have simplicity and to be simple were the same thing unfortunately i must here retract my favorite axiom that good will can affect all things ability must accompany it but i am soaring too high and my father will lecture me i wish this letter were better but we have snow on the ground the roofs of the piazza di spagna are quite white and heavy clouds of snow are gathering nothing can be more odious to us southerners and we are freezing the monte piccino is a mass of ice your northern lights have their revenge on us who can write or think of any degree of warmth i was so pleased at the idea of being a whole winter without snow but now i must give up that notion the italians say that spring breezes will come in a few days then gay life and gay letters will be resumed farewell may you enjoy every good and think of me felix rome february eighth eighteen thirty one the pope is elected the pope is crowned he performed mass in st peter's on sunday and conferred his benediction in the evening the dome was illuminated succeeded by the girandola the carnival began on saturday and pursues its headlong course in the most motley forms the city has been illuminated each evening last night there was a ball at the french embassy to-day the spanish ambassador gives a grand entertainment next door they sell confetti and how they do shout and now i might well stop for why attempt to describe what is in fact indescribable you ought to make hensel tell you of these splendid fetes which in pomp brilliancy and animation surpass all the imagination can conceive for my sombre pen is not equal to the task what a different aspect everything has assumed during the last eight days for now the mildest and most genial sun is shining and we remain in the balcony enjoying the air till after sunset oh that i can enclose for you in this letter only one quarter of an hour of all this pleasure or tell you how life actually flies in rome every minute bringing its own memorable delights it is not difficult to give fetes here if the simple architectural outlines are lighted up the dome of st peter's blazes forth in the dark purple atmosphere calmly shining if there are fireworks they brighten the gloomy solid walls of the castle of st angelo and fall into the tiber where they commence their fantastic fetes in february the most lustrous sun shines down on them and beautifies them it is a wondrous land but i must not forget to tell you that i spent my birthday very differently from what i expected i must however be brief for an hour hence i go to join the carnival in the corso my birthday had three celebrations the eve the birthday itself and the day after on the second of february santini was sitting in my room in the morning and in answer to my impatient questions about the conclave replied with a diplomatic air that there was little chance of a pope being elected before easter Herr Brisbane also called, and told me that after leaving Berlin, he had been in Constantinople, in Samara, etc., and inquired after his acquaintances in Berlin, where suddenly the report of a cannon was heard, and then another, and people rushed across the Piazza di Spagna, shouting with all their might. We three started off, heaven knows how, and ran breathlessly to the Quirinal, where the man was just retreating, who had shouted through a broken window, Annuncio vobis gaudium magnum, bunus papam, er dominum caparari, qui nosum osviet oius sedici. All the cardinals now crowded into the balcony to breathe fresh air and laugh and talk together. It was the first time they had been in the open air for fifty days, and yet they looked so gay, their red caps shining brightly in the sun. The whole piazza was filled with people who clamored on the obelisk and on the red horses of Fidias and the statues projected far above in the air carriage after carriage drove up amid jostling and shouting then the new pope appeared and before him was borne the golden cross and he blessed the crowd for the first time while the people at the same moment prayed and cried hurrah all the bells in rome were ringing and there was a firing of cannons and flourishes of trumpets and military music this was the eve of my birthday next morning i followed the crowd down the long street to the piazza of st peter's which looked finer than i had ever seen it lit up brightly in the sun and swarming with carriages the cardinals in their red coaches driving in state the sacristy with servants in embroidered liveries and people innumerable of every nation rank and condition and high above them the dome in the church seeming to float in blue vapour for there was considerable mist in the morning air 
and I thought that Capillari would probably appropriate all this to himself when he saw it, but I knew better. It was all to celebrate my birthday, and the election of the Pope, and the homage, a mere spectacle in honor of me. But it was well and naturally performed, and so long as I live, I shall never forget it. The Church of St. Peter's was crowded to the door. The Pope was borne in on his throne, and the fans of peacock's feathers carried before him, and then set down on the high altar, when the papal singers intoned, to a sacrodos magnus. I only heard two or three chords, but it required no more. The sound was enough. Then one cardinal succeeded another, kissing the Pope's foot and his hands, when he in turn embraced them. After surveying all this for a time, standing closely pressed by a crowd, and unable to move, to look suddenly aloft to the dome, as far as the lanterns inspires a single sensation. I was with Diodate among a throng of Capuchins. These saintly men are far from being devotional on any occasion of this kind, and by no means cleanly. But I must hasten on. The carnival is beginning, and I must not lose any portion of it. All night, in honor of my birthday, barrels of pitch were burned in all the streets, and the propaganda illuminated. The people thought this was owing to its being the former residence of the Pope, but I knew it was because I lived exactly opposite, and I only had to lean out of my window to enjoy it all. Then came Trelonia's ball, and in every corner were seen glimpses of red caps above, and red stockings below. The following day they worked very hard at scaffoldings, platforms, and stages for the carnival. Edicts were posted up about horse racing, and specimens of masks were displayed at the windows, and, in celebration for the day following my birthday, the illumination of the dome, and the girondula were fixed for Sunday. On Saturday, all the world went to the capital to witness the form of the Jews' supplications to be suffered to remain in the sacred city for another year. The request which is refused at the foot of the hill, but after repeated entreaties, granted on the summit, and the ghetto is assigned to them. It was a tiresome affair. We waited two hours, and after all, understood the oration of the Jews as little as the answer of the Christians. I came down again in a very bad humor, and thought that the carnival had commenced rather unproprietously. So I arrived in the Corso, and was driving along, thinking no evil, when I was suddenly assailed by a shower of sugar comfits. I looked up. They had been flung by some young ladies, whom I had seen occasionally at balls, but scarcely knew. And when in my embarrassment I took off my hat to bow to them, pelting began in right earnest. Their carriages drove on, and in the next was Miss T, a delicate young Englishwoman. I tried to bow to her, but she pelted me too, so I became quite desperate, and clutching the confetti, I flung them back bravely. There were swarms of my acquaintances, and my blue coat was soon as white as that of a miller. The bees were standing on a balcony, flinging confetti like hail at my head, and thus pelting and pelted, amid thousand jests and jeers, and the most extravagant masks, the day ended with races. The following day there was no carnival but a compensation. The Pope conferred his benediction from the loggia in the Piazza of St. Peter's. He was consecrated as bishop in the church, and at night the dome was lighted up. The sudden, nay instantaneous, change the illumination of the building effects. You must ask Hensel to paint or to describe, whichever he prefers. Nothing can be more startling than the sudden and surprising vision of so many hundred human beings, previously invisible, now revealed as it were in the air working and moving about, in the glorious girondola, but who can conceive it? Now the gaieties recommence. Farewell. In my next letter, I mean to continue my description. Yesterday, at the carnival, flowers and bonbons were indiscriminately thrown, and a mask gave me a bouquet, which I have dried, and mean to bring home for you. All idea of occupation is out of the question at present. I have only composed one little song, but when Lent comes, I intend to be more industrious. Who can at such a moment think either of writing or music? I must go out, so farewell, dear ones. Felix. Rome, February 22nd, 1831. A thousand thanks for your letter of the 8th, which I received yesterday on my return from Tivoli. I cannot tell you, dear Fanny, how much I am delighted with your plan about the Sunday music. This idea of yours is most brilliant, and I do entreat of you, for heaven's sake, not to let it die away again. On the contrary, pray give your traveling brother a commission to write something new for you. He will gladly do so, for he is quite charmed with you and with your project. You must let me know what voices you have, and also take counsel with your subjects as to what they like best. For the people, O oh Fanny, have rights. 
I think it would be good to plan a place before them something easy, interesting, and pleasing. For instance, the litany of Sebastian Bach. But to speak seriously, I recommend the Shepherd of Israel, or the Dixit Dominus of Handel. Do you mean to play something during the intervals to these people? I think this would not be unprofitable to either party, for they must have time to take breath, and you must study the piano, and thus it would become a vocal and instrumental concert. I wish so much that I could be one of the audience, and compliment you afterwards. Be discreet and indulgent, and avoid fatiguing either yourself or the voices of your singers. Do not be irritable when things go badly. Say very little on the subject to anyone. Lastly, above all, endeavor to prevent the choir from feeling any tedium, for this is the principal point. One of my pieces certainly owes its birth to this Sunday music. When you wrote to me about it lately, I reflected whether there was anything I could send you, thus reviving an old favorite scheme of mine, which has however now assumed such vast proportions that I cannot let you have any part of it by E, but you shall have it at some future time. Listen and wonder. Since I left Vienna, I have partly composed Goethe's first Valpries Niet, but have not yet the courage to write it down. The composition has now assumed a form and become a grand cantata, with full orchestra, and may turn out well. At the opening, there are songs of spring, etc., and plenty of others of the same kind. Afterwards, when the watchmen with their Gablin und Zacken und Eulen make a great noise, the fairy frolics begin, and you know that I have a particular foible for them. The sacrificial druids then appear, with their trombones in C major. When the watchmen come again in alarm, and here I mean to introduce a light mysterious tripping chorus, and lastly to conclude with a great sacrificial hymn. Do you not think that this might develop into a new style of cantata? I have an instrumental introduction, as a matter of course, and the effect of the whole is very spirited. I hope it will soon be finished. I have once more begun to compose with fresh vigor, and the Italian symphony makes rapid progress. It will be the most sportive piece I have yet composed, especially the last movement. I have not yet decided on the adagio, and think I shall reserve it for Naples. Fairlein und Frieden is completed, and Wir Globen all will also be ready in a few days. The Scotch symphony alone is not yet quite to my liking. If any brilliant idea occurs to me, I will seize it at once quickly write it down, and finish it at last. Felix. Rome, March 1st, 1831. While I write this date, I shrink from the thought of how time flies. Before this month is at an end, the holy week begins, and when it is over, my stay in Rome will be drawn to a close. I now try to reflect whether I have made the best use of my time, and on every side I perceive a deficiency. If I could only compass one of my two symphonies, I must and will reserve the Italian one till I have seen Naples, which must play a part in it. But the author also seems to elude my grasp. The more I try to seize it, and nearer the end of this delightful Roman period approaches, the more I am perplexed, and the less I do seem to succeed. I feel as if it will be long indeed before I can write again as freely as here, so I am eager to finish what I have to do, but I make no progress. The Valpuris meet alone gets on quickly, and I hope it will soon be accomplished. Besides, I cannot resist everyday sketching, that I may carry away with me reminiscences of my favorite haunts. There is still much that I wish to see, so I perfectly well know that this month will suddenly come to an end, and much remain undone. And indeed it is quite too beautiful here. Rome is considerably changed, and neither so gay or so cheerful as formerly. Almost all my acquaintances are gone, the promenades and streets are deserted, the galleries closed, and it is impossible to gain admittance into them. All news from without almost entirely fails us, for we saw the details about Bologna in the first Alcamino Zitu yesterday. People seldom or never congregate together. In fact, everything has subsided into entire rest, but then the weather is lovely and no one can deprive us of this warm, balmy atmosphere. Those who are most to be pitied in the present state of affairs are the Vernet ladies, who are unpleasantly situated here. The hatred of the entire Roman populace is, strangely enough, directed against the French pensionnaires, believing that their influence alone could easily effect a revolution. Threatening anonymous letters have been sent to Vernet, Indeed, one day he found an armed Transteverine stationed in front of the windows of his studio, 
who, however, took flight when Vernet fetched his gun, and the ladies are now entirely alone and isolated in the villa. Their family are naturally very uneasy. Still, all continues quiet and serene within the city, and I am quite convinced it will remain so. The German painters are really more contemptible than I can tell you. Not only have they cut off their whiskers and mustaches, but their long hair and beards, openly declaring that as soon as all danger is at an end, they will let them grow again. But these tall stalwart fellows go home as soon as it is dark, lock themselves in, and discuss their fears together. They call Horace Vernet a braggart, and yet he is very different from these miserable creatures, whose conduct makes me cordially despise them. Laterly I occasionally visited some of the modern studios. Torres Valden has just finished a statue in clay of Lord Byron. He is seated amidst ancient ruins, his feet resting on the capital of a column, while he is gazing into the distance, evidently about to write something, on the tablet he holds in his hands. He is represented not in Roman costume, but in a simple modern dress, and I think it looks well, and does not destroy the general effect. The statue has the natural air and easy pose so remarkable in all this sculptor's work, and yet the poet looks sufficiently gloomy and delicia, though not remarkable in all this sculptor's work, though not affected. I must some day write you a whole letter about the triumph of Alexander, for never did any piece of sculpture make such an impression on me. I go there every week, and stand gazing at that alone, and enter Babylon along with the conqueror. I lately called on A. He has brought with him some admirable pencil sketches from Naples and Sicily, so I should be glad to take some hints from him, but I fear that he is a considerable exaggerator, and does not sketch faithfully. His landscape of the Colosseum at H.B. is a beautiful romance, for in the original I cannot say that I ever perceived the woods of large cypresses and orange trees, or fountains or thickets in the center, extending to the ruins. Moreover, his mustaches have also disappeared. I have something amusing to tell you in conclusion. I wish, O oh my Fanny, that as a contrast to your Sunday harmony, you had heard the music we perpetrated last Sunday evening. We wished to sing the psalms of Marcello, being Lent, and the best deal in Tante consequently assembled. A papal singer was in the middle, a maestro at the piano, and we sang. When a soprano solo came, all the ladies pressed forward, each insisting on singing it, so it was executed as a tutti. The tenor by my side never alighted on the right note, and rambled about in the most insecure regions. When I chimed in as second tenor, he dropped into my part, and when I tried to assist him, he seemed to think that was my original part, and kept steadily on his own. The papal singer at one instant sang in the soprano falsetto, and presently took the first bass, Soon after, he quacked out the alt, and when all that was no avail, he smiled sorrowfully across at me, and we nodded mysteriously to each other. The maestro, in striving to set us all right, repeatedly lost his own place, being a bar behind or one in advance, and thus we sang with the most complete anarchy, just as we thought fit. Suddenly came a very solemn solo passage for the bass, which all attacked valiantly but at the second bar broke into a chorus of loud laughter, which we unanimously joined, so the affair ended in high good humor. The people who had come as audience talked at the pitch of their voices, and then went out and dispersed. Ayanar came in and listened to our music for a time, then made a horrible grimace and was seen no more. Farewell. Health and happiness attend you all. Felix. End of section 9. Section 10 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. Translated by Grace Wallace. Music provided by Project Gutenberg. March 15th through April 14th, 1831. Rome, March 15th, 1831. The letters of introduction that R sent me have been of no use here. L, likewise, to whom I was presented by Bunsen, has not taken the smallest notice of me, and tries to look the other way when we meet. I rather suspect the man is an aristocrat. Albani admitted me, so I had the honor of conversing for half an hour with the cardinal. After reading the introductory letter, he asked me if I was a pensioner of the King of Hanover. 
No, said I. He supposed that I must have seen St. Peter's? Yes, said I. As I knew Meyerbeer, he assured me that he could not endure his music. It was too scientific for him. Indeed, everything he wrote was so learned and so devoid of melody, that you at once saw that he was a German, and the Germans, mon ami, have not the most remote conception of what melody is. No, said I, in my scores, he continued, all sing. Not only the voices sing, but also the first violin sings, and the second violin also, and the oboe sings, and so it goes on, even to the horns. And last of all, the double bass sings, too. I was naturally desirous, in all humility, to see some of his music. He was modest, however, and would show me nothing. But he said that wishing to make my stay in Rome as agreeable as possible, he hoped I would pay a visit to his villa, and I might take as many of my friends with me as I chose. It was near such and such a place. I thanked him very much, and subsequently boasted considerably of this gracious permission. But presently discovered that this villa is open to the public, and any one can go there who chooses. Since that time I have heard no more of him, and as this and some other instances have inspired me with respect, mingled with aversion, towards the highest Roman circles, I resolved not to deliver the letter to Gabrielli, and was satisfied by having the whole Bonaparte family pointed out to me on the promenade, where I met them daily. I think Mitsigiewicz very tiresome. He possesses that kind of indifference which bores both himself and others, though the ladies persist in designating it melancholy and lassitude. But this makes no better in my eyes. If he looks at St. Peter's, he deplores the times of the hierarchy. If the sky is blue and beautiful, he wishes it were dull and gloomy. If it is gloomy, he is freezing. If he sees the Colosseum, he wishes he had lived at that period. I wonder what sort of figure he would have made in the days of Titus. You inquire about Horace Fernay, and this is, indeed, a pleasant theme. I believe I may say that I have learned something from him, and every one may do the same. He produces with incredible facility and freshness. When a form meets his eye, which touches his feelings, he instantly adopts it, and while others are deliberating whether it can be called beautiful, and praising or censoring, he has long completed his work entirely deranging our aesthetic standard. Though this facility cannot be acquired, still its principle is admirable, and the serenity which springs from it, and the energy it calls forth in working, nothing else can replace. Among the alleys of evergreen trees, where at this season of blossoms the fragrance is so charming, in the midst of the shrubberies and the gardens of the Villa Medici stands a small house, in which as you approach you invariably hear the tumult shouting and wrangling, or a piece executed on a trumpet, or the barking of dogs. This is Vernet's atelier. The most picturesque disorder everywhere prevails. Guns, a hunting horn, a monkey, pallets, a couple of dead hares or rabbits. The walls covered with pictures, finished and unfinished. The investiture, en yard, la tour some horses, a sketch of Judith, the studies for it, the portrait of the Pope, a couple of Moorish heads, bagpipers, Papal soldiers, my unworthy self, Cain and Abel, and last of all, a drawing of the interior of the place itself, all hangs up in his studio. Lately his hands were quite full, owing to the number of portraits bespoken from him, but in the streets he saw one of the Campania peasants, who were armed and mounted by the government, and ride about in Rome. The singular costume caught the artist's eye, and the next day he began a picture representing a similar peasant sitting on his horse in bad weather in the campagna and seizing his gun in order to take aim at someone with it in the distance are visible a small troop of soldiers in the desolate plain the minute details of the weapon where the peasant peeps through the soldier's uniform the wretched horse and its shabby trappings the discomfort prevalent throughout and the italian phlegm in the bearded fellow make a charming little picture and no one can help envying him, who sees the real delight with which his brush traverses the sketched canvas, at one moment putting a little rivulet and a couple of soldiers and a button on the saddle, then lining the soldier's great coat with green. Numbers of people come to look on. During my first sitting, twenty persons, at least, arrived one after another. Countess E. asked him to allow her to be present when he was at work, but when he darted on it as a hungry man does on food, her amazement was great. The whole family are, as I told you, good people, and when old Charles talked about his father, Joseph, 
you must feel respect for them, and I maintain that they are noble. Goodbye, for it is late, and I must send my letter to the post. Felix. Rome, March 29th, 1831. In the midst of the Holy Week. Tomorrow, for the first time, I am to hear the Miserere, and while you last Sunday performed the Passion, the cardinals and all the priesthood here received twisted psalms and olive branches. The Stabat Mater of Palestrina was sung, and there was a grand procession. My work has got on badly during the last few days. Spring is in all her bloom, a genial blue sky without, such as we at most only dream of, and a journey to Naples in every thought, so even a quiet time to write is not to be found. C, who usually a cool fellow, has written me such a glowing letter from Naples. Most prosaic men become poetical when they speak of it. The finest season of the year in Italy is from the 15th of April to the 15th of May. Who can wonder that I find it impossible to return to my misty Scotch mood? I have, therefore, laid aside the Scotch symphony for the present, but I hope to write out the Valpurgis night here. I shall manage to do so if I work hard today and tomorrow, and if we have bad weather, for really a fine day is too great a temptation. As soon as an impediment occurs, I hope to find some resource in the open air, so I go out and think of anything and everything but my composition, and do nothing but lounge about, and when the church bells begin to ring, it is Ave Maria already. All I want now is a short overture. If I can accomplish this, the thing is complete, and I can write it out in a couple of days. Then I have done with music, and leaving all music paper here, I shall go off to Naples, where, please God, I mean to do nothing. Two French friends of mine have tempted me to flaner with them a good deal of late. When they are together, it is either a perpetual tragedy or comedy, as you will. Why? Distorts everything, without a spark of talent, always groping in the dark, but esteeming himself the creator of a new world, writing, moreover, the most frightful things, and yet dreaming and thinking of nothing but Beethoven, Schiller, and Goethe, a victim at the same time to the most boundless vanity, and looking down condescendingly on Mozart and Haydn, so that all his enthusiasm seems to me very doubtful. Z has been toiling for three months at a little rondo on a Portuguese theme. He arranges neatly and brilliantly, and according to rule, and he now intends to set about composing six waltzes, and is in a state of perfect ecstasy. If I will only play him over a number of Vienna waltzes, he has a high esteem for Beethoven, but also for Rossini and for Bellini, and no doubt for Aubert, in short, for everybody. Then my turn comes to be praised, who would only be too glad to murder why, till he chances to eulogize Gluck, when I can quite agree with him. I like, nevertheless, to walk about with these two, for they are the only musicians here, and both very pleasant, amiable persons. All this forms an amusing contrast. You say, dear mother, that Y must have a fixed aim in his art, but this is far from being my opinion. I believe he wishes to be married, and is in fact worse than the other, because he is by far the most affected of the two. I really cannot stand his obtrusive enthusiasm, and the gloomy despondency he assumes before ladies the stereotyped genius in black and white, and if he were not a Frenchman, and it is always pleasant to associate with them, as they have invariably something interesting to say, it would be beyond endurance. I shall probably write you my last letter from Rome, and then you shall hear of me from Naples. It is still quite uncertain whether I go to Sicily or not. I almost think not, as in any event I must have resource to a steamboat, and it is not settled that one is to go. In haste, yours, Felix. Rome, April 4th, 1831. The Holy Week is over, and my passport to Naples prepared. My room begins to look empty, and my winter in Rome is now among my reminiscences of the past. I intend to leave this in a few days, and my next letter, D.V., shall be from Naples. Interesting and amusing as the winter in Rome has been, it has closed with a truly memorable week, for what I have seen and heard far surpassed my expectations, and being the conclusion, I will endeavor in this, my last letter from Rome, to give you a full description of it all. People have often both zealously praised and censored the ceremonies of the Holy Week, and have yet omitted, as is often the case, the chief point, namely its perfection as a complete whole. My father will probably remember the description of Mademoiselle de R, who after all only did what most people do, who write or talk about music and art, when in a hoarse and prosaic voice she attempted at dinner to give us some idea of the fine clear papal choir. Many others have given the mere music, 
and been distasteful because external adjuncts are required to produce the full effect. Those persons may be in the right still so long as these indispensable externals are there, and especially in such entire perfection, so long as it will impress others. And just as I feel convinced that place, time, order, the vast crowd of human beings awaiting in the most profound silence the moment for the music to begin, contribute largely to the effect, so I do contend the idea of deliberately separating what ought in fact to be indivisible, and this for the purpose of exhibiting a certain portion which may thus be depreciated. That man must be despicable indeed, on whom the devotion and reverence of a vast not make a corresponding impression of the devotion and the reverence. Even if they were worshipping the golden calf, let him alone destroy this, who can replace it by something better. Whether one person repeats it from another, whether it comes up to its great reputation, or is merely the effect of the imagination, is quite the same thing. It suffices that we have a perfect totality, which has exercised the most powerful influence for centuries past, and still exercises it, and therefore I reverence it. As I do every species of real perfection, I leave it to the theologians to pronounce on its religious influence, for the various opinions on that point are of no great value. There is more to be considered than mere ceremonies. For me it is sufficient, as I have already said, that in any sphere the object should be fully carried out, so far its ability will permit, with fidelity and conscientiousness, to call forth my respect and sympathy. Thus you must not expect from me a formal critique on the singing, as to whether they intone correctly or incorrectly, in tune or out of tune or whether the compositions are fine. I would rather strive to show you that as a whole the affair cannot fail to make a solemn impression, and that everything contributes to this result. And as last week I enjoyed music, forms, and ceremonies, without severing them, revealing in the perfect whole, so I do not intend to separate them in this letter. The technical part, to which I naturally paid particular attention, I mean to detail more minutely to Zelter. The first ceremony was on Psalm Sunday, when the concourse of people was so great that I could not make my way through the crowd to my usual place on what is called the prelate's bench, but was forced to remain among the guard of honor, where indeed I had a very good view of the solemnities, but could not follow the singing properly, as they pronounced the words very indistinctly, and on that day I had no book. The result was that on this first day, the various antiphons, gospels, and psalms, and the mode of chanting instead of reading, which is employed here in its primitive form, made the most confused and singular impression on me. I had no clear conception what role they followed with regard to the various cadences. I took considerable pains, gradually, to discover their method, and succeeded so well that at the end of the holy week I could have sung with them. I thus also escaped the extreme weariness so universally complained of during the endless psalms before the miserere, for I quickly detected any variety in the monotony, and when perfectly assured of any particular cadence, I instantly wrote it down. So I made out by degrees, which indeed I deserved, the melodies of eight psalms. I also noted down the antiphons, etc., and was thus incessantly occupied and interested. The first Sunday, however, as I already told you, I could not make it all out satisfactorily. I only knew that the choir sang Hosanna in excelsis and intoned various hymns, while twisted palms were offered to the Pope, which he distributed among the cardinals. These palms were long branches decorated with buttons, crosses, and crowns, all entirely made of dried palm leaves, which makes them look a lot like gold. The cardinals, who are seated in the chapel in the form of a quadrangle, with the abati at their feet, now advance in each turn to receive their palms, with which they return to their places. Then come the bishops, monks, abate, and all the other orders of the priesthood, the papal singers, knights, and others, who receive olive branches entwined with palm leaves. This makes a long procession, during which the choir continues to sing unremittingly. The abate hold the long palms of their cardinals like the lances of sentinels, slanting them on the ground before them, and at this moment there is a brilliance of color in the chapel that I have never seen at any ceremony. There were the cardinals in their gold-embroidered robes and red caps, and the violet abate in front of them, with golden palms in their hands, and further in advance, the gaudy servants of the Pope, 
the Greek priests, the patriarchs in the most gorgeous attire, the Capuchins with long white beards, and all the other religious orders, then again the Swiss, in their popinjay uniforms, all carrying green olive branches, while well, singing is going on the whole time, though certainly it is scarcely possible to distinguish what is being sung, yet the mere sound is sufficient to delight the ear. The Pope's throne is then carried in, on which he is elevated in all processions, and where I saw Pius the Seventh enthroned on the day of my arrival, vide the Heliodronus of Raphael, where he is portrayed. The cardinals, two and two, with their palms, had the procession, and the folding doors of the chapel being thrown open, it slowly defiles through them. The singing, which has hitherto incessantly prevailed, like an element, becomes fainter and fainter, for the singers also walk in the procession, and at length are only indistinctly heard, the sound dying away in the distance. Then a choir in the chapel bursts forth with a query, to which the distant one breathes a faint response, and so it goes on for a time, till the procession again draws near, and the choirs reunite. Let them sing how or what they please, this cannot fail to produce a fine effect, and though it is quite true that nothing can be more monotonous and even devoid of form than the hymns O Unisono, being without any proper connection, and sung fortissimo throughout, still I appeal to the impression that as a whole it must make on every one. After the procession returns, the gospel is chanted in the most singular tone, and is succeeded by the mass. I must not omit here to make mention of my favorite moment, I mean the credo. The priest takes his place for the first time in the center, before the altar, and after a short pause, intones in his hoarse old voice the credo of Sebastian Bach. When he has finished, the priests stand up, the cardinals leave their seats, and advance into the middle of the chapel, where they form a circle, all repeating the continuation in loud voice patrum omnipotentem, etc. The choir then chimes in, singing the same words, when I for the first time heard my well-known music transcribed. And all the grave monks round me began to recite in loud, eager tones. I felt quite excited, for this is a moment I still like best of all. After the ceremony, Santini made me a present of his olive branch, which I carried in my hand the whole day when I was walking about, for the weather was beautiful. The stabat mater, which succeeds the credo, made much less effect. They sang it incorrectly and out of tune, and likewise curtailed it considerably. The Sing Academy executes it infinitely better. There is nothing on Monday or Tuesday, but on Wednesday, at half-past four, the nocturnes begin. The psalms are sung in alternate verses by two choirs, though invariably by one class of voices, basses or tenors. For an hour and a half, therefore, nothing but the most monotonous music is heard. The psalms are only once interrupted by the lamentations, and this is the first moment when, after a long time, a complete chord is given. This chord is softenedly intoned, and the whole piece is sung pianissimo, while the psalms are shouted out as much as possible and always upon one note, and the words uttered with the utmost rapidity, a cadence occurring at the end of each verse, which defines the different characteristic of the various melodies. It is not, therefore, surprising that the mere sound in G major of the first lamentation should produce so touching an effect. Once more, the single tone recommences. A wax light is extinguished at the end of each psalm, so that in the course of an hour and a half, the fifteen lights round the altar are all out. Six large-sized candles still burn in the vestibule. The whole strength of the choir, with alti and soprani, etc., into un fortissimo in unisono, a new melody, the Canticum Zacare, in D minor, singing it slowly and solemnly in the deepening gloom. The last remaining lights are then extinguished. The Pope leaves his throne and falls on his knees before the altar, while all around do the same, repeating a paternoster sub silentio. That is, a pause ensues, during which you know that each Catholic present says the Lord's Prayer, and immediately afterwards, Miseria begins pianissimo thus. Music transcribed. To me, this is the most sublime moment of the whole. 
You can easily picture to yourself what follows, but not this commencement. The continuation, which is the Mesohia of Algeria, is a simple sequence of chords, grounded either on tradition or what appears to me much more probable, merely embellishments introduced by some clever maestro for the fine voices at his disposal, and especially for the very high sopranos. These embellimenti always recur on the same chord, and as they are cleverly constructed and beautifully adapted for the voice, it is invariably pleasing to hear them repeated. I cannot discover anything unearthly or mysterious in the music. Indeed, I am perfectly contented that its beauty should be earthly and comprehensible. I refer you, dearest Fanny, to my letter to Zelter. On the first day, they sang Bayini's Miseria. On Thursday, at nine o'clock in the morning, the solemnities recommenced and lasted till one o'clock. There was high mass and afterwards a procession. The Pope conferred his benediction from the Logia of the Quirinal and washed the feet of the thirteen priests, who were supposed to represent the pilgrims, and were seated in a row, wearing white gowns and white caps, and who afterwards dined. The crowd of English ladies was extraordinary, and the whole affair repugnant to my feelings. The psalms began again in the afternoon, and lasted on this occasion to half-past seven. Some portions of the Miseria were taken from Baini, but the greater were part of Allegri's. It was almost dark in the chapel when the Miseria commenced. I clambered up a tall ladder standing there by chance, and so I had the whole chapel crowded with people, and the kneeling pope with his cardinals, and the music beneath me. It had a splendid effect. On Friday forenoon, the chapel was stripped of every decoration, and the pope and cardinals in mourning. The history of the Passion, according to St. John, the music by Vittoria was sung, then the Improperia of Palestrina, during which the Pope and all the others, taking off their shoes, advanced to the cross and adore it. In the evening, Baini's Miseria was given, which they sang infinitely the best. Early on Saturday, in the baptistry of the Lateran, heathens, Jews, and Mohammedans were baptized, all represented by a little child, who screeched the whole time, and subsequently some young priests received consecration for the first time. On Sunday, the Pope himself performed high mass in the Quirinal, and subsequently pronounced his benediction on the people, and then all was over. It was now Saturday, the ninth of April, and tomorrow at an early hour I get into a carriage and set off for Naples, where a new style of beauty awaits me. You will perceive by the end of this letter that I write in haste, this is my last day, and a great deal yet to be done. I do not, therefore, finish my letter to Zelter, but will send it from Naples. I wish my description to be correct, and my approaching journey distracts my attention sadly. Thus I am off to Naples. The weather is clearing up, and the sun shining, which it has not done for some days past. My passport is prepared, the carriage ordered, and I am looking forward to the months of spring. Adieu, Felix. End of section 10《セクション11 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland by Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi, translated by Grace Wallace, April 13th through April 27th, 1831. Naples, April 13th, 1831. Dear Rebecca. This must stand in lieu of a birthday letter. May it wear a holiday aspect for you. It arrives late in the day, but with equally sincere good wishes. Your birthday itself I passed in a singular but delightful manner, though I could not write, having neither pens nor ink. In fact, I was in the very middle of the Pontini marshes. May the ensuing year bring you every happiness, and may we meet somewhere. If you were thinking of me on that day, our thoughts must have either met on the Brenner or Isenbrook, for I was constantly thinking of you. Even without looking at the date of this letter, you will at once perceive by its tone that I am in Naples. I have not yet been able to compass one serious quiet reflection. There is everywhere such jovial life here, inviting you to do nothing, and to think of nothing. And even the example of so many thousand people has an irresistible influence. I do not indeed intend that this should continue, but I see plainly that it must go on for the first few days. I stand for hours on my balcony, gazing at the Vesuvius in the bay, but I must now endeavor to resume my old description style. 
or my materials will accumulate so much that I shall become confused, and I fear you may not be able to follow me properly. So much that is novel crowds on me, that a journal would be requisite to detail to you my life and my state of excitement. So I begin by acknowledging that I deeply regretted leaving Rome. My life there was so quiet, and yet so full of interest, having made many kind and friendly acquaintances, with whom I had become so domesticated, that the last days of my stay, with all their discomforts and perpetual running about, seemed doubly odious. The last evening I went to Vernet's to thank him for my portrait, which is now finished, and to take leave of him. We had some music, talked politics, and played chess, and then I went down to the Monte Piccio to my own house, packed up my things, and the next morning drove off with my traveling companions. As I gazed out of the cabriolet at the scenery, I could dream to my heart's desire. When we arrived at our night quarters, we all went out walking. The two days glided past more like a pleasure excursion than a journey. The road from Rome to Naples is indeed the most luxuriant that I know, and the whole mode of traveling most agreeable. You fly through the plain. For a very slight gratuity, the postilions gallop their horses like mad, which is very advisable in the marshes. If you wish to contemplate the scenery, you have only to abstain from offering any gratuity, and you are soon driven slowly enough. The road from Albano, by Ariccia and Gensano, as far as Velici, runs between hills and is shaded by trees of every kind, uphill and downhill, through avenues of elms, past monasteries and shrines. On one side is the Campania, with its heather and its bright hues. Beyond comes the sea, glittering charmingly in the sunshine, and above the clearest sky, for since Sunday morning the weather has been glorious. Well, we drove into Velitri, our night quarters, where a great church festival was going on, and some women with primitive faces were pacing the alleys in groups, and men were standing together, wrapped in cloaks, in the street. The church was decorated with garlands of green leaves, and as we drove past it we heard the sounds of a double bass and some violins. Fireworks were prepared in the square, the sun went down clear and serene, and the Potini marshes, with their thousand colors, and the rocks rearing their heads one by one against the horizon, indicated the course we were to pursue on the following day. After supper, I resolved to go out for a short time, and discovered a kind of illumination. The streets were swarming with people, and when I at last came to the spot where the church stood, I saw, on turning the corner, the whole street had burning torches on each side, and in the middle, the people were walking up and down, crowding together, and pleased to see each other so distinctly at night. I cannot tell you what a pretty sight it was. The concourse was greatest before the church. I pressed forward into it along with the rest. The little building was filled with people kneeling, adorning the host, which was exposed. No one spoke a word, nor was there any music. This stillness, the lighted church, and the many kneeling women with white handkerchiefs on their heads, and white gowns, had a striking effect. When I left the church, a shrewd, handsome Italian boy explained the whole festival, assuring me that it would have been far finer had it not been for the recent disturbances, for they had been the cause of depriving the people of the horse races, and barrels of pitch, etc. And on this account, it was unlucky that the Austrians had not come sooner. The following morning, at six o'clock, we pursued our way through the Pontini marshes. It is a species of Bergstrasse. You drive through a straight avenue of trees along a plain. On one side of the avenue is a continued chain of hills, on the other the marshes. They are, however, covered with the innumerable flowers, which smell very sweet, but in the long run this becomes very stupefying, and I distinctly felt the oppression of the atmosphere, in spite of the fine weather. A canal runs along beside the chaussée, constructed by the orders of Pius VI, to form a conduit for the marshes, where we saw a number of buffaloes wallowing, their heads emerging out of the water, and apparently enjoying themselves. The straight level road had a singular appearance. You see the chain of hills at the end of the avenue when you come to the first station, and again at the second and third. The only difference being that as you advance so many miles nearer, the hills loom gradually larger. Terracina, which is situated exactly at the end of this avenue, is invisible till you come quite close to it. On making a sudden turn to the left, round the corner of a rock, the whole expanse of the sea lies before you. Citron gardens and palms, and a variety of plants of southern growth, clothe the declivity in front of the town. The towers appearing above the thickets, 
and the harbor projecting into the sea. To me, the finest object in the nature is, and always will be, the ocean. I love it almost more than the sky. Nothing in Naples made a more enchanting impression on my mind than the sea, and I always feel happy when I see before me the spacious surface of waters. The south, properly speaking, begins at Terracina. This is another land, and every plant and every bush reminds you of it. Above all, the two mighty ridges of hills delighted me, between which the road runs. They were totally devoid of bushes or trees, but clothed entirely with masses of golden wallflowers, so that they had a bright yellow hue, and the fragrance was almost too strong. There is a great want of grass and large trees. The old robber's nests of fondi, and each tree looked very piratical and gloomy. The houses are built against the walls of the rocks, and there are likewise some large towers of the date of the Middle Ages. Many sentinels and posts were stationed on the tops of the hills, but we made our journey without any adventure. We remained all night in the Moldigaita. There we saw the renowned balcony whence you look over orange and citron groves to the blue sea, and with the Vesuvius and the islands in the far distance. This was on the 11th of April. As I have been celebrating your birthday all day long in my own thoughts, I could not in the evening resist informing my companions that it was your birthday. So your health was drunk again and again. An old Englishman, who was of the party, wished me a happy return to my sister. I emptied the glass to your health and thought of you. Remain unchanged till we meet again. With such thoughts in my head, I went in the evening to the citron garden, close to the seashore, and listened to the waves rolling in from afar and breaking on the shore, and sometimes gently rippling and splashing. It was indeed a heavenly night. Among a thousand other thoughts, Ropaisa's poem recurred to my memory, which it is almost impossible to set to music. For which reason, I suppose, Fanny has composed a charming melody on it. But I do not jest when I say that I sang the song over repeatedly to myself, for I was standing on the very spot he describes. The sea had subsided, and was now calm, and at rest, this was the first song. The second followed the next day, for the sea was like a meadow, or pure ether as you gazed at it, and pretty women nodded their heads, and so did olives and cypresses, but they were all equally brown, so I remained in a poetic mood. What is it that shines through the leaves and glitters like gold, only cartridges and sabres? For the king had been reviewing some troops in Santa Agata, and the soldiers defiled on both sides of the path. Who had the more merit in my eyes, because they resembled the Prussians, and for a long time past I have seen only papal soldiers. Some carried dark lanterns on their muskets, as they had been marching all night. The whole effect was bold and gay, and now we came to a short rocky pass, from which you descend into the valley of the Campania, the most enchanting spot I have ever seen. It is like a boundless garden, covered entirely with plants and vegetation as far as the eye can reach. On one side are the blue outlines of the sea, on the other an undulating ridge of hills above which snowy peaks project, and at a great distance Vesuvius and the islands, bathed in blue vapors, start up on the level surface. Large avenues of trees intersect the vast space, and a verdant growth forces its way from under every stone. Everywhere you see grotesque alloes and cactuses, and the fragrance and vegetation are quite unparalleled. The pleasure we enjoy in England, through men, we here enjoy through nature, and there is no corner there, however small, of which someone has not taken possession in order to cultivate and adorn it. So here there is no spot which nature has not appropriated, bringing forth on its flowers and herbs, and all that is beautiful. The Campania Valley is fruitfulness itself, the whole of the vast immeasurable surface, bounded in the far distance, by blue hills and a blue sea, nothing but green meets the eye. At last you come to Capua. I cannot blame Hannibal for remaining too long there. From Capua to Naples, the road runs uninterruptedly between trees, with hanging vines, till at the end of the avenue, Vesuvius and the sea, with Capri, and a mass of houses, lie before you. I am living here in St. Lucia as if in heaven. For in the first place, I see before me the Vesuvius, and the hills as far as Castellamare, and in the bay. And in the second place, I am living up three stories high, and fortunately, that traitor Vesuvius does not smoke at all, and looks precisely like any other fine mountain. 
But at night, the people float in lighted boats on the bay to catch swordfish. This has a pretty enough effect. Farewell, Felix. Naples, April 10th, 1831. We are so accustomed to find that everything turns out quite differently from what we expected and calculated, that you will feel no surprise when instead of a letter like a journal, you receive a very short one, merely saying that I am quite well and little else. As for the scenery, I cannot describe it, and if you have no conception of what it really is, after all that has been said and written on the subject, there is little chance of my enlightening you, for what makes it so indescribably beautiful is precisely that it is not of a nature to admit of description. Any other detail I could send you would be about my life here, but it is so simple that a few words suffice to depict it. I do not wish to make any acquaintances, for I am resolved not to remain here longer than a few weeks. I intend to make various excursions to see the country, and all I desire here is to become thoroughly intimate with nature. So I go to bed at nine o'clock and rise at five, to refresh myself by gazing from the balcony at the Vesuvius, the sea, and the coast of Sorrento, in the bright morning light, I have also taken very long, solitary rambles, discovering beautiful views for myself, and I have infinite satisfaction in finding what I have considered the loveliest spot of all is almost entirely unknown to the Neapolitans. During these excursions, I sought out some house on a height, to which I scrambled up, or merely followed any path I fancied, allowing myself to be surprised by night and moonshine and making acquaintance with the vine dressers in order to learn my way back arriving at last at home about nine o'clock very tired through the villa reale the view from this villa of the sea and the enchanting capri by moonlight is truly charming so is the almost overpowering fragrance of the acacias in full bloom and the fruit trees scattered all over with rose-colored blossoms looking like trees with pink foliage all this is quite indescribable. As I live chiefly with and in nature, I can write less than usual. Perhaps we may talk it over when we meet, and the sketches in our sitting room at home will furnish materials and reminiscences for conversation. One thing I must not, however, admit, dear Fanny, which is that I quite approve of your taste when you recall what you told me years ago, that your favorite spot was the island of Nisida. Perhaps you may have forgotten this, but I have not. It looks as if it were made expressly for pleasure grounds. On emerging from the thicket at Birkunola, Nisida has quite a startling effect. Rising out of the sea, so near, so large, and so green, while the other islands, Ruchida, Iskida, and Capri, stand afar off and indistinct in their blue tints. After the murder of Caesar, Brutus took refuge in this island, and Cicero visited him there. The sea lay between them, and the rocks, covered with vegetation, bent over the sea, just as they do now. These are the antiques that interest me, and are infinitely more suggestive than crumbling mason work. There is a degree of innate superstition and dishonesty among the people here that is totally inconceivable, and this has often even marred my pleasure in nature. For the Swiss, of whom my father complained so much, are positively guileless, primitive beings, Compared with the Neapolitans, my landlord invariably gives me too little change for piastra, and when I tell him of it, he coolly fetches the remainder. The only acquaintances I intend to make here are musical ones, that I may leave nothing incomplete. For instance, Fordar, who does not sing in public, Donizetti, Gotia, etc. I now conclude by a few words to you, dear father. You write to me that you disapprove of my going to Sicily. I have consequently given up this plan, though I cannot deny that I do so with great reluctance, for it was really more than a mere whim on my part. There is no danger to be apprehended, and, as if on purpose to vex me, a steamer leaves the city on the 4th of May, which is to make the entire tour. A good many Germans, and probably the ministers here, are to take advantage of it. I should have liked to see a mountain vomiting forth flames, as Vesuvius has been hitherto so unkind as not even to smoke. Your instructions, however, have till now so entirely conceded with my own inclinations that I cannot allow the first opportunity I have of showing my obedience to your wishes, even when opposed to my own, to pass without complying with them. So I have effaced Sicily from my travelling route. Perhaps we may meet sooner in consequence of this. And now farewell. 
for I'm going to walk to the Capio de Monte. Felix. Naples, April 27th, 1831. It is now nearly a fortnight since I have heard from you. I do earnestly hope that nothing unpleasant has occurred, and every day I expect the post will bring me tidings of you all. My letters from Naples are of little value, for I am too deeply absorbed here to be easily to extricate myself, and to write descriptive letters. Besides, when we had bad weather lately, I took advantage of it to resume my labors, and zealously applied myself to my Valpurgis night, which daily increases in interest for me. So I employ every spare moment in completing it. I hope to finish it in a few days, and I think it will turn out well. If I continue in my present mood, I shall finish my Italian symphony, also in Italy, in which case I shall have a famous store to bring home with me the fruits of this winter. Moreover, every day I have something new to see. I generally make my excursions with the Shadows. Yesterday we went to Pompeii. It looks as if it had been burnt down, or like a recently deserted city. As both of these always seemed to me deeply affecting, the impression made on me was the most melancholy that I have yet experienced in Italy. It is as if the inhabitants had just gone out, and yet almost every object tells of another religion and another life. In short, of seventeen hundred years ago, and the French and the English ladies scramble about as gaily as possible, and sketch it all. It is the old tragedy of the past and the present, a problem I never can solve. Lively Naples is indeed a pleasant contrast, but it is painful to see the crowd of wretched beggars who waylay you in every street and path, swarming round the carriage the instant it stops. The old white-haired men particularly distress me, and such a mass of misery exceeds all belief. If you are walking on the seashore and gazing at the islands, and then chance to look around at the land, you find yourself at the center of a group of cripples, who make a trade of their infirmities, or you discover, which lately happened to me, that you are surrounded by thirty or forty children, all whining out their favorite phrase, Moyo di fame, and rattling their jaws to show that they had nothing to eat. All this forms a most repulsive contrast, and yet to me it is still more repugnant that you must entirely renounce the great pleasure of seeing happy faces, for even when you have given the richest gratuities to guards, waiters, or workpeople, in short, to whom you will, the invariable rejoinder is niente di più, in which case you may have be very sure that you have given too much. If it is the proper sum, they give it back with the greatest apparent indignation, and then return and beg to have it again. There are trifles, certainly, but they show the lamentable condition of the people. I have even gone so far as to feel provoked with the perpetual smiling aspect of nature, when in the most retired spots troops of beggars everywhere assailed me, some even persisting in following me a long way. It is only when I am quietly seated in my own room, gazing down on the bay and on the Vesuvius, that being totally alone with them I feel really cheerful and happy. Today we are to ascend the hill to visit the Calamdoli Monastery, and tomorrow, if the weather permits, we proceed to Protida and Ischida. I go this evening to Madame Fodor's with Donizetti, Benedict, etc. She is very kind and amiable towards me, and her singing has given me great pleasure, for she has wonderful facility and executes her fioritori with so much taste that it is easy to see how many things Sontag acquired from her, especially the mezzovace, which Fodor, whose voice is no longer full and fresh, most prudently and judiciously introduces into many passages. As she is not singing at the theatre, I am most fortunate in having made her acquaintance personally. The theatre is now closed for some weeks because the blood of St. Januarius is shortly to liquefy. What I heard at the opera previously did not repay the trouble of going. The orchestra, like that in Rome, is worse than in any part of Germany, and not even one tolerable female singer. The tamburini alone, with his vigorous bass voice, imparted some life to the whole. Those who wish to hear Italian operas must nowadays go to Paris or London. Heaven grant that this may not eventually be the case with German music, too. I must, however, return to my witches, so you must forgive my not writing any more today. This whole letter seems to hover in uncertainty, or rather I do so in my Valpris night, whether I am to introduce the big drums or not. Zinken Glaben und Wilds Klapperstücke seem to force me to the big drum, but moderation dissuades me. 
I certainly am the only person who ever composed for a scene on the broken without employing a piccolo flute, but I cannot help regretting the big drum, and before I can receive Fanny's advice, the Vapri's night will be finished and packed up. I shall then set off again on my travels, and heaven knows what I may have in my head by that time. I feel convinced that Fanny would say yes. Still, I feel very doubtful, and at all events a vast noise is indispensable. Oh, Rebecca, can you not procure the words of some songs and send them to me? I feel quite in the humor for them, and you must require something new to sing. If you can furnish me with some pretty verses, old or new, gay or grave, I will compose something in a style to suit your voice. I am at your service for any compact of this kind. Pray do send me wherewithal to work at during my journey in the inns. Now farewell to you all. May you be as happy as I ever wished you to be, and think of me. Felix. End of section 11. Section 12 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. Translated by Grace Wallace. May 17th through May 28th, 1831. Naples, May 17th, 1831. On Saturday, the 14th of May, at 2 o'clock, I told my driver to turn the carriage. We were opposite the temple of Cheris at Pestum, the most southern point of my journey. The carriage consequently turned towards the north, and from that moment, as I journey onwards, I am every hour drawing nearer to you. It is about a year now since I traveled with my father to Daiso in Leipzig. The time, in fact, exactly corresponds, for it was about the half year. I have made good use of the past year. I have acquired considerable experience and many new impressions. Both in Rome and here I have been very busy, but no change has occurred in my outward circumstances. Until the beginning of the new year, in fact so long as I am in Italy, it will probably be the same. This period has not, however, been less valuable to me than some when outwardly, and in the opinion of others, I have appeared to make greater progress, for there must always be a close connection between the two. If I have gathered experience, it cannot fail to influence me outwardly, and I shall allow no opportunity to escape to show that it has done so. Possibly some such may occur before the end of my journey, so I may for the present continue to enjoy nature and the blue sky during the months that still remain for me in Italy. Without thinking of anything else, for there alone lies true art, now in Italy, there, and in her monuments, and there it will ever remain, and there we shall ever find it, for our instruction and delight, so long as Vesuvius stands, and so long as the balmy air and the sea and the trees do not pass away. In spite of all this, I am enough of a musician to own that I do heartily long once more to hear an orchestra, or a full chorus, where there is at least some sound, for here there is nothing of the sort. This is our peculiar province, and to be so long deprived of such an element leaves a sad void. The orchestra and chorus here are like those in our second-rate provincial towns, only more harsh and incorrect. The first violinist, all through the opera, beats the four quarters of each bar on a tin candlestick, which is often more distinctly heard than the voices. It sounds somewhat like obligati cassinets, only louder. And yet in spite of this, the voices are never together. Every little instrumental solo is adorned with the old-fashioned flourishes, and a bad tone pervades the whole performance, which is totally devoid of genius, fire, or spirit. The singers are the worst Italian ones I have ever heard anywhere, except, indeed, in Italy, and those who wish to have a true idea of Italian singing must go to Paris or to London. Even the Dresden Company, whom I heard last year in Leipzig, are superior to any here. This is but natural, for in the boundless misery that prevails in Naples, where can the bases of a theatre be found, which, of course, requires considerable capital? The days when every Italian was born musician, if indeed they ever existed, are long gone by. They treat music like any other fashionable article, with total indifference. In fact, 
they scarcely pay it the homage of outward respect so it is not to be wondered at that every single person of talent should and regularly as they appear transfer themselves to foreign countries where they are better appreciated their position better defined and where they find opportunities of hearing and learning something profitable and inspiring the only really good singer here is tamburini he has however long since been heard in vienna and paris and i believe in london also so now when he begins to discover that his voice is on the decline he comes back to italy i cannot admit either that the italians alone understand the art of singing for there is no music however florid i have ever heard executed by italians that sontag cannot accomplish and in even greater perfection she certainly as she acknowledges learned much from fordor but why should not another german in turn learn the same from sontag and malibran is a spaniard italy can no longer claim the glorious appellation of the land of music in truth she has already lost it and possibly she may yet do so even in the opinion of the world though this is problematical i was lately in company with some professional musicians who were speaking of a new opera by a neapolitan chioccia and one of them asked if it was clever probably it is said another for chioccia was long in england where he studied and some of his compositions are much liked there this struck me as remarkable for in england they would have spoken exactly in the same way of italy but quo mi repis i say nothing to you dear sisters in this letter but in the course of a few days i mean to send you a little pamphlet dedicated to you do not be alarmed it is not poetry the thing is simply entitled journey of an excursion to the islands in may felix naples may twenty eighth eighteen thirty one my dear sisters as my journal is become too stupid and uninteresting to send you i must at least supply you with an abrege of my history you must know then that on friday the twentieth of may we breakfasted in corpore at naples on fruit etc this incorpore included the travelling party to ischia consisting of ed benderman t hildebrand carl son and felix mendelssohn bartoldi my knapsack is not very heavy for it contained scarcely anything but goethe's poems and three shirts so we packed ourselves into a hired carriage and drove through the grotto of posilipo to pozzioli the road runs along the sea and nothing can be more lovely so it is all the more painful to witness the horrible collection of cripples blind men beggars and gallery slaves in short the poor wretches of every description who there await you amid the holiday aspect of nature i seated myself quietly on the mole and sketched while the others plodded and toiled through the temple of serapis the theatres the hot springs and extinct volcanoes which i had already seen to the satiety of three different occasions then like youthful patriarchs or nomads we collected all our goods in chattels cloaks knapsacks books and portfolios on donkeys and placing ourselves also on them we made the tour of the bay of baie as far as the lake of avernus where you are obliged to buy fish for dinner we crossed the hill to cume vida Goethe's wanderer and descended on baie where we ate and rested we then looked at more ruined temples ancient baths and other things of the kind and thus evening had arrived before we crossed the bay at half past nine we arrived at the little town of ischia where we found every corner of the only inn fully occupied so we resolved to go on to don tomaso's a journey of two hours nominally but which we performed in an hour and a quarter the evening was deliciously cool and innumerable glow-worms who allowed us to catch them were scattered on the vine branches and fig trees and shrubs when we at last arrived somewhat fatigued at don tomaso's house about eleven o'clock we found all the people still up clean rooms fresh fruits and a friendly deacon waited on us so we remained comfortably seated opposite a heap of cherries till midnight the next morning the weather was bad and the rain incessant so we could not ascend the epimeo and as we seemed little disposed to converse we did not get on in this respect heaven knows why the affair would have become rather a bore if don tomaso had not possessed the prettiest poultry-yard and farm in europe 
Right in front of the door stands a large leafy orange tree, covered with ripe fruit, and from under its branches a stair leads to the dwelling. Each of the white stone steps is decorated with a large vase of flowers, these steps leading to a spacious open hall, whence through an archway you look down on the whole farmyard, with its orange trees, stairs, thatched roofs, wine casks and pitchers, donkeys and peacocks. That a foreground may not be wanting, an Indian fig tree stands under the walled arch, so luxuriant that it is fastened to the wall with ropes. The background is formed by vineyards with summer houses, and the adjacent heights of the Monte Epimeo being protected from the rain by the archway. The party seated themselves under shelter and sketched the various objects in the farm the best way they could the whole of long day. I was on no ceremony and sketched along with them, and I think in some degree profited by so doing. At night we had a terrific storm, and as I was lying in bed, I remarked that the thunder growled tremendously on the Monte Appeal, and the echoes continued to vibrate like those on the lake of Luciane, but even for a greater length of time. Next morning, Sunday, the weather was again fine. We went to Foria and saw the people going to the cathedral in their holiday costumes. The women wore their well-known headdress of folds of white muslin, placed flat on their head. The men were standing in the square before the church, in their bright red caps, gossiping about politics, and we gradually wound our way through these festal villages up the hill. It is a huge rugged volcano, full of fissures, ravines, cavities, and steep precipices. The cavities being used for wine cellars, they are filled with large casks, Every declivity is clothed with vines and fig trees, or mulberry trees. Corn grows on the sides of the steep rocks, and yields more than one crop every year. The ravines are covered with ivy, and innumerable bright-colored flowers and herbs, and wherever there is a vacant space, young chestnut trees shoot up, furnishing the most delightful shade. The last village, Fontana, lies in the midst of a vendure and vegetation. As we climbed higher, the sky became overcast and gloomy, and by the time we reached the most elevated peaks of the rocks, a thick fog had come in. The vapors flitted about, and although the rugged outlines of the rocks, and the telegraph, and the cross, stood forth strangely in the clouds, we still could not see even the smallest portion of the view. Soon afterwards, rain commenced, and as it was impossible to remain, and wait as you do on the Rigi, we were obliged to take leave of the Epimeo without having made his acquaintance. We ran down in the rain, one rushing after the other, and I do believe that we were scarcely an hour in returning. Next day we went to the Capri. This place has something eastern in its aspect, with the glowing heat reflected from its rocky white walls, its palm trees, and the rounded domes of the churches that look like mosques. The Shiroko was burning and rendered me quite unfit to enjoy anything, for really climbing up five hundred and thirty-seven steps the Anacapri in this frightful heat, and then coming down again, is toil only fit for a horse. True, the sea is wondrously lovely, looking down on it from the summit of the bleak rock, and through the singular fissures of the jagged peaks so strangely formed. But above all, I must tell you of the Blue Grotto, for it is not known to every one and you can only enter it either in very calm weather or by swimming. The rocks there project precipitously into the sea, and are probably as deep under the water as above it. A huge cavity has been hollowed out by nature, but in such a manner that round the whole circumference of the grotto the rocks rest on the sea in all their breadth, or rather are sunk precipitously into it, and ascend thence to the vault of the cavern. The sea fills the whole space of the grotto, the entrance to which lies under the water, only a very small portion of the opening projecting above the water, and through this narrow space you can only pass in a small boat, in which you must lie flat. When you are at once in, the whole extent of the huge cave and its vault is revealed, and you can row about in it with perfect ease, as if under a dome. The light of the sun also pierces through the opening into the grotto underneath the sea, but broken and dimmed by the green sea water, and thence it is that such magical visions arise. The whole of the rocks are sky blue and green in the twilight, resembling the hue of moonshine, yet every nook and every depth is distinctly visible, 
The water is thoroughly lighted up and brilliantly illuminated by the light of the sun, so that the dark skiff glides over a bright shining surface. The color is the most dazzling blue I ever saw, without shadow or cloud, like the pane of opal glass. And as the sun shines down, you can plainly discern all that is going on under the water, while the whole depths of the sea, with its living creatures, are disclosed. You can see the coral insects and polypuses clinging to the rocks, and far below, fishes of different species meeting and swimming past each other. The rocks become deeper in color as they go lower into the water and are quite black at the end of the grotto, where they are closely crowded together. And still further under them, you can see crabs, fishes, and reptiles in the clear waters. Every stroke, too, of the oars echoes strangely under the vault, and as you row round the wall, new objects come to light. I do wish you could see it, for the effect is singularly magical. On turning towards the opening by which you entered, the daylight seen through it seems bright orange, and by moving even a few paces, you are entirely isolated under the rock in the sea, with its own peculiar sunlight, as if you were actually living under the water for a time. We then proceeded to Prachida, where the women adopt the Greek dress, but do not look at all prettier from doing so. Curious faces were peeping from every window, a couple of Jesuits, in black gowns with gloomy countenances, were seated in a gay arbor of vines, evidently enjoying themselves, and made a good picture. Then we crossed the sea to Puzzoli, and through the grotto of Posilipo, again home. I cannot write to Paul about his change of residence and his entrance into the great, wide world of London, because he mentions casually that he will probably leave for London in the course of three weeks, so my letter could not possibly reach him in Berlin. A week hence I shall take my chance and address to my brother in London. The smoky place is fated to be now and ever my favorite residence. My heart glows when I even think of it, and I paint to myself my return there, passing through Paris and finding Paul independent, alone, and another man, in the dear old haunts, when he will present me to his new friends, and I will present him to my old ones, and we shall live and dwell together. So even at this moment, I am all impatient soon to go there. I see by some newspapers my friends have sent me that my name is not forgotten, and so I hope when I return to London to be able to work steadily, which I was previously unable to do, being forced to go to Italy. If they make any difficulty in Munich about my opera, or if I cannot get a libretto that I like, I intend in that case to compose an opera for London. I know that I could receive a commission to do so, as soon as I choose. I am also bringing some new pieces with me for the Philharmonic, and so I shall have made good use of my time. As my evenings here are at my own disposal, I read a little French and English. The barricades and les états de Blois particularly interest me. As while I read them, I realize with horror a period which we have often heard extolled too soon passed away. Though these books seem to me to have many faults, Yet the delineation of the two opposite leaders is but too correct. Both were weak, irresolute, miserable hypocrites. And I thank God that the so highly prized Middle Ages are gone never to return. Say nothing to this to any disciple of Hegel's, but it is so nevertheless. And the more I read and think on the subject, the more I feel this to be true. Stern has become a great favorite of mine. I remember that Goethe once spoke to me of the sentimental journey and said that it was impossible for any one better to paint what a forward and perverse thing in the human heart. I chanced to meet with the book, and thought I should like to read it. It pleases me very much. I think it very subtle, and beautifully conceived and expressed. There are very few German books to be had here. I am therefore restricted to Goethe's poems, and assuredly these are suggestive enough, and always new. I feel a special interest in those poems which he evidently composed in or near Naples such as Alexis and Dora, for I daily see from my window how this wonderful work was created. Indeed, which is often the case with masterpieces, I often suddenly and involuntarily think that the very same ideas might have occurred to myself on a similar occasion, and as if Goethe had only by some chance been the first to express them. With regard to the poem Gottsinger den Gorschau, I maintain that I have discovered its locality and dined with the woman herself, but of course she is now grown old, and the boy she was then nursing is become a stalwart vine-dresser. Her house lies between the Bozzolio and Tempelstrumann, 
and is fully three miles from Kume. You may imagine, therefore, with what new light and truth these poems dawn on me, and the different feelings with which I now regard and study them. I say nothing of Mignon's song at present, but it is singular that Goethe and Thorsvalden are still living, that Beethoven only died a few years ago, and yet H declares that German art is as dead as a rat, quod non, so much the worse for him, if he really feels thus. But when I reflect for a time on his conclusions, they appear to me very shallow. A propos, Shadoff, who returns to Dusseldorf in the course of a few days, has promised to extract, if possible, some new songs for me from Immermann, which rejoices me much. That man is a true poet, which is proved by his letters and everything that he has written. Count Platon is a little shriveled, wheezing old man, with gold spectacles, yet not more than five and thirty. He quite startled me. The Greeks look very different. He abuses the Germans terribly, forgetting, however, that he does so in German. But farewell for today. Felix. End of section 12. Section 13 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland. Translated by Grace Wallace. Music provided by Project Gutenberg. June 6th and June 16th, 1831. Rome, June 6th. 1831. My dear parents, it is indeed high time that I should write to you a rational, methodical letter, for I fear that none of those from Naples were worth much. It really seemed as if the atmosphere there deterred every one from serious reflection. At least I very seldom succeeded in collecting my thoughts or ideas, and now I have been scarcely more than a few hours here, when I once more resume that Roman tranquility and grave serenity which I alluded to in my former letters from this place. I cannot express how infinitely better I love Rome than Naples. The people allege that Rome is monotonous, one uniform hue, melancholy, and solitary. It is certainly true that Naples is more like a great Roman city, more lively and varied, and more cosmopolitan. I dislike it, just as I dislike many-sidedness, which, moreover, I rather think I do not much believe in. Anything that aspires to be distinguished, or beautiful, or really great, must be one-sided. But then this one side must be brought to a state of the most consummate perfection, and no man can deny that such is the case at Rome. Naples seems to me too small to be called properly a great city. All the life and bustle are confined to two large thoroughfares, the Toldeo and the coast from the harbor to the Chiaia. Naples does not realize to my mind the idea of a center for a great nation, which London offers in such perfection, chiefly, indeed, because it is deficient in a people. For the fishermen and Lazzaroni I cannot designate as a people. They are more like savages, and their center is not Naples, but the sea. The middle classes, by which I mean those who pursue various trades, and the working citizens who form the basis of other great towns, are quite subordinate. Indeed, I may almost say that such a class is not to be found there. It was this that often made me feel out of humor during my stay in Naples, much as I loved and enjoyed the scenery. But as a dissatisfied feeling constantly recurred, I think I at last discovered the cause to lie within myself. I cannot say that I was precisely unwell during the incessant sirocho, but it was more disagreeable than an indisposition which passes away in a few days. I felt languid, disinclined for all that was serious, in fact lazy. I lounged about the streets all day with a morose face, and would have preferred lying on the ground without the trouble of thinking, or wishing, or doing anything. Then it suddenly occurred to me that the principal classes of Naples live in reality precisely in the same manner, that consequently the source of my depression did not spring from myself, as I had feared, but from the whole combination of air, climate, etc. The atmosphere is suitable for grandees who rise late and never required to go out on foot, never think, for this is heating, sleep away a couple of hours on a sofa in the afternoon, then eat ice, and drive on to the theater at night, where again they do not find anything to think about, but simply make and receive visits. 
On the other hand, the climate is equally suitable for a fellow in a shirt, with naked legs and arms, who also has no occasion to move about, begging for a few granny when he has literally nothing left to live on, taking his afternoon siesta stretched on the ground, or on the quay, or on the stone pavement. The pedestrians step over him, or shove him aside if he lies right in the middle. He fetches his frutti di mare himself out of the sea, and sleeps wherever he may chance to find himself at night. In short, he employs every moment in doing exactly what he likes best, just as an animal does. These are the two principal classes of Naples. By far the largest portion of the population, from the Toledo there, consists of the gaily dressed ladies and gentlemen, or husbands and wives driving together in handsome equipages, or those all of San Culot, who sometimes carry about fish for sale, brawling in the most stentorian way, or bearing burdens when they have no longer any money left. I believe there are few indeed who have any settled occupation, or follow up any pursuit with zeal and perseverance, or who like work for the sake of working. Goethe says that the misfortune of the North is that people there always wish to be doing something, and striving after some end. And he goes on to say that an Italian was right, who advised him not to think so much, for it would only give him a headache. I suppose, however, that he was merely jesting. At all events, he did not act in this manner himself, but, on the contrary, like a genuine Northman. If, however, he means that the difference of the character is produced by nature and subservient to her influence, then there is no doubt that he is quite in the right. I can perfectly conceive that it must be so, and why wolves howl. Still, it is not necessary to howl along with them. The proverb should be exactly reversed. Those who, owing to their position, are obliged to work, and must consequently both think and bestir themselves, treat the matter like a necessary evil, which brings them in money. And when they actually have it, they too live like the great or naked gentleman. Thus there is no shop where you are not cheated. Natives of Naples, who have been customers for many years, are obliged to bargain, and to be as much on their guard as foreigners. And one of my acquaintances, who had dealt at the same shop for fifteen years, told me that during the whole of that period there had been invariably the same battle about a few scudi, and that nothing could prevent it. Thus it is there that there is so little industry or competition, and that Donizetti finishes an opera in ten days. To be sure, it is sometimes hissed, but that does not matter, for it is paid for all the same, and he can then go about amusing himself. If at last, however, his reputation becomes endangered, he will in that case be forced really to work, which he would find by no means agreeable. This is why he sometimes writes an opera in three weeks, bestowing considerable pains on a couple of airs in it, so that they may please the public, and then he can afford once more to divert himself, and once more to write trash. Their painters, in the same way, paint the most incredibly bad pictures, far inferior even to their music. Their architects also erect buildings in the worst taste, among others, an imitation on small scale of St. Peter's in the Chinese style. But what does it matter? The pictures are bright in color, and the music makes plenty of noise. The buildings give plenty of shade, and the Neapolitan grandees ask no more. My physical mood was similar to theirs, everything inspiring me with a wish to be idle and to lounge about and sleep, yet I was constantly saying to myself that this was wrong, and striving to occupy myself, and to work, which I could not accomplish. Hence arose the querulous tone of some of the letters I wrote to you, and I could only escape from such a mood by rambling over the hills, where nature is so divine, making every man feel grateful and cheerful. I did not neglect the musicians, and we had a great deal of music, but I cared little in reality for their flattering encomiums. Fordor is hitherto the only genius artist, male or female, that I have seen in Italy. Elsewhere I should probably have found a great many faults with her singing, but I overlooked them all, because when she sings it is real music, and after such a long privation that it was most acceptable. Now, however, I am once more in old Rome, where life is very different. There are processions daily, for last week was the Corpus Domini, and just as I left the city during the celebration, of the week following the Holy Week, I now return after the Corpus Christi to find them engaged in the same way. It made a singular impression on me to see that the street had in the interim assumed such an aspect of summer. On all sides, booths with lemons and iced water, the people in light dresses, the windows open, and the jalousie closed. 
You sit at the doors of coffee houses and eat gelato in quantities. The Corso swarmed with equipages, for people no longer walk much, and though in reality I miss no dear friends or relatives, yet I feel quite moved when I once more saw the Piazza di Spagna and the familiar names written up on the corners of the streets. I shall stay here for about a week and then proceed northwards. The Infiorata is on Thursday, but it is not quite certain that it will take place because they have some apprehensions of a revolution, but I hope I shall witness this ceremony. I mean to take advantage of this opportunity to study the hills once more, and then to set off for the north. Wish me a good journey, for I am on the eve of departure. It is a year this very day since I arrived in Munich to hear of Fidelio, and wrote to you. We have not met since then, but, please God, we shall see each other again before another year. Felix. Rome, June 16th. 1831. Dear Professor, It was my intention some time ago to have written you a description of the music during the Holy Week, but my journey to Naples intervened, and during my stay there, I was so constantly occupied in wandering among the mountains and in gazing at the sea that I had not a moment's leisure to write. Hence arose the delay for which I now beg to apologize. Since then, I have not heard a single note worth remembering. In Naples, the music is most inferior. During the last two months, therefore, I have no musical reminiscences to send you, save those of the Holy Week, which however made so indelible an impression on my mind that they will be always fresh in my memory. I already described to my parents the effect of the whole ceremonies, and they probably sent you the letter. It was fortunate that I resolved to listen to the various offices with earnest and close attention, and still more so, that for the very first moment, I felt sensations of reverence and piety. I consider such a mood indispensable for the reception of new ideas, and no portion of the general effect escaped me, although I took care to watch each separate detail. The ceremonies commenced on Wednesday at half past four o'clock with the antiphon Zelus Domus Tue. A little book containing the offices for the Holy Week explains the sense of the various solemnities. Each nocturne contains three psalms, signifying that Christ died for all and also symbolical of the three laws, the natural, the written, and the evangelical. The Domina Labia Mea and the Duisina Judorium were not sung on this occasion, when the death of our Saviour and Master is deplored, as slain by the hands of wicked, godless men. The fifteen lights represent the twelve apostles and the three Marys. In this manner, the book contains much curious information on the subject, so I mean to bring it with me for you. The psalms are chanted fortissimo by all the male voices of two choirs. Each verse is divided into two parts, like a question and answer, or rather, classified into A and B. The first chorus sings A, and the second replies with B. All the words, with the exception of the last, are sung with extreme rapidity on one note, but on the last they make a short melisma, which is different from the first and second verse. The whole psalm, with all its verses, is sung on this melody, or tono as they call it, and I wrote down several of these toni, which were employed during the three days. You cannot conceive how tiresome and monotonous the effect is, and how harshly and mechanically they chant through the psalms. The first tonus they sang was, Music Transcribed. Thus the whole of forty-two verses of the psalms are sung in precisely the same manner, one half of the verse ending in G-A-G, the other in G-E-G. -E they sing with the accent of a number of men quarreling violently, and it sounds as if they were shouting out furiously one against another. The closing words of each psalm are chanted more slowly and impressively, a long triad being substituted for the melisma, sung piano. For instance, this is the first. Music transcribed. The antiphon, and sometimes more than one, serves as an introduction to each psalm. These are generally sung by two countertenor voices, in canto framo, in harsh, hard tones. The first half of each verse is in the same style, and the second responded to by the chorus of male voices that I already described, 
I have kept the several antiphons that I wrote down, that you may compare them with the book. On the afternoon of Wednesday, the 68th, 69th, and 70th Psalms were sung. By the by, this division of the verses of the Psalms, sung in turns by each chorus, is one of the innovations that Bjornsson has introduced into the evangelical church here. He also ushers in each choral by an antiphon composed by Georg, a musician who resides here, in the style of Canti Fermi, first sung by a few voices, succeeded by a choral, such as Ein Fuste Berg ist in Tilgott. After the 70th psalm comes a paternoster, sub silentio, that is, all present and stand up, and a short silent inward prayer ensues, and a pause. Then commences the first lamentation of Jeremiah, sung in a low subdued tone, in the key of G major, a solemn and fine composition of palestrinas. The solos are chanted entirely by high tenor voices, swelling and subsiding alternately in the most delicate renditions, sometimes floating almost inaudibly, and gently blending the various harmonies, being sung without any bass voices, and immediately succeeding the previous harsh intonations of the psalms. The effect is truly heavenly. It is rather unfortunate, however, that those very parts which ought to be sung with the deepest emotion and reverence, being evidently those composed with a peculiar fever, should chance to be merely the titles of the chapter or verse, Alpha, Bet, Gimel, etc., and that the beautiful commencement, which sounds as if it came direct from heaven, should be precisely on these words, Intipit lamentatio geomi profit lexio unas. This must be not a little repulsive to every Protestant heart, and if there be any design to introduce a similar mode of chanting into our churches, it appears to me that this will always be a stumbling block, for anyone who sings chapter first cannot possibly feel any pious emotions. However beautiful the music may be, let him strive as he will. My little book indeed says, Vendendo profetizato il crucifigimento con gran pieta si cantano et si moto, lamentino volmenta alfa. I le altre similia parole che sono le lettere dell'alfabeto ebreo perce e hanno in ogni canzone in luogo di lamento come è questa. Ciascuna lettera ha in sé tutto il sentimento di quel versetto che la segue e i come un argomento di esso. But this explanation is not worth much. After this, the 71st, 72nd, and 73rd psalms are sung in the same manner, with their antiphons. These are apportioned to the various voices. The soprano begins, in Monte Olivetti, on which the bass voices chime in forte, ora vit ad patrium pater, etc. Then follow the lessons, from the treatise of St. Augustine on the psalms. The strange mode in which these are chanted appeared to me very extraordinary when I heard them for the first time on Psalm Sunday, without knowing what it meant. A solitary voice is heard reciting on one note, not as in the Psalms, but very slowly and impressively, making the tone ring out clearly. There are different cadences employed for the different punctuation of the words, to represent a comma, interrogation, and full stop. Perhaps you are already acquainted with these. To me, they were a novelty and appeared very singular. The first, for example, was chanted by a powerful bass voice in G. If the comma occurs, he sings so on the last word. Music transcribed. An interrogation thus. Music transcribed. A full stop. Music transcribed. For example, music transcribed. I cannot describe to you how strange the falling cadence from A to C sounds, especially when the bass is followed by a soprano who begins on D and makes the same falling cadence from E to G. Then an alto does the same in his key, for they sang three different lessons alternatively with a canto fermo. I send you a specimen of the mode in which they render the canto fermo, regardless both of the words and the sense. The phrase, better he had never been born, was thus sung. Music transcribed.
quite fortissimo and monotonously. Then came Psalms 74, 75, and 76, followed by three lessons, succeeded by the Miseria, sung in the same style as the preceding Psalms, in the following tonas. Music transcribed. It will be long before you can improve on this. Then follow the Psalms 8, 62, and 66, Canticum Moisi, in its own tone. The Psalms 148, 149, and 50 came next, and then antiphons. During this time, the lights on the altar are all extinguished, save one which is placed behind the altar. Six wax candles still continue to burn high above the entrance. The rest of the space is already dim, and now the whole chorus, unisono, in tone with full strength of their voices, the canticum decoria, during which the last remaining lights are extinguished. The mighty swelling chorus in the gloom, and the solemn vibration of so many voices, have a wonderfully fine effect. The melody, in D minor, is also very beautiful. At the close, all is profound darkness, and Antiphon begins on the sentence, now he that betrayed him gave him a sign, and continues to the words, That same is he, hold him fast. Then all present fall on their knees, and one solitary voice softly sings, Christus factus es pro nobis obedien usget mortem. A pause ensues, which each person repeats the paternoster to himself. During this silent prayer, a death-like silence prevails in the whole church. Presently, the miseria commences with a chord softly breathed by the voices, and gradually branching off into two choirs. This beginning, and its first harmonious vibration, certainly made the deepest impression on me. For an hour and a half previously, one voice alone had been heard chanting almost without any variety. After the pause came an admirably constructed chord, which has the finest possible effect, causing everyone to feel in their hearts the power of music. It is this indeed that is so striking. The best voices are reserved for the miseria, which is sung with the greatest variety and effect, the voices swelling and dying away. From the softest piano to the full strength of the choir, no wonder that it should excite deep emotion in every heart. Moreover, they do not neglect the power of contrast, verse after verse being chanted by all the male voices in unison, forte and harshly. At the beginning of the subsequent verses, the lovely, rich, soft sounds of voices steal on the ear, lasting only for a short space and succeeded by a chorus of male voices. During the verses sung in monotone, everyone knows how beautifully the softer choir are about to uplift their voices. Soon they are again heard again to die away too quickly, and before the thoughts can be collected, the service is over. On the first day, when the Miseria of Baini was given in the key of B minor, they sang thus, Miseria mei duas, to Misericordion tuam, from the music, with solo voices, two choirs using the whole strength of voices at their command. Then all the bass singers commenced to Ti Forte by F sharp, chanting on the note, Et secudium multitudium, to Inicitium miam which is immediately succeeded by a soft chord in B minor, and so on. To the last verse of all, which they sing with their entire strength, the second short silent prayer ensues, when all the cardinals scrape their feet noisily on the pavement, which betokens the close of the ceremony. My little book says, This noise is symbolical of the tumult made by the Hebrews in seizing Christ. It may be so, but it sounded exactly like the commotion in the pit of a theater, when the beginning of a play is delayed, or when it is finally condemned, the single taper is still burning, is then brought from behind the altar, and all silently disperse by its solitary light. On leaving the chapel, I must not omit to mention the striking effect of the blazing chandelier lighting up the great vestibule, where the cardinals and their attendant priests traverse the illuminated perno through ranks of Swiss guards. The miseria sung on the first day was by Inis a composition entirely devoid of life or power, like all his works. Still, it has chords and music, and so it made a certain impression. On the second day, they gave some pieces by Allegri in Bailly. On Good Friday, the music was all Bailly's, as Allegri composed only one verse, on which the rest are chanted, 
I heard three compositions, which they gave on that day. It is, however, quite immaterial which they sing, for the embellimenti are pretty much the same in all three. Each chord has its embellimento. Thus very little of the original composition is to be discovered. How these embellimenti have crept in, they will not say. It is maintained that they are traditional, but this I entirely disbelieve. The first place, no musical tradition is to be relied on. Besides, how is it possible to carry down a five-part movement to the present time from mere hearsay? It does not sound like it. It is evident that they have been more recently added, and it appears to me that the director, having had good high voices at his command, and wishing to employ them during the Holy Week, wrote down for their use ornamental phrases founded on the simple unadorned chords to enable them to give full scope and effect to their voices. They certainly are not of ancient date, but are composed with infinite talent and taste, and their effect is admirable. One in particular is often repeated, and makes so deep an impression that when it begins, an evident excitement pervades all present. Indeed, in any discussion as to the mode of executing this music, and when people say that the voices do not seem like the voices of men, but those of angels from on high, and that these sounds can never be heard anywhere else, it is this particular embellimento to which they invariably allude. For example, in the miseria, whether that of Bai or Legri, for they have recourse to the same embellimenti in both. These are the consecutive chords. Music transcribed. Instead of this, they sing it so. Music transcribed. The soprano intones the high C in a pure soft voice, allowing it to vibrate for a time, and slowly gliding down, while the alto holds the C steadily, so that at first I was under the delusion that the high C was still held by the soprano. The skill, too, with which the harmony is gradually developed is truly admirable. The other embellimenti are adapted in the same way to the consecutive chords, but the first one is by far the most beautiful. I can give no opinion as to the particular mode of executing the music, but what I once read that some particular acoustic contrivance caused the continued vibration of the sounds is an entire fable, quite as much so as the assertion that they sing from tradition and without any fixed time, one voice simply following the other, for I saw plainly enough the shadow of Bayani's long arm moving up and down. Indeed, he sometimes struck his music desk quite audibly. There is no lack of mystery, too, on the part of the singers and others. For example, they never say beforehand what particular miseria they intend to sing, but that it will be decided at the moment, etc., etc. The key in which they sing depends on the purity of the voices. The first day it was in B minor, the second and third in E minor, but each time they finished almost in B flat minor. The chief soprano, Mariano, came from the mountains to Rome expressly to sing on this occasion, and it is to him I owe hearing the embellimenti with their highest notes. However careful and attentive the singers may be, still the negligence and bad habits of the whole previous year have their revenge. Consequently, the most fearful dissonance sometimes occurs. I must not forget to tell you that on the Thursday, when the miseria was about to begin, I clambered up a ladder, leaning against the wall and was thus placed close to the roof of the chapel, so that I had the music, the priests, and the people far beneath me in gloom and shadow. Seated thus alone, without vicinity of any obtrusive stranger, the impression made on me was very profound. But to proceed, you must have had more than enough of the miserias in these pages, and I intend to bring you more particular details, both verbal and written. On Thursday, at half-past ten o'clock, high mass was celebrated. They sang an eight-part composition of Hattini's in no way remarkable. I reserve for you some canti from me and antiphons, which I wrote down at the time, and my little book describes the order of the various services and the meaning of the different ceremonies. At the Gloria in Excelsis, all the bells in Rome peal forth and are not rung again till after Good Friday. The hours are marked in the churches by wooden clappers. The words of the Gloria, the signal for all the strange tumult of bells, were chanted from the altar by an old cardinal Pacha. 
in feeble, trembling voice. This being succeeded by the choirs and all the bells had a striking effect. After the credo, they sang Fratus Egoinim a Palestrina, but in the most unfinished and careless manner. The washing of the pilgrim's feet followed, and a procession in which all the singers join, Baini beating the time from a large book carried before him, making signs first to one and then to another, while the singers pressed forward to look at the music, counting the time as they walked, and then chiming in, the Pope being borne aloft in his state chair. All this I have already described to my parents. In the evening there were psalms, lamentations, lessons, and the miseria again, scarcely differing from those of the previous day. One lesson was chanted by a soprano solo on a particular melody that I mean to bring home with me. It is an adagio, in long-drawn notes, and lasts a quarter of an hour at least. There is no pause in the music, and the melody lies very high, and yet it was executed with the most pure, clear, and even intonation. The singer did not drop his tone, so much as a single comma, the very last notes swelling and dying away, as even and full as the beginning. It was, indeed, a masterly performance. I was struck by the meaning they attached to the words, apaciatora. If the melody goes from C to D, or from C to E, they sing thus. Music transcribed. Or. Or. This is what they call an appoggiatura. Whatever they may choose to designate it, the effect is most disagreeable, and it must require long habit to not be discomposed by this strange practice, which reminds me very much of our old women at home in church. Moreover, the effect is the same. I saw in my book that the tenebrae was to be sung, and thinking that it would interest you to know how it was given in the papal chapel, I was on the watch with a sharp-pointed pencil when it commenced and send you herewith the principal parts. It was sung very quick, and forte throughout, without exception. The beginning was music transcribed. I cannot help it, but I own it does irritate me to hear such holy and touching words sung into such dull, drawing music. They say it is canto fermo, Gregorian, etc. No matter. If at that period there was neither the feeling nor the capability to write in a different style, at all events we have now the power to do so, and certainly this mechanical monotony is not to be found in the scriptural words. They are all truth and freshness, and moreover, expressed in the most simple and natural manner. Why, then, make them sound like mere formula? And, in truth, such singing as this is nothing more. The word peter, with a little flourish, the menum with a shake, the hut qui me, can this be called sacred music? There is certainly no false expression in it, because there is none of any kind. But does this very fact prove the desecration of the words? A hundred times during the ceremony, I was driven wild by such things as these, and then came people in a state of ecstasy, saying how splendid it had all been. This sounded to me like a bad joke, and yet they were quite in earnest. At Mass, early on Friday morning, the chapel is stripped of all its decorations, the altar uncovered, and the Pope and Cardinals in mourning. The Passion, from St. John, was sung, composed by Vittoria, but the words of the people in the chorus alone are his. The rest are chanted according to an established formula, but more of this hereafter. The whole appeared to me too trivial and monotonous. 
I was quite out of humor, and, in fact, dissatisfied with the affair altogether. One of the two following modes ought to be adopted. The Passion ought to either be recited quietly by the priest, as St. John relates it, in which case there is no occasion for the chorus to sing Crucifigium, nor for the alto to represent Pilate, or else the scene should be so thoroughly realized that it ought to make me feel as if I were actually present and saw it all myself. In that event, Pilate ought to sing just as he would have spoken. The chorus shout out Crucifigia in a tone anything but sacred, and then, through the impress of entire truth and the dignity of the object represented, the singing would become sacred church music. I require no undercurrent of thought when I hear music, which is not to me a mere medium to elevate the mind to piety, as they say here, but a distinct language speaking plainly to me. For though the sense is expressed by the words, it is equally contained in the music. This is the case with the passion of Sebastian Bach, but as they sing it here, it is very imperfect, being neither a simple narrative nor yet a grand solemn dramatic truth. The chorus sings Barabam to the same sacred chords as it's in Pax. Pilate speaks exactly in the same manner as the evangelist. The voice that represents our blessed Saviour commences always piano, in order to have one definite distinction. But when the chorus breaks loose, shouting at their sacred chords, it seems entirely devoid of meaning. Pray forgive these strictures. I now proceed with simple narration again. The evangelist is a tenor, and the mode of chanting, the same as that of the lessons, with a peculiar falling cadence at the comma, the interrogation, and full stop. The evangelist intones on D, and sings thus at a full stop, music transcribed. At a comma, and at the conclusion, when another personage enters, so. Christ is represented by a bass, and commences always thus. I could not catch the formula, though I noted down several parts, which I can show to you when I return. Among others, the words spoken on the cross, all the other personages, Pilate, Peter, the maid, and the high priest, are altos, and sing this melody only. Music transcribed. The chorus sings the words of the people from their places above, while everything else is sung from the altar. I must really mark down here a curiosity, the crucifix, just as I noted at the time. Music transcribed. The program is too most singular, very tame Jews indeed, but my letter is already too long, so I shall discuss the subject no further. Prayers are then offered up for all nations and institutions, each separately designated. When the prayer for the Jews is uttered, no one kneels, as they do at all the others, nor is amen said. They pray pro perfidius judeis, and the author of my book discovers an explanation of this also. Then follows the adoration of the cross. A small crucifix is placed in the center of the chapel, and all approach barefooted, without shoes, fall down before it and kiss it. During this time, the improperia are sung. I have only once heard this composition, but it seems to me to be one of Palestrina's finest works, and they sing it with remarkable enthusiasm. There is surprising delicacy and harmony in its execution by the choir. They are careful to place every passage in its proper light and to render it sufficiently prominent without making it too conspicuous, one chord blending softly with the other. Moreover, the ceremony is very solemn and dignified, and the most profound silence regains the chapel. They sing the oft-recurring Greek holy in the most admirable manner, each time with the same smoothness and expression. You will not be a little surprised, however, when you see it written down, for they sing it as follows. Music transcribed.
such passages as that at the commencement, where all the voices sing the very same embellishment, repeatedly occur, and the ear becomes accustomed to them. The effect of the whole is undoubtedly superb. I only wish you could hear the tenors in the first chorus, and the mode in which they take the high A on the word Theos. The note is so long drawn and ringing, though softly breathed, that it sounds most touching. This is repeated again and again, till all in the chapel have performed the adoration of the cross. But as on this occasion the crowd was not very great, I unluckily had not the opportunity of hearing it as often as I could have wished. I quite understand why the improperias produce the strongest effect on Goethe, for they are nearly the most faultless of all, both as music and ceremonies, and everything connected with them are in the most entire harmony. A procession follows to fetch the host, which has been exposed and adored on the previous evening in another chapel of the Quirno, lighted up by many hundred wax lights. The morning service closed at half past one with a hymn in Canto Framo. At half past three in the afternoon, the first nocturne began with the psalms, lessons, etc. I corrected what I had written down, heard the miseria of Beani, and about seven o'clock followed the cardinals home through the illuminated vestibule. So all was now seen, and all was now over. I was anxious, dear professor, to describe the Holy Week to you minutely, as they were memorable days to me every hour bringing with it something interesting and long anticipated i also particularly rejoiced in feeling that in spite of the excitement and the numerous discussions in praise or blame the solemnities made as vivid an impression on me as if i had been quite free from all previous prejudice or prepossession i thus saw the truth confirmed that perfection even in a sphere most foreign to us leaves its own stamp on the mind May you read this long letter with even half the pleasure I feel in recalling the period of the Holy Week at Rome. Yours faithfully, Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi. End of section 13. Section 14 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland, translated by Grace Wallace, June twenty fifth through July fourteenth, eighteen thirty one, Florence, June twenty fifth, eighteen thirty one. Dear sisters, on such a day as this, my paternal home and those I love are much in my thoughts. My feelings on this point are rather singular. If I feel at any time unwell or fatigued or out of humor. I have no particular longing for my own home or for my family, but when brighter days ensue, when every hour makes an indelible impression and every moment brings with it glad and pleasant sensations, then I ardently wish that I were with you, or you with me, and no minute passes without my thinking of one or other of you, to whom I have something particular to say. I have today passed the whole forenoon from ten till three in the gallery. It was glorious. Besides all the beautiful work I saw, from which so much fresh benefit is always to be derived, I wandered about among the pictures, feeling so much sympathy and such kindly emotions in gazing at them. Now I firstly thoroughly realized the great charm of a large collection of the highest works of art. You passed from one to the other, sitting and dreaming for an hour before some picture, and then on to the next. Yesterday was a holiday here. So today the Plaza d'Argi Uffizi was crowded with people who had come into the city to see the races and to visit the far-famed gallery, chiefly peasants, male and female, in their country costumes. All the apartments were thrown open, and I was about to contemplate them for the last time. I contrived to slip quietly through the crowd and to remain quite solitary, for I knew that I had not one acquaintance among them. The busts of the various princes who founded and enriched this collection, are placed near the entrance, at the top of the staircase. I suppose I must have been peculiarly susceptible today, for the faces of the Medici interested me exceedingly. They looked so noble and refined, so proud and so dignified. I stood looking at them for a long time, and imprinted on my memory those countenances of worldwide renown. I then went to the tribune. This room is so delightfully small, you can traverse it in fifteen paces and yet it contains a world of art. 
I again sought out my favorite armchair, which stands under the statue of the slave wetting his knife, Laurentino, and taking possession of it, I enjoyed myself for a couple of hours. For here, at one glance, I have the Madonna del Cardellino, Pope Julius II, a female portrait by Raphael, and above it, a lovely holy family by Pier Eugenio, and so close to me that I could have touched the statue with my hand, the Venus de Medici, beyond that of Titian, on the other side, the Paulino, and the wrestlers, la Tatori, in front of the Raphael, the merry Greek dancing fawn, who seems to feel an uncouth delight in discordant music, for the fellow has just struck two cymbals together, and is listening to the sound, while treading with his foot on a kind of pan's pipe, as by accompaniment, what a clown he is. The space between is occupied by other pictures of Raphael's, a portrait by Titian, a Domencino, etc., and all these within the circumference of a small semicircle, no larger than one of your own rooms. This is a spot where a man feels his own insignificance, and well may learn to be humble. I occasionally walked through the other rooms, where a large picture by Leonardo da Vinci, only commenced and sketched in, with all its wild dashes and strokes, is very suggestive. I was especially struck with the genius of the monk Fra Bartolomeo, who must have been a man of most devout, tender, and earnest spirit. There is a small picture of his here, which I discovered for myself. It is about the size of this sheet of paper, in two divisions, and represents the adoration and the presentation in the temple. The figures are about two-thirds of a finger's length in size, but finished in the most exquisite and consummate manner, with the most brilliant coloring and the brightest decorations, and in the most genial sunshine. You can see in the picture itself that the pious maestro has taken delight in painting it, and in finishing the most minute details, probably with the view of giving it away to gratify some friend. We feel as if the painter belonged to it, and still ought to be sitting before his work, or had only this moment left it. I felt the same with regard to many pictures today, especially that of Madonna del Cardellino, which Raphael painted as a wedding gift and a surprise for his friend. I could not help meditating on all these great men, so long passed away from the earth, though their whole inner soul is still displayed in such lustre to us and to all the world. While reflecting on these things, I came by chance into a room containing the portraits of great painters. I formerly merely regarded them in the light of valuable curiosities, for there are more than three hundred portraits, chiefly painted by the masters themselves, so that you can see at the same moment the man and his work. But today, a fresh idea dawned on me with regard to them, that each painter resembles his own productions, and that while each painting his own likeness has been careful to represent himself just as he really was, in this way, you become personally acquainted with all these great men, and thus a new light is shed on many things. I will discuss this point more minutely with you when we meet, but I must not omit to say that the portrait of Raphael is almost the most touching likeness I have yet seen of him. In the center of a large, rich screen, entirely covered with portraits, hangs a small, solitary piece, without any particular designation, but the eye is instantly arrested by it. This is Raphael youthful, very pale, and delicate, and with such onward aspirations, such longing and wistfulness in the mouth and eyes, that it is as if you could see into his very soul. That he cannot succeed in all this is written on his mournful, suffering, yet, yet fervid countenance, and when looking at his dark eyes, which glance at you out of the very depths of his soul, and at the painted and contracted mouth, you cannot resist a feeling of awe. How I wish you could see the portrait that hangs above it, that of Michelangelo, an ugly, muscular, savage, rugged fellow, in all the vigor of life, looking gruff and morose. On the other side, a wise, grave man, with the aspect of a lion, Leonardo da Vinci. But you cannot see this portrait, and I will not describe it in writing, but tell you of it when we meet. Believe me, however, it is truly glorious. Then I passed on to the Niobe, which of all statues makes the greatest impression on me, and back again to my painters, and to the Tribune and through the corridors where the roman emperors with their dignified yet knavish physiognomies stare you in the face and last of all i took a final leave of the medici family it was a morning never to be forgotten june twenty sixth do not suppose however that i mean to assert that all days are spent thus you must battle your way through the present living mob before you can arrive at the nobility long since dead 
and those who have not a strong arm are sure to come badly off in the conflict. Such a journey as mine from Rome to Perugia, and on here, is no joke. Jean-Paul says that the presence of a person who openly hates you is most painful and oppressive. Such a being is the Roman Vittorino. He grants you no sleep, exposes you to hunger and thirst. At night, when he is bound to provide you with your pranzo, he contrives that you shall not arrive till midnight, when everyone is of course asleep, and you are only too thankful to get a bed. In the morning, he sets off before four o'clock, and rests his horses at noon for five hours, but invariably in some solitary little wayward inn, where nothing is to be had. Each day, he makes out about six German miles, and drives piano, while the sun burns fortissimo. I was very badly off, owing to all this, for my fellow travellers were far from being congenial. Three Jesuits inside, and in the cabriolet, where I particularly desired to sit, a most agreeable Venetian lady. If I wished to escape from her, I was obliged to go inside, and listen to the praises of Charles X, and hear that the Ariosto ought to have been burnt as a corrupt writer, subversive of all mortality. It was still worse outside, and we never seemed to get on. The first day, after a journey of four hours, the axle-tree broke, and we were obliged to remain for nine hours in the same house in the Campania where we chanced to be, and at last to stay all night. If there was a church on the road that we had an opportunity of visiting, the most beautiful and devotional creations of Perugino or Giotto or Cimambue enchanted our eyes, so we passed from irritation to delight, and then to irritation again. This was a wretched state to be in. I was not in the least amused by it all, and if nature had not bestowed on us bright moonshine at the lake of Thrasamine, and if the scenery had not been so wonderfully fine, and if in every town we had not seen a superb church, and if we had not passed through a large city each day as we journeyed on, and if, but you see I'm not easily satisfied. The route, however, was beautiful, and I must now describe my arrival in Florence, which also includes my whole Italian life of the previous days. At Incisa, half a day's journey from Florence, my vetturino became so intolerable from his insolence and abuse that I found it necessary to take out my luggage and to tell him to drive to the devil which he accordingly did, rather against his will. It was Midsummer's Day, and a celebrated fete was to take place in Florence the same evening, which I would on no account whatever have missed. This is just the kind of thing that the Italians take advantage of. So the landlady at Ingiza offered me a carriage at four times the proper fare. When I refused to take it, she said I might try to procure another, and so accordingly I did, but found that no carriages for hire were to be had, only post-horses. I went to the post, and was there told, to my disgust, that they were at my landlady's, and that she had wished to make me pay an exorbitant price for them. I went back and demanded horses. She said, if I did not choose to pay what she asked, I should have none. I desired to see the regulations, which they are all obliged to have. She said there was no occasion to show them, and turned her back on me. The use of physical strength, which plays a great part here, was restored to me on this occasion for I seized her and pushed her back into a room, for we were standing in a passage, and then hurried down the street to the Podesta. It turned out, however, that there was no such person in the town, but that he lived four miles off. The affair became every instant more disagreeable, the crowd of boys at my heels increasing at every step. Fortunately, a decent-looking man came up, to whom the mob seemed to show some respect, so I accosted him and explained all that had occurred. He sympathized with me and took me to a vine dresser's who had a little carriage for hire. The whole crowd now congregated before his door, many pressing forward into the house after me and shouting that I was mad. But the carriage drove up and I threw a few scudi to an old beggar, on which they all called out that I was a bravo signore and wished me a buon viaggio. The moderate price the man demanded more fully showed me than the abominable overcharge of the landlady. The carriage was easy and the horses went on at a good pace, and so we travelled across the hills to Florence. In the course of half an hour we overtook Melisi Venturino. I put up my umbrella to defend me from the sun, and I scarcely ever travelled so pleasantly and so comfortably as during those few hours, having left all annoyances behind me, and before me the prospect of beautiful fete. Very soon the Dumo and the hundreds of villas scattered through the valleys were visible. Once more we passed by decorated terraces, and the tops of trees seen over them, the Arno Valley looking lovelier than ever. 
and so I arrived here in good spirits and dined, and every while doing so I heard a tumult, and looking out of the window I saw crowds, both young and old, all hurrying in their holiday costumes across the bridges. I followed them to the Corso, and then to the races, afterward to the illuminated Bergiola, and last of all to a masked ball in the Goldini Theatre. At one o'clock in the morning I went towards home, thinking that the whole affair was over, but the Arno was still covered with gondolas illuminated by colored lamps and crossing each other in every direction. Under the bridge a large ship was passing, hung with green lanterns, the water shone brightly as it rippled along, while a still brighter moon looked down on the whole scene. I recalled to myself the various occurrences of the day, and the thoughts that had chased each other through my mind, and resolved to write them all to you. It is, in fact, a reminiscence for myself, for it may not be so suggestive to you, but it will one day be of service to me, enabling me to recall various scenes connected with fair Italy. Extract from a letter to Frau von Pereja in Vienna Genoa, July 1831. At first I resolved not to answer your letter until I had fulfilled your injunctions and composed Napoleon's Midnight Reveal, and now I have to ask your forgiveness for not having done so, but there is a peculiarity in this matter. I take music in a very serious light, and I consider it quite inadmissible to compose anything that I do not thoroughly feel. It is just as if I were to utter a falsehood, for notes have a distinct meaning as words perhaps even a more definite sense. Now it appears to me almost impossible to compose for a descriptive poem. The mass of compositions of this nature do not militate against this opinion, but rather prove its truth, for I am not acquainted with one single work of the kind that has been successful. You are placed between a dramatic conception or mere narrative. The one, in the air chronique, causes the willow to rustle, the child to shriek, and the horse to gallop. The other imagines a ballad singer, calmly narrating the horrible tale, as you would a ghost story, and this is the most accurate view of the two. Reichardt almost invariably adopts this reading, but it does not suit me. The music stands in my way. I feel in a far more spectral spirit when I read such a poem quietly to myself, and imagine the rest, than when it is depicted or related to me. It does not answer to look on Napoleon's Midnight Review as a narrative, Inasmuch as no particular person speaks, and the poem is not written in the style of a ballad, and seems to me more like a clever conception than a poem, it strikes me that the poet himself placed no great faith in his misty forms. I could not, indeed, have composed music for it in the same descriptive style as Nikum in Frischov in Vienna. I might have introduced a very novel rolling of drums in the bass, and blasts of trumpets in the treble, and have brought in all sorts of hobgoblins but I love my serious elements of sound too well to do anything of the sort, for this kind of thing always appears to me a joke, somewhat like the paintings in juvenile spelling books, where the roofs are colored bright red to make the children aware that they are intended for roofs, and I should have been most reluctant to write out and send you anything incomplete, or that did not entirely please myself, because I always wish you to have the best I can accomplish. Felix. Milan, July 14th, 1831. This letter will probably be the last, D.V., that I shall write to you from an Italian city. I may possibly send you another from the Borromean Islands, which I intend to visit in a few days, but do not rely on this. My week here has been one of the most agreeable and amusing that I have passed in Italy, and how this could be the case in Milan, hitherto utterly unknown to me, I shall now proceed to relate. In the first place, I immediately secured a small piano, and attacked with Rabia that endless Valpigis night, to finish the thing at last, and tomorrow morning it will be completed, except for the overture, for as yet I have not quite made up my mind whether it shall be a grand symphony or a short introduction breathing of spring. I should like to take the opinion of some adept on this point. I must say the conclusion has turned out better than I myself expected. The hobgoblins and the bearded druid, with the trombone sounding behind him, diverted me immensely, and so I passed two forenoons very happily. Tasso also contributed to my pleasure, which I have now for the first time been able to read with facility. It is a splendid poem. I was glad to be already well acquainted with Goethe's Tasso, being constantly reminded of it by the principal passages of the Italian poet, whose verse, like that of Goethe's, is so dreamy, harmonious, and tender, its sweet melody delighting the ear. Your favorite passage, dear father, Ara la notte allor, struck me as very beautiful, 
But the stanzas that I admire most are those descriptives of Corinda's death. They are so wonderfully imaginative and fine. The close, however, does not quite please me. Tancred's lamentations are, I think, more charmingly composed than true to nature. They contain too many clever ideas and antitheses, and even the words of the hermit which soothe him sound more like a censure on the hermit himself. I should infallibly have killed him on the spot if he had talked to me in such a strain. Recently, I was reading the episode of Armida in a carriage, surrounded by a company of Italian actors who were incessantly singing Rossini's Matrema Trema, when suddenly there recurred to my thoughts, Gluck's Fumale Quite, and Rinaldo's falling asleep, and the voyage in the air, and I felt in a most melting mood, this is genuine music. Thus have men felt, and thus have men spoken, and such strains can never die. I do cordially hate the present licentious style. Do not take it amiss. Your motto is, without hatred, no love. And I did feel so moved when I thought of Gluck and his grand embodiments. Every evening I was in society, owing to a mad prank, which however proved very successful. I think I have invented this kind of eccentric proceeding, and may take out a patent for it, as I have already made my most agreeable acquaintances, ex abrupto, without letters or introductions of any kind. I asked by chance on my arrival at Milan the name of the commandant in the Laquais de Place named General Ertzmann. I instantly thought of Beethoven's Sonata in A Major and its dedication, and as I have heard all that was good of Madame Ertzmann from those who knew her, that she was so kind and had bestowed such loving care on Beethoven and played herself so beautifully, I, next morning, and a suitable hour for a visit, put on a black coat, desired that the government house should be pointed out to me, and occupied myself on the way, thither by composing some pretty speeches for the general's lady, and went on boldly. I cannot, however, deny that I felt rather dismayed when I was told that the general lived in the first story, facing the street, and when I was fairly in the splendid vaulted hall, I was seized with a sudden panic and would fain have turned back. But I could not help thinking that it was vastly provincial on my part to take fright at a vaulted hall. So I went straight up to a group of soldiers standing near, and asked an old man in a short nankeen jacket if General Ertman lived there, intending then to send in my name to the lady. Unluckily, the man replied, I am General Ertman, what is your pleasure? This was unpleasant, as I was forced to have recourse to the speech I had prepared. The general, however, did not seem particularly edified by my statement, and wished to know whom he had the honor of addressing. This also was far from agreeable, but fortunately he was acquainted with my name, and became very polite. His wife, he said, was not at home, but I should find her at two o'clock, or any hour after, that which might suit me. I was glad that all had gone off so well, and in the meantime went to the Brera, where I passed the time in studying this Bodbosalizio of Raphael, and at two o'clock I presented myself to Freifrau Dortia von Ertmann. She received me with much courtesy, and was most obliging, playing me Beethoven's sonata in C-sharp minor, and the one in D minor. The old general, who now appeared in his handsome grey uniform, covered with orders, was quite enchanted, and had tears of delight in his eyes, because it was so long since he had heard his wife play. He said there was not a person in Milan who cared to hear what I had heard. She mentioned the trio in B major, but she said she could not remember it. I played it, and sang the other parts. This enchanted the old couple, and so their acquaintance was soon made. Since then, their kindness to me is so great that it quite overwhelms me. The old general shows me all the remarkable objects in Milan. In the afternoon, his lady takes me in her carriage to drive to the Corso, and at night we have music till one o'clock in the morning. Yesterday, at an early hour, they drove with me in Enfrions. At noon, I dined with them, and in the evening there was a party. They are the most agreeable and cultivated couple you can imagine and both as much in love with each other as if they were a newly wedded pair, and yet they have been married for four and thirty years. Yesterday he spoke of his profession, of military life, of personal courage, and similar subjects, with a degree of lucidity and liberality of feeling that I scarcely ever met with, except in my father. The general has been now an officer for six and forty years, and you should really see him galloping beside his wife's carriage in the park, the old gentleman looking so dignified and animated. She plays Beethoven's works admirably, though it is so long since she studied them. She sometimes rather exaggerates the expression, dwelling too long on one passage and then hurrying the next. But there are many parts that she plays splendidly, and I think I have learned something from her. When sometimes she can bring no more tone out of the instrument, 
and begins to sing in a voice that emanates from the very depths of our soul. She reminds me of you, dear Fanny, though you are infinitely her superior. When I was approaching the end of the adagio in the B major trio, she exclaimed, The amount of expression here is beyond anyone's playing, and it is quite true of this passage. The following day, when I went there again to play her the symphony in C minor, she insisted on my taking off my coat, as the day was so hot. In the intervals of our music, she related the most interesting anecdotes of Beethoven, and that when she was playing to him in the evening, he not unfrequently used the snuffers as a toothpick. She told me that when she had lost her last child, Beethoven at first shrank from coming to her house, but at length he invited her to visit him, and when she arrived, she found him seated at the piano and simply sang, Let us speak to each other by music. He played on for more than an hour, and, as she expressed it, he said much to me, and at last gave me consolation. In short, I am now in the most genial mood, and quite at my ease, having no occasion to resort to any disguise or to be silent, for we understand each other admirably on all points. She played the Kreutzer Sonata yesterday with a violin accompaniment, and when the violin player, an Austrian cavalry officer, made a long flourish a la Paganini at the beginning of the adagio, the old general made such a desperate grimace that I nearly fell off my chair from laughing. I called on Teschner, as you, dear mother, desired me to do so. Such a musician, however, is as depressing as a thick fog. Madame Yetman has much more soul in her little fingers than that fellow has in his whole body, with his formidable mustaches behind which he seems to lie in ambush. There is no public music in Milan. They still speak with enthusiasm of last winter, where Pasta and Rubini sang here, but say that they were miserably supported, and the orchestra and courses bad. I, however, heard Pasta six years ago in Paris, and I can do the same every year, with addition of a good orchestra and a good chorus, and many other advantages. So it is evident that if I wish to hear Italian music, I must go to Paris or to England. The Germans, however, take it amiss when you say this, and persist par force, in singing, playing, and acquiring new ideas here, declaring this is the land of inspiration, while I maintain that inspiration is peculiar to no country, but floats around in the air. Two days ago, I was in the morning theatre here, and was amused. There you can see more of the life of the people than you can in any other part of Italy. It is a large theatre with boxes, the pit veiled with wooden benches, on which you can find places if you come early. The stage is like every other stage, but there is no roof, either over the pit or boxes, so that the bright sun shines into the theatre and into the eyes of the actors. Moreover, the piece they gave was in the Milanese dialect. You feel as if you were secretly watching all these complicated and diverting situations, and might take part in them, if necessary. And thus the most familiar comic dilemmas become novel and interesting, and the public seems to feel most lively interest in them. And now, good night. I wish to talk to you a little before going to bed, and so it has become a letter. Felix. End of section 14. Section 15 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. Translated by Grace Wallace. Music provided by Project Gutenberg. July 15th through July 24th, 1831. Extracts from two letters to Edward de Vrant. Milan, July 15th, 1831. You reproach me with being two and twenty without having yet acquired fame. To this I can only reply, had it been the will of Providence that I should be renowned at the age of two and twenty, I no doubt should have been so. I cannot help it, for I no more right to gain a name than to obtain a Kappelmeister's place. It would be a good thing if I could secure both, but so long as I do not actually starve, so long as it is my duty to write only as I feel, and according to what is in my heart, and to leave the results to him who disposes of other and greater matters. Every day, however, I am more sincerely anxious to write exactly as I feel, and to have even less regard than ever to external views and when I have composed a piece, just as it sprang from my heart, then I have done my duty towards it, and whether it brings hereafter fame, honor, decorations, or snuff-boxes, etc., is a matter of indifference to me. If you mean, however, that I have neglected or delayed perfecting myself or my compositions, then I beg you will distinctly and clearly say in what respect and wherein I have done so. This would be, indeed, a serious reproach. 
You wish me to write operas, and think I am unwise not to have done so long ago. I answer, place a right libretto in my hand, and in two months the work shall be completed. For every day I feel more eager to write an opera. I think that it may become something fresh and spirited, if I begin now. But I have got no words yet, and I assuredly never will write music for any poetry that does not inspire me with enthusiasm. If you know a man capable of writing librettos for an opera, for heaven's sake, tell me his name. That is all I want. But till I have the words, you would not wish me to be idle, even if it were possible for me to be so. I have recently written a good deal of sacred music that is quite as much a necessity to me as the impulse that often induces people to study some particular book, the Bible, or others, as the only reading they care for at the time. If it bears any resemblance to Sebastian Bach, it is again no fault of mine, for I wrote it just according to the mood I was in. And if the words inspired me with a mood akin to that of old Bach, I shall value it all the more. For I am sure you do not think that I would merely copy his form, without the substance. If it were so, I should feel such disgust and such a void that I could never again finish a composition. Since then I have written a grand piece of music which will probably impress the public at large, the first Valpurgis Night of Goethe. I began it simply because it pleased me, and inspired me with fever and never thought that it was to be performed. But now that it lies finished before me, I see that it is quite suitable for the great concert stuke, and you must sing the bearded pagan priest at my first subscription concert in Berlin. I wrote it expressly to suit your voice, and I have hitherto found that the pieces I have composed with the least reference to the public are precisely those which gave them the greatest satisfaction, so no doubt it will be on this occasion also. I only mention this to prove to you that I do not neglect the practical, and to be sure this is invariably an afterthought, for who the dunes could write music, the most unpractical thing in the world, the very reason why it love it so dearly, and yet think all the time of the practical. It is just as if a lover were to bring a declaration of love to his mistress in rhyme and verse, and recite it to her. I am now going to Munich, where they have offered me an opera, to see if I can find a man there who is a poet, for I will only have a man who has a certain portion of fire and genius. I do not expect a giant, and if I fail in meeting with a poet there, I shall probably make Immermann's acquaintance for this express purpose, and if he is not the man either, I shall try for him in London. I always fancy that the right man has not yet appeared, but what can I do till I find him? He certainly does not live in the Reichmann Hotel, nor next door. So where does he live? Pray write to me on this subject. Although I firmly believe that a kind providence, who sends us all things in due time when we stand in need of them, will supply this also if necessary. Still we must do our duty and look around us, and I do wish libretto were found. In the meantime, I write as good music as I can, and hope to make progress. And we already agreed, when discussing this affair in my room, that, as I said before, I am not responsible for the rest. But enough now of this dry tone. I really have become once more almost morose and impatient, and yet I had so firmly resolved never again to be so. Luciane, August 27th, 1831. I feel quite that any opera I were to write now would not be nearly so good as any second one I might compose afterwards, and that I must first enter on the new path I propose to myself and pursue it for some little time in order to discover whither it will lead and how far it will go, whereas in instrumental music I already begin to know exactly what I really intend. Having worked so much in this sphere, I feel much more clear and tranquil with regard to it. In short, it urges me onwards. Besides, I have been made very humble lately, by a chance occurrence that still dwells on my mind. In the valley of Ingelberg, I found Schiller's William Tell, and on reading it over again, I was anew enchanted and fascinated by such a glorious work of art and by all the passion, fire, and fever it displays, an expression of Goethe's suddenly recurred to my mind in the course of a long conversation about Schiller. He said that Schiller had been able to supply two great tragedies every year, besides other poems. This business-like turn, supply, struck me as the more remarkable on reading this fresh, vigorous work, and such energy seemed to me so wonderfully grand that I felt as if in the course of my life I never yet produced anything of importance. All my work seems so isolated. I feel as if I too must one day supply something. Pray do not think this presumptuous, but rather believe that I only say so because I know what ought to be and what is not. Where I am to find the opportunity, or even a glimpse of one, is hitherto to me quite a mystery. 
If, however, it will be my mission, I firmly believe that the opportunity will be granted, and if I do not profit by it, another will. But in that case, I cannot divine why I feel such an impulse to press onwards. If you could succeed in not thinking about singers, decorations, and situations, but feel solely absorbed in representing men, nature, and life, I am convinced that you would yourself write the best libretto of any one living. For a person who is so familiar with the stage as you are, could not possibly write anything undramatic. And I really do not know what you could wish to change in your poetry, if there be an innate feeling for nature and melody. The verses cannot fail to be musical, even though they sound rather lame in the libretto. But so far as I am concerned, you may write prose if you like. I will compose music for it. But when one form is to be molded into another, when the verses are to be made musically, but not felt musically, when fine words are to replace outwardly what is utterly deficient in foreign feelings inwardly, there you are right. This is a dilemma from which no man can extricate himself, for as surely as pure meter, happy thoughts, and classical language do not suffice to make a good poem unless a certain flash of poetical inspiration pervades the whole. So an opera can only become thoroughly musical and accordingly thoroughly dramatic by a vivid feeling of life in all the characters. There is a passage on this subject in Beaumarchais, who is censured because he makes his personages utter too few fine thoughts and has put too few poetical phrases in their mouths. He answers that this is not his fault. He must confess that during the whole time he was writing the piece, he was engaged in the most lively conversation with his dramatis personae and that while seated at his writing-table he was exclaiming, Figaro, prends garde, le comte c'est tout. Ah, comtesse, qui en prudence. Vite, sauve-toi, petit page. And then he wrote down their answers, whatever they chanced to be, nothing more. This strikes me as being both true and charming. The sketch of the opera introducing an Italian carnival and the clothes in Switzerland I already knew, but was not aware that it was yours. Be so good, however, to describe Switzerland with great vigor, and immense spirit, if you are to depict an effeminate Switzerland with Joden and languishing, such as I saw here in the theatre last night in the Swiss family, when the very mountains and alpine horns become sentimental, I shall lose all patience and criticize you severely in Spencer's paper. I beg you will make it in full animation and write to me again on the subject. Isola Bella, July twenty fourth, eighteen thirty one. You no doubt imagine that you inhale the fragrance of orange flowers sea blue sky and a bright sun and a clear lake when you merely read the date of this letter not at all the weather is atrocious rain pouring down and claps of thunder heard at intervals the hills look frightfully bleak as if the world were enshrouded in clouds the lake is grey and the sky sombre i could spell no orange flowers and this island might quite as appropriately be called isola bruta and this has gone on for three days my unfortunate cloak I am confessedly the spirit of negation. I refer to my mother, and as it is at present the fashion with every one not to consider the Bromian Islands by any means so beautiful and somewhat formal, and as the weather seems resolved to disgust me with this spot, from a spirit of opposition I maintain that it is perfectly lovely. The approach to these islands, where you see crowded together green terraces and quaint statues, and many old-fashioned decorations, along with, with verdant foliage, and every species of southern vegetation has a peculiar charm for me, and yet something affecting and solemn too. For what I last year saw in all the luxuriance and exuberance of wild nature, and to which my eye had become so accustomed, I find now cultivated by art, and about to pass away from me for ever. There are citron hedges and orange bushes, and sharp pointed owls shoot up from the walls. It is just as if, at the end of a piece, the beginning were to be repeated and this, as you know, I particularly like. In the steamboat was the first peasant girl I have seen here in Swiss costume. The people speak a bad half-French Italian. This is my last letter from Italy. But believe me, the Italian lakes are not the least interesting objects in this country. Auntie, I never saw any more beautiful. People tried to persuade me that the gigantic forms of the Swiss Alps that have haunted me from my childhood have been exaggerated by my imagination and that after all a snowy mountain was not in reality so grand as I thought. I almost dreaded being undeceived, but at first sight of the foreground of the Alps, from the lake of Como, filled in clouds with here and there a surface of bright snow. 
sharp black points rearing their heads and sinking precipitously into the lake, the hills first scattered over with trees and villages, and covered with moss, and then bleak and desolate, and on every side deep ravines filled with snow. I felt just as I formerly did, and saw that I had exaggerated nothing. In the Alps all is more free, more sharply defined, more uncivilized, if you will, yet I always feel there both healthier and happier. I have just returned from the gardens of the palace, which I visited in the midst of the rain. I wished to imitate Albano, and sent for a barber to open a vein. He, however, misunderstood my purpose, and shaved me instead. A very pardonable mistake. Gondolas are landing on every part of the island, for today the fete following the great festival of yesterday, in the honor in which P. P. Borromeo sent for singers and musicians from Milan to sing and play to the islanders. La Gardiner asked me if I knew what a wind instrument was. I said with a clear conscience that I did, and he replied that I ought to try to imagine the effect of thirty such instruments, and violins and basses, all played at once, but indeed I cannot possibly imagine it, for it must be heard to be believed. The sounds, continued he, seem to come from heaven, and all this was produced by Philharmonie. What he meant by this term I know not, but the music had evidently made more impression on him than the best orchestra often does on musical connoisseurs. At this moment, someone has just begun to play the organ in the church for divine service in the following strain. Music transcribed. Full organ in the bass, where Don 16 and Reed stops, have a very fine effect. The fellow has come all the way from Milan, too, expressly to make this disturbance in the church. I must go there for a little, so farewell for a few moments. I intend to remain here for the night instead of crossing the lake again, for I am so much pleased with this little island. I certainly cannot say that I have slept soundly for the last two nights. One night, owing to the innumerable claps of thunder, the next, owing to the innumerable fleas, and, in all probably, I have tonight this prospect of both combined, but as the following morning I shall be speaking French, and have left Italy, and crossed the Simplon, I mean to ramble about all this day and tomorrow in true Italian fashion. I must now relate to you historically how I happened to come here, and the very last moment of my stay in Milan. The Erdmans came to my room to bid me farewell and we took leave of each other more cordially than I have done of any one for many a long day. I promise to send you my kind wishes from them, though they are unacquainted with you, and I also agreed to write to them occasionally. Another valued acquaintance I made there is Herr Mozart, who holds an office in Milan. He is a musician, heart and soul. He is said to bear the strongest resemblance to his father, especially in disposition, for the very same phrases that affects the feelings in the father's letters from their candor and simplicity, constantly recur in the conversations of the son, whom no one can fail to love from the moment he is known. For instance, I considered a very charming trait in him, that he is as jealous of the fame and name of his father, as if he were an incipient young musician. And one evening, at the Ertmans, when a great many of Beethoven's works had been played, the baroness asked me in a whisper to play something of Mozart's, otherwise his son would be quite mortified. So when I played the overture to Don Juan, he began to thaw, and begged me to play also the overture of the Flato Magico, of his Vata, and seemed to feel truly filial delight in hearing it. It is impossible not to like him. He gave me letters to some friends near the Lake of Como, which procured me for once a glimpse of Italian provincial life, and I amused myself famously there for a few days with the doctor, the apothecary, the judge, and other people of the locality. There were very lively discussions on the subject of sand, and many expressed great admirations of him. This appeared strange to me, as the occurrence is of such distant date that no one any longer argues on this subject. They also spoke of Shakespeare's plays, which are now being translated into Italian. The doctor said that the tragedies were good, but that there were some plays about witches that were too stupid and childish. One in particular, Io sono d'una notte di mezza stata. In it, the stale device occurred of a piece being rehearsed in the play, and it was full of anachronisms and childish ideas, on which they all chimed in that it was very silly and advised me not to read it. I remained meekly silent and attempted no defense. 
I bathed frequently in the lake and sketched, and yesterday rode on the lake of Ujano, which frowned sternly on us with its cascades and dark canopy of clouds, then across the hills to Luvino, and today I came here by steam. Evening. I have this moment returned from the Isola Madre, and most splendid it is, spacious and full of terraces, citron hedges, and evergreen shrubs. The weather has at last become less inclement, thus the large white house on the island, with its ruins and terraces, looks very pretty. It is indeed a unique land, and I only wish I could bring with me to Berlin a portion of the same balmy air that I inhaled when I was in the boat today. You have nothing like it, and I would rather you enjoyed it than all the people who imbibed it here. A fiercely mustachioed German was with me in the boat, who examined all the beautiful scenery as if he were about to purchase it, and thought it too dear. Presently I heard a trait quite in the style of Jean-Paul. When we were walking on the island, surrounded by Vendure, an Italian who was of the party observed that this was a spot well adapted for lovers to ramble in, and to enjoy the charms of nature. Ah, yes, said I, in a languishing tone. It was on this account, continued he, that I separated from my wife ten years ago. I established her at Venice in a small tobacconist shop, and now I live as I please. You must one day do the same. The old boatman told us that he had rowed General Bonaparte on this lake, and related various anecdotes of him and Marat. He said Marat was a most extraordinary man. All the time that he was rowing him on the lake, he never ceased singing to himself for a single moment, and once when setting off on a journey, he gave him his spirit flask, and said he would buy another for himself in Milan. I cannot tell why these little traits, especially the singing, seem to realize a man in my mind more than any book of history. The Vopricus Nock is finished and revised, and the overture will soon be equally far advanced. The only person who has heard it as yet is Mozart, and he was so delighted with it that the well-known composition caused me fresh pleasure. He insisted on my publishing it immediately. Pray forgive this letter, written in true student phraseology. You no doubt perceive from its style that I have not worn a neckcloth for a week past, but I wish you to know how gay and happy I have been during the day spent among the mountains, and with what pleasure I look forward to those that yet await me. Yours, Felix. End of section 15. Section 16 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland. Translated by Grace Wallace. Music provided by Project Gutenberg. Late July through August 8, 1831. À l'Union Prieure de Chamonix, end of July, 1831. Prieure. My dear parents, I cannot refrain from writing to you from time to time to thank you for my wondrously beautiful journey, and if I ever did so before, I must do so again now, for more delightful days than those on my journey hither and during my stay here I never experienced. Fortunately, you already know this valley, so there is no occasion for me to describe it to you. Indeed, how could I possibly have done so? But this I may say, that nowhere has nature in all her glory met my eyes in such brightness as here, both when I saw it with you for the first time, and now, and as every one who sees it ought to thank God for having given him facilities to comprehend and to appreciate such grandeur, so I must also thank you for having supplied me with the means of enjoying such a pleasure. I have been told that I exaggerated the forms of the mountains in my imagination, but yesterday, at the hour of sunset, I was pacing up and down the front of the house, and each time I turned my back on the mountains, I endeavored vividly to represent to myself these gigantic masses, and each time, when I again faced them, they far exceeded my previous conceptions, like the morning that we drove away from this when the sun was rising. No doubt you remember it. The hills have been clear and lovely ever since I arrived. The snow pure and sharply defined, and apparently near in the dark blue atmosphere the glaciers thundering unremittingly as the ice is melting. When clouds gather, they lie lightly on the base of the mountains, the summits of which stand forth clear above, or that we could see them together. I have passed this whole day here quietly, and entirely alone. I wished to sketch the outlines of the mountains, so I went out and found an admirable point of view, but when I opened my book, the paper seemed so very small that I hesitated about attempting it. 
I have indeed succeeded in giving the outlines what is called correctly, but every stroke looks so formal when compared with the grace and freedom which everywhere here pervade nature, and then the splendor of color. In short, this is the most brilliant point of my travels, and the whole of my excursion on foot, so solitary, independent, and enjoyable, is something new to me, and a hitherto unknown pleasure. I must, however, relate how I came here, otherwise my letter at last will contain nothing but exclamations. As I previously wrote to you, I had the most odious weather on the Lago Maggiore in the islands. It continued so incessantly stormy, cold, and wet, but the same evening I took my place in the diligence in rather a sulky humor, and we drove on towards the Simplon. Scarcely had we been journeying for half an hour, when the moon came out, the clouds dispersed, and the next morning the weather was most bright and beautiful. I felt almost ashamed of this undeserved good fortune, and I could now thoroughly enjoy the glorious scenery. The road winding first through the high green hill, then through rocky ravines and meadows, and at last past glaciers and snowy mountains, I had with me a little French book on the subject of the Simplon Road, which both pleased and affected me. For the subject was Napoleon's correspondence with the Directoire about the projected work, and the first report of the general who crossed the mountain, with what spirit and vigor these letters are written, and yet a little swagger too, but with such a glow of enthusiasm that it quite touched me, as I was driven along this capital-level road by an Austrian postillion. I compared the fire and poetry displayed in every description contained in these letters, I mean those of the subaltern general, with the eloquence of the present day, which leaves you so terribly cold, and it is so odiously prosaic in all its philanthropic views, and so lame, where there is plenty of fanfornade, but no genuine youth, and I could not but feel the great epoch has passed away for ever. I was unable to divest myself from the idea that Napoleon never saw this work, one of his favorite conceptions, for he never crossed the Simplon when the road was finished, and was thus deprived of this great gratification. High up in the Simplon village, all is bleak, and I actually shivered from cold for the first time during the last year and a half. A neat civil Frenchwoman keeps the inn on the summit, and it would not be easy to describe the sensation of satisfaction caused by its thrifty cleanliness, which is nowhere to be found in Italy. We then descended into the Valais as far as Brieg, where I stayed all night, overjoyed to find myself once more among honest natural people who could speak German and who plundered me into the bargain in the most infamous manner. The following day I drove through the Valais, enchanting journey. The roads all along, like those you have seen in Switzerland, ran between two lofty ranges of mountains, their snowy peaks starting up at intervals, and through avenues of green, leafy walnut trees standing in front of pretty brown houses, below the wild great Rhone, past Link, and every quarter of an hour a village with a little church. From Martigny, I travelled for the first time in my life, literally on foot, and as I found the guides too dear, I went on quite alone, and started with my cloak and knapsack on my shoulders. About a couple of hours later, I met a stout peasant lad, who became my guide and also carried my knapsack. And so we went on, past Forclade de Chi, a little dairy village, where I breakfasted on milk and honey, and thence to the Col de Balm, the whole valley of Chamonix and Mont Blanc with all its precipitous glaciers, lay before me bathed in sunshine. A party of gentlemen and ladies, one of the latter, very pretty and young, came from the opposite side on mules, with a number of guides. Scarcely had we all assembled under one roof, when subtle vapors began to rise, shrouding first the mountains and then the valley, and at last thickly covering every object, so that soon nothing was to be seen. The ladies were afraid of going out into the fall, just as if they were not already in the midst of it. At last I set off, and from the window I watched with singular spectacle, the caravan leaving the house, all laughing and talking loudly in French and English and patois. The voices presently became indistinct, then the figures likewise, and last of all I saw the pretty girl in her wide scotch cloak, then only glimpses of grey shadows at intervals, and they all disappeared. A few minutes later I ran down the opposite side of the mountain with my guide. We soon emerged once more into sunshine and entered the green valley of Chamonix, with its glaciers, and at length arrived here at the Union. I have just returned from a ramble to mont the Mer de Glace, and to the source of the Ervion. You know the splendid scenery, and so you will forgive me if, instead of going to Geneva tomorrow, I make first the tour of Mont Blanc, that I may become acquainted with this personage from the southern side also, which is, I hear, the most striking. Farewell, dear parents. May we have a happy meeting. Yours, 
Felix. Chanet, August 6th, 1831. My dear sisters, you know I have read Oito's Africa from beginning to end, but still I do not think you know where Chanet is situated. So fetch out Keller's old travelling map, that you may be able to accompany me on my wanderings. Trace with your finger a line from Vevey to Clarence, and thence to the Dent de Jamin. This line represents a footpath, and where your finger has been my legs also went this morning, for it is now only half past seven, and I am still fasting. I mean to breakfast here, and am writing to you in a neat wooden room, waiting till the milk is made warm for me. Without, I have a view of the bright blue lake, and so I now begin my journal and mean to continue it as I best can during my pedestrian tour. After breakfast. Heavens, here is a pretty business. My landlady has just told me with a long face that there is not a creature in the village to show me the way across the don or to carry my knapsack except a young girl, the men being all at work. I usually set off every morning very early and quite alone, with my bundle on my shoulders, because I find guides from the inns both too expensive and too tiresome. A couple of hours later, I hire the first honest-looking lad I see, and so I travel famously on foot. I need not say how enchanting the lake and the road hither were. You must recall for yourself all the beauties you once enjoyed there. The footpath is in the continued shade, under walnut trees and uphill, past villas and castles, along the lake which glitters through the foliage, villages everywhere, and brooks and streams rushing along from every nook and every village the neat tidy houses it is all quite too charming and you feel so fresh and so free here comes the girl with her steeple hat i can tell you she is vastly pretty into the bargain and her name is pauline she has just packed my things into her wicker basket adieu evening chateau duex candlelight i have had the most delightful journey what would i not give to procure you such a day but then you must first become two youths and be able to climb actively and drink milk when the opportunity offered and treat with contempt the intense heat, the many rocks in the way, the innumerable holes in the path, and the still larger holes in your boots. And I fear you are rather too dainty for this. But it was most lovely. I shall never forget my journey with Pauline. She is one of the nicest girls I ever met. So pretty and healthy-looking, and naturally intelligent. She told me anecdotes about her village, and I in return told her about Italy. But I know who was the most amused. The previous Sunday, all the young people of distinction in her village had gone to a place far across the mountain to dance there in the afternoon. They set off shortly after midnight, arrived while it was still dark, lighted a large fire, and made coffee. Towards morning, the men had running and wrestling matches before the ladies. We passed a broken hedge, testifying the truth of this, and they danced, and were at home again by Sunday evening, and early on Monday morning they all resumed their labors in the vineyards. By heaven, I felt a strong inclination to become a Vaudois peasant while I was listening to Pauline, when from above she pointed out to me the villages where they dance when the cherries are ripe, and others where they dance when the cows go to pasture in the meadows and give milk. Tomorrow they are to dance in saint Gingolf. They row across the lake, and any one who can play takes his instrument with him. But Pauline is not to be of the party, because her mother will not allow it, for dread of the wide lake and many other girls also do not go for the same reason, as they all cling together. She then asked my leave to say good-bye to a cousin of hers, and ran down to a neat cottage in the meadow. Soon the two girls came out together and sat on a bench and chattered. On the Col de Jamin above, I saw her relations busily mowing and herding the cows. What cries and shouts ensued? Then those above began to yodel, on which they all laughed. I did not understand one sibyl of their patois, except the beginning, which was adieu perial. All these sounds were taken up by a merry mad echo, that shouted and laughed and yodeled too. Towards noon we arrived at the Allier, where I had rested for a time. I once more shrouded my knapsack, for a fat old man provoked me by offering to carry it for me. Then Pauline and I shook hands, and we took leave of each other. I descended into the meadows, and if you do not care about Pauline, or if I have bored you with her, it is not my fault, but that the mode in which I have described her, nothing could be more pleasant in reality, and so was my future journey. I came to a cherry orchard where the people were gathering the fruit, so I lay down on the grass and ate cherries for a time along with them. I took my midday rest at Latine in the clean wooden house. The carpenter who built it gave me his company to some roast lamb, and pointed out to me with pride every table and press and chair. 
At length I arrived here, at night, through dazzling green meadows, interspersed with houses, surrounded by fir trees and rivulets. The church here stands on a velvet green eminence, more houses in the distance, and still further away huts and rocks, and in a ravine patches of snow still lying on the plain. It is one of those idyllic spots such as we have seen together in Watuel, but the village smaller and the mountains more green and lofty. I must conclude, however, today by a high eulogy on the canton de Vaux. Of all the countries I know, this is the most beautiful, and it is the spot where I should most like to live when I become really old. The people are so contented and look so well, and the country also. Coming from Italy, it is quite touching to see the honesty that still exists in the world. Happy faces, a total absence of beggars, or saucy officials. In short, there is the most complete contrast between the two nations. I thank God for having created so much that is beautiful, and may it be his gracious will to permit us all, whether in Berlin, England, or in the Chateau d'Oex, to enjoy a happy evening and a tranquil night. Botihue, August 7th, evening. The lightning and thunder are terrific outside, and torrents of rain besides. In the mountain, you first learn respect for weather. I have not gone further, for it would have been such a pity to traverse a lonely Simon valley under an umbrella. It was grey morning, but delightfully cool for walking in the forenoon. The valley of Sonnen, and the whole road, is increasingly fresh and gay. I am never weary of looking at the Vindia. I do believe that if during a long life I were always gazing at undulating verdant meadows, dotted over with reddish-brown houses, I should always experience the same pleasure in looking at them. The road winds the whole way through the meadow of this kind, and past running streams. At noon I dined at Zweisimen, in one of those enormous Bernese houses, where everything glitters with neatness and cleanliness, and where even the smallest detail is carefully attended to. I there dispatched my knapsack by the diligence of the Interlaken, and am now about to walk as a regular pedestrian through the country. I showed to my pocket a brush and a comb, and my sketchbook. This is all I require, but I am very tired. May the weather be fine tomorrow. Themis the eighth. A pretty affair. The weather is three times as bad as ever. I must give up my plan of going to Interlaken today, as there is no possibility of getting on. For the last few hours the water has been pouring straight down, as if the clouds above had been fairly squeezed out. The roads aren't as soft as feather beds. Only occasional shreds of the mountains are to be seen, and even these but rarely. I almost thought sometimes that I was in the Markrovate of Bandenberg, and that the Simon Valley looked perfectly flat. I was obliged to button my waistcoat tight over my sketchbook, for very soon my umbrella was of no use whatever, and so I arrived here to dinner about one o'clock. I had my breakfast in the following place. End of section 16. Section 17 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. Translated by Grace Wallace. August 8th through August 13th, 1831. Weisenberg, August 8th. I sketched this on the spot with a pen, so do not laugh at the bold stream. I passed the night very uncomfortably at Botiken. There was no room in the inn, owing to a fair, so I was obliged to lodge in an adjacent house, where there were swarms of vermin quite as bad as in Italy, a creaking house clock striking hoarsely every hour, and a baby that screeched the whole night. I really could not help for a time noticing the child's cries, for it screamed in every possible key, expressive of every possible emotion, first anger, then furious, then whining, and when it could screech no longer, it grunted in a deep bass. Let no one tell me that we must wish to return to the days of our childhood, because children are so happy. I am convinced that such a little mortal as this lies into a rage just as we do, and has also his sleepless nights, his passions, and so forth. This philosophical view occurred to me this morning, while I was sketching Weisenberg, and so I wished to communicate it to you on the spot. But I took up the Constitutionnel, in which I read that Casimir Perrier article on the cholera, which I should like to transcribe, for it is so extraordinary. The existence of this disease is totally and absolutely denied, and only one person has it in Danzig, a Jew, and he got well. Then followed a number of Hegelisms in French, in the election of the deputies. O oh, world! As soon as I had finished reading the paper, I was obliged to set off again in the rain through the meadows. No such enchanting country as this is to be seen, even in a dream. 
and the worst weather, the little churches, and the numerous houses, and shrubs and rills are still truly lovely. The venture today was quite in its element. Dinner has been long over, and it is still pouring. I intend to go no further than Spie this evening. I regret much that I can neither see this place, which seems beautifully situated, nor Spie, which I know of from Rosel's sketches. This is, in fact, the climax of the whole Simon Valley, and thence the old song says, Music Transcribed. seeing this the whole day while walking along the Cibatal, however showed no gratitude for the compliment and the rain continued unremittingly Vierler evening they could not take me in at spie for there is no inn there where you can lodge so i was obliged to return here i very much admired the situation at spie it is built on a rock which projects into the lake with numbers of turrets and gables and peaks there i saw a manor house with an orangery a sulky-looking nobleman with two sporting dogs at his heels, a little church and terraces with bright flowers. It was all very lovely. Tomorrow I shall see it from the other side, if the weather permits. Today it has rained for three hours consecutively, and I was well soaked on the way here. The mountain streams are superb in such weather, for they leap and rage furiously. I crossed one of these demons, the Kanda, which seemed to have taken leave of its senses, leaping and blustering and foaming. The water looked quite brown and scattered its yellow sprays in all directions. A black peak of the mountains was here and there visible through the rain-laden clouds, which hung deeper into the valley than I ever before saw them. Yet the day was most enjoyable. Further, the ninth morning. Today the weather is worse than ever. It has rained the whole night through, and this morning, too, it is pouring. I have, however, intimated that I shall not set off in such weather, and if it continues I shall write to you again tonight from Verler. In the meantime, I have an opportunity of making acquaintance with my Swiss host. They are very primitive. I could not get on my shoes because they had shrunk, owing to the rain. The landlady asked if I wished to have a shoehorn, and as I said I did, she brought me a tablespoon, but it answered the purpose. And moreover, they are eager politicians. Over my bed hangs a horrible distorted face, under which is written, Gleans Beniavdowski. If he had not a kind of Polish costume, it would be difficult to discover whether it is intended for a man or a woman, for neither the portrait itself nor the inscription throw much light on the subject. Evening and Untersee All jesting is turned into sad earnest, which in these days may easily be the case. The storm has raged furiously and caused great damage and devastation. The people here say that they remember no more violent storm and rain for many years, and the hurricane rushes on with such incredible rapidity. This morning early, the weather was merely wet and disagreeable, and yet this afternoon all the bridges are swept away, and every passage blocked up for the moment. There's been a landslip at the Lake of Brienz, and everything is in an uproar. I have just heard here that war has been proclaimed in Europe, so the world certainly bears a wild, bleak aspect at the time, and I ought to feel thankful that at all events, for the present, I have a warm room here, and a comfortable roof over my head. The rain ceased for a time early this morning, and I thought that the clouds were fairly exhausted, so I left Verlier, but soon found that the roads were sadly cut up, but worse was to come. The rain began again gently, but came down so violently about nine o'clock, and in such sudden squalls, that it was evident something strange was brewing. I crept into a half-built hut, where a great mass of fodder was lying, and nestled comfortably among the fragrant hay. A soldier of the canton, who on his way to Tun, also crept in from the other side and in the course of an hour, as the weather did not improve, we went on our different path. I was obliged to take shelter again under the roof at Leisingen, and waited there a long time, but as my luggage was at Interlaken, a distance only two hours from thence, I thought that I would set the weather at defiance. So about one o'clock I set out for Interlaken. There was literally nothing to be seen but the grey surface of the lake, no mountains, and seldom even the outlines of the opposite shore. The little springs, which, as you may remember, often run along by the footpaths, have swollen into streams, through which I was obliged to wade, and where the road was hilly, the waters accumulated in the hollows and formed a pool, so I was forced to jump over dripping hedges into marshy meadows. The small blocks of wood, by means of which brooks are crossed here, lay deep under the water. At one moment I found myself between two of these brooks, which had run into each other, 
and for a considerable time I was obliged to walk against the current, above my ankles in water, while the streams are black or chocolate brown, looking like earth flowing along. Torrents poured down from above, the wind shook down the water from the dripping walnut trees, the waterfalls which tumbled into the lake thundered frightfully from both shores. You could trace the course of the brown muddy streaks rushing along through the pure waters of the lake, which, in the midst of all this uproar, remained perfectly tranquil, its surface scarcely ruffled, quietly receiving all the blustering streams that poured into its bosom. A man now came up, who had taken off his shoes and stockings, and turned up his trousers. This made me feel rather nervous. Presently I met two women, who said that I could not go through the village, for all the bridges were gone. I asked how far it was to Interlaken. A good hour, they said. I could not make up my mind to turn further, because the waters were rushing down so impetuously from the mountains, and certainly there was fine commotion in the middle of the village. The muddy stream had swept everything along with it, eddying round the houses and running along the meadows and footpaths, and finally thundering down into the lake. Luckily there was a little boat there, in which I ferried across to Nose. Through this expedition, in an open boat, in torrents of rain, was far from pleasant. My condition, when I arrived at Nose, was miserable enough. I looked as if I wore long black boots over my light-colored trousers, my shoes and stockings quite up to my knees, dark brown. Then came the original white, then a soaked blue paletot. Even my sketchbook, that I had buttoned under my waistcoat, was wet through. I arrived in this plight at Interlaken where I was very ill-received, for the people there either could not or would not find room for me, and so I was forced to return to Untersi, where I am famously lodged, and most comfortable. Singularly enough, I had been all along anticipating, with such pleasure, revisiting the inn at Interlaken, of which I had so many reminiscences. I drove up in my little Naus carriage to the Nussbaumplatz, and saw the well-known glass gallery. The pretty landlady, too, came to the door, but somewhat aged and altered, Neither the dreadful storms nor the various discomforts I'd endured annoyed me half so much as not being able to retain at Interlaken. Consequently, for the first time since I left Vevey, I was so out of humor for half an hour and obliged to. Music transcribed. Sing Beethoven's Adagio in A-flat major three or four times over before I could recover my equanimity. I learned here, for the first time, the damage the storm had already done, and may yet do, for the rain is still incessant, half past nine o'clock at night. The bridge at Zwilchiden is carried away. The Vetturini from Bjans in Greenswald will not encounter the risk of driving home, from the fear of some rock falling on their heads. The water here has risen to within a foot and a half of the R bridge. The gloom of the sky I cannot describe. I mean to wait here patiently. Besides, I do not require the aid of localities to enable me to sum it up my reminiscences. They have given me a room where there is a piano. It indeed bears the date of the year 1794, and somewhat resembles in tone the little old Siraman in my room at home. So I took a fancy to it at the very first chord I struck, and it also recalls you to my mind. This piano has outlived many things, and probably never dreamt that I was likely to compose by its aid, as I was not born till 1809, now full two and twenty years ago. In the meantime, the piano, though seven and thirty years old, has plenty of good material in it yet. I have some new leader in hand, dear sisters. You have not seen my favorite one in E major, Auf der Reise. It is very sentimental. I am now composing one which will not, I fear, be very good. But it will, at all events, please us three, for it is at least well intended. The words are Goethe's, but I don't say what they are. It is very daring in me to compose for this poetry, and the words are by no means suitable for music. But I thought them so divinely beautiful that I could not resist singing them to myself. Enough for today, so good night, dear ones. August 10th. The weather this morning is clear and bright, and the storm has passed away. Would that all storms ended as quickly, and were soon allayed. I have passed a glorious day sketching, composing, and inhaling fresh air. In the afternoon, I went back on horseback to Interlaken, for no man can go there on foot at this moment. The whole road is flooded, so that even on horseback I got very wet. In this place, too, every street is inundated and impassable. How beautiful Interlaken is! How humble and insignificant we feel when we see how splendid the good Lord has made this world! 
and nowhere can you see it in greater magnificence than here. I sketch for my father one of the walnut trees he so admires, and for the same reason I mean to send him a faithful drawing of one of the Bernese houses. Various parties of ladies and gentlemen and children drove past and stared at me. I thought to myself that they were now enjoying the same luxury I formerly did, and would fain have called out to them not to forget this. Towards evening, the snowy mountains were glowing in the clearest outlines and in the loveliest hues. When I came back, I asked for some music paper, and they referred me to their pastor, and he to the forest ranger, whose daughter gave me two pretty neat sheets. The lead which I alluded to yesterday is now finished. I cannot help after all telling you what it is, but you must not laugh at me. It is actually, but don't think I am seized with hydrophobia, a sonnet. Der liebende Scheit. I'm afraid its merit is not great. I think it was more inwardly felt than outwardly well expressed. Still, there are some good passages in it, and tomorrow I am going to set to music a little poem of Uland's. A couple of pieces for the piano are also in progress. I can unfortunately form no judgment of my new compositions. I cannot tell whether they are good or bad. And this arises from the circumstance that all the people to whom I have played anything for the last twelve months forthwith glibly declared it to be wonderfully beautiful, and that will never do. I really wish that someone would let me have a little rational blame once more, or what would be still more agreeable, a little rational praise, and then I should find it less indispensable to act the censor towards myself and to be so distrustful of my own powers. Nevertheless, I must go on writing in the meantime. When I was at the forest strangers, I heard that the whole country was devastated, and the most sad intelligence comes from all sides. All the bridges in the Osleaf Valley are entirely swept away and also many houses and cottages. A man came here today from Latterbunen, and he was up to his shoulders in water. The high road is ruined, and what sounded most dismal of all to me, a quality of furniture and household things were seen floating down the Kanda, coming no one knows whence. Happily the waters are beginning to subside, but the damage they have done cannot so easily be repaired. My travelling plans have also been considerably disturbed by these inundations, for, if there be any risk, I shall certainly not go into the mountains. The eleventh. So I now close the first part of my journal and send it off to you. Tomorrow I shall begin a new one, for I intend then to go to Lautenbrunnen. The road is practically for pedestrians, and not an idea of any danger. Travelers from thence have come here today, but for carriages the road will not be passable during the remainder of the year. I purpose, therefore, proceeding across the lesser Scheideck to Grindelwald and by the great Scheideck to Merien, by Ferka and Grimsel to Altorf, and so on to Lucerne, storms, rain, and everything else permitting, which means, if God will. This morning early, I was out on the harder and saw the mountains in the utmost splendor. I never remember the Jungfrau so clear and so glowing as both yesterday evening and at early dawn today. I rode back to Interlaken, where I finished my sketch of the walnut tree. After that I composed for a time, and wrote three waltzes for the forest ranger's daughter on the remaining music paper she had given me, politely presenting them to her myself. I have just returned from a watery expedition to an inundated reading room, as I wish to see how the poles are getting on. Unluckily there is no reference to them in the papers. I must now occupy myself till the evening in packing, but I am most reluctant to leave this room where I am so comfortable, and shall sadly miss my little piano. I intend to sketch the view from this window, with my pen on the back of my letter, and also to write out the second lead, and then Untersee will soon also belong to my reminiscences. Ach, Weichnell. I quote myself, which is not over-modest. These lines recur to me but too often, when the days are shortening. The leaves of the traveling map turned over, first Weimar, then Munich, and lastly Vienna, are all things of the past year. Well, here you have my window. An hour later. My plans are altered, and I stay here till the day after tomorrow. The people say that by that time the roads will be considerably better, and there is plenty both here to see and to sketch. The R has not risen to such a height for seventy years. Today people were stationed on the bridge, with poles and hooks, watching to catch any fragments of the broken-down bridges. It did not look so strange to see a black object come swimming along in the distance from the hills, which was at last recognized to be a piece of balustrade or crossbeam, or something of the sort, when all the people made a rush at it and tried to fish it up with their hooks, and at length succeeded in dragging the monster out of the water. But enough of water, that is, 
of my journal. It is now evening and dark. I am writing by candlelight and should be so glad if I could knock at your door and take my seat beside you at the round table. It is the old story over again. Wherever it is bright and cheerful and I am well and happy, I most keenly feel your absence and most long to be with you again. Who knows, however, whether we may not come here together in future years and then think of this day as we now do of former ones. But as none can tell you whether this may ever come to pass, I shall meditate no longer on the subject, but write out my lead, take another peep of the mountains, wish you all happiness and good fortune, and thus close my journal. Lato Brunin, August 13th, 1831. I have just returned from an expedition on foot to Strandby Bach and to Brighton. All that you can by possibly conceive as to the grandeur and imposing forms of the mountains here must fall short of the reality of nature. That Goethe could write nothing in Switzerland but a few weak poems, and still weaker letters, is to me incomprehensible, as many other things in this world. The road here is again in a lamentable state, where, six days ago, there was the most beautiful highway. There is now only a desolate mass of rocks, numbers of huge blocks lying about, and heaps of rubbish and sand. No trace whatever of human hands to be seen. The waters, indeed, have entirely subsided, but they are still in a troubled state, for from time to time you can hear the stones tossed about, and the waterfalls also in the midst of their white foam rolled down black stones into the valley. My guide pointed out to me a pretty new house, standing in the midst of a wild, turbulent stream. He said that it belonged to his brother-in-law and formerly stood in a beautiful meadow, which had been very profitable. The man was obliged to leave the house during the night. The meadow has disappeared forever, and masses of pebbles and stones have observed the place. He was never rich, but now he is poor, he said, in concluding his sad story. The strangest thing is that in the very center of this frightful devastation, Luchdina, having overflowed the whole extent of the valley, among the marshy meadows and masses of rocks, where there is no longer even a trace of the road, stands a charbonque, and is likely to stand for some time to come. It chanced that the people in it wished to drive through at the very time of a hurricane, then came to an inundation, so they were forced to leave the carriage and everything else to fate. Thus the Char Blanc is still standing, waiting there. It was a very frightful sight when we reached the spot where the whole valley, with its roads and embankments, is a perfectly rocky sea, and my guide, who went first, kept whispering to himself, The torrent had carried into the middle of the stream some large trunks of trees, which are standing aloft, for at the same moment some huge fragments of rock having been flung against them the bare trees were closely wedged in betwixt them and they now stand nearly perpendicular in the bed of the river i could never come to an end where i tried to tell you all the various forms of havoc which i saw between this place and intercy still the beauty of the valley made a stronger impression on me than i can describe it is much to be regretted that when you were in this country you went no farther than Stabach for it is from there that the valley of Lauterbrunnen really begins. You gradually approach the mountains covered with snow. The Svatza Mont and all the other snowy mountains in the background become more mighty and grand, and on every side bright, foaming cascades tumble into the valley. You gradually approach the mountains covered with snow and the glaciers in the background, through the pine woods and oaks and maple trees. The moist meadows, too, were covered with a profusion of brilliant flowers, Snakewort, wild scabious, capanulas, and many other. Nulucina has accumulated masses of stones at the sides, having swept among fragments of rocks, as my guide said, bigger than a stove, than the carved brown wooden houses and the hedges. It is all beautiful beyond measure. Unfortunately, we cannot get to Shimadi Bach, as the bridges, paths, and fords were all gone, but it was a walk I can never forget. I also tried to sketch the moch. But what can you hope to do with a small pencil? Hegel indeed says that every single human thought is more sublime than the whole of nature. But in this place I consider that too presumptuous. The axiom sounds indeed very fine, but it is a confounded paradox nevertheless. I am quite contented in the meantime to adhere to nature, which is the safest of the two. You know the situation of the inn here, and if you cannot recall it, refer to my former Swiss drawing book, where you will find it sketched badly enough, and where I put in a footpath in the front, from imagination, which made me laugh heartily today, when I thought of it. I am at this moment looking out of the same window and gazing at the dark mountains, for it is late in the evening, that is, a quarter to eight o'clock, 
and I have an idea, which is more sublime than the whole of nature. I mean to go to bed, and so good night, dear ones. End of section 17. Section number 18 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christina Lorellino. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. Translated by Grace Jane Wallace. August 14th through August 23rd. The 14th, 10 o'clock in the forenoon, from the dairy hut on the Vengern Alp, in heavenly weather, I send you my greetings. Grindelwald, evening. I could not write more to you early this morning. I was most reluctant to leave the young Frau. What a day this has been for me. Ever since we were here together, I have wished to see the Lesser Schiedek once more. So I woke early today, with some misgivings, for so much might intervene. Bad weather, clouds, rain, fogs, but none of these occurred. It was a day as if made on purpose for me to cross the Vengaran Alp. The sky was flecked with white clouds, floating far above the highest snowy peaks. No mists below on any of the mountains, and all their pinnacles glittering brightly in the morning air. Every undulation and the face of every hill, clear and distinct. Why should I even attempt to portray it? You have already seen the Vengaran Alp, but at that time we had bad weather, whereas today the whole mountain range was in holiday attire. Nothing was wanting, from thundering avalanches to its being Sunday, and people dressed in their best going to church, just as it was then. The hills had only dwelt in my memory as gigantic peaks, for their great altitude had entirely absorbed me. Today I was struck with amazement at the immense extent of their base, their solid, spacious masses, and the connection of all these huge piles, which seemed to lean towards each other, and to reach out their hands to one another. In addition to this, you must imagine every glacier and snowy plateau and point of rock dazzlingly lighted up and glittering. Then the far summits of distant mountain ranges stretching hither, as if surveying the others. I do believe that such are the thoughts of the Almighty. Those who do not yet know him may here see him and the nature he created, visibly displayed. Then the fresh, bracing air, which refreshes you when weary and cools you when it is warm, and so many springs. I must at some future time write you a separate treatise on springs, but I have not time for it today, as I have something particular to tell you. Now you will say, I suppose, he came down the mountain again and is going to inform us once more how beautiful Switzerland is. Not at all. When I arrived at the herdsman's hut, I was told that in a meadow far up the Alps there was to be a great fete this very day, and I saw people at intervals climbing the mountain. I was not at all fatigued. An alpine fete is not to be seen every day. The weather said yes. The guide was willing. Let us go to Intramon, said I. The old herdsman went first. So we were obliged to climb very vigorously, for Intramon is more than a thousand feet higher than the Lesa Shedic. The herdsman was a ruthless fellow, for he ran on before us like a cat. He soon took pity on my guide and relieved him of my cloak and knapsack, but even with them he continued to push forward so eagerly that we really could not keep up with him. The path was frightfully steep. He extolled it, however, saying that there was a much nearer but much steeper track. He was about sixty years of age, and when my youthful guide and I with difficulty surmounted a hill, we invariably saw him descending the next one. We walked on for two hours in the most fatiguing path I ever encountered. First a steep ascent, then down again into a hollow, over heaps of crumbling stones and brooks and ditches, across two meadows covered with snow, in the most profound solitude, without a footpath, or the most remote trace of the hand of man. Occasionally we could still hear the avalanches from the young Frau, otherwise all was still, and not a tree to be seen. When this silence and solitude had continued for some time, and we had clambered to the top of a grassy acclivity, we suddenly came in sight of a vast number of people standing in a circle, laughing, speaking, and shouting. They were all in gay dresses, 
and had flowers in their hats. There were a great many girls, some tables with casks of wine, and all around deep, solemn silence, and tremendous mountains. It was singular that while I was in the act of climbing, I thought of nothing but rocks and stones, and the snow in the track. But the moment I saw human beings, all the rest was forgotten, and I only thought of men, and their sports, and the merry fete. It was really a fine sight. The scene was in a spacious green meadow far above the clouds. Opposite were the snowy mountains in all their prodigious altitude. More especially, the dome of the great Eiger, the Schreckhorn, and the Wiederhorner, and all the others as far as the Blumli's Alp, the Lauterbrunnen Valley lay far beneath us in the misty depths, quite small, as well as our road of yesterday, with all the little cataracts like threads, the houses like dots, and the trees like grass. Far in the background, the Lake of Thun occasionally glanced out of the mist. The crowd now began wrestling and singing and drinking and laughing, all healthy, strong men. I was much amused by the wrestling, which I had never before seen. The girls served the men with kirsch, wasser, and schnapps. The flasks passed from hand to hand, and I drank with them, and gave three little children some cakes, which made them quite happy. A very tipsy old peasant sang me some songs. Then they all sang. Then the guide favored us with a modern song, and then little boys fought. Everything pleased me on the Alps, and I remained lying there till towards evening, and made myself quite at home. We descended rapidly into the meadows below, and soon descried the familiar inn, and its windows glittering in the evening sun. A fresh breeze from the glaciers began to blow. This soon cooled us. It is now getting late, and from time to time avalanches are heard. So thus has my Sunday been spent. A fete day indeed. On the Fallhorn, August 15th. I am shivering with cold. Outside, thick snow is falling and the wind raging and blustering. We are 8,000 feet above the level of the sea and a long tract of snow to traverse. But here I am. Nothing can be seen. All day, the weather has been dreadful. When I remember how fine it was yesterday, while I earnestly wish that it may be as fine tomorrow, it reminds me of life. For we are always hovering between the past and the future. Our excursion of yesterday seems as far past and remote as if I knew it only from old memories and had scarcely been present myself. For today, when during five mortal hours we were struggling on, against rain and fog, sticking in the mud, and seeing nothing round us but gray vapors, I could scarcely realize that it ever was or ever will be again fine weather, or that I ever lay idly stretched on this wet marshy grass. Besides, everything here wears such a wintry aspect, heated stoves, thick snow, cloaks, freezing, shivering people. I am at this moment in the highest inn in Europe, and just as in St. Peter's, you look down on every church and on the Simplon, upon every road. So from hence I look down on all other inns, but not morally, for this is little more than a few wooden planks. Never mind. I am now going to bed, and I will no longer watch my own breath. Good night. Tom's a cold. Hospital. August 18th. I have not been able to open my journal for two or three days, as when night came I had no longer time for anything but to dry myself and my clothes at the fire, to warm myself, to sigh over the weather like the stove behind which I took refuge, and to sleep a good deal. Besides, I did not wish to try your patience by my everlasting repetitions of how deep I had sunk in the mud, and how incessantly it rained, and so forth. During the last few days in reality, I went through the most beautiful country, and yet saw nothing but thick fogs and water in the sky, and from the sky and on the earth. I passed places that I had long wished to visit without being able to enjoy them. What also damped my writing mood was being obliged to battle with the weather, and if it continues the same, I shall only write occasionally. For really, I should have nothing to say but a gray sky, rain, and fog. I have been on the Fallhorn, the Great Schiedick, on Grimselspittel, and today I crossed Grimsel and Furka. And the principal objects I have seen were the points of my shabby umbrella, and I had not even a glimpse of the huge mountains. At one moment today, the Finsterahorn came to light, but it looked as savage as if it wished to devour us. And yet, if we were a single half hour without rain, it was truly beautiful. A journey 
on foot through this country, even in the most unfavorable weather, is the most enchanting thing you can possibly imagine. If the sky were bright, I think the excess of pleasure would be quite overpowering. I must not therefore complain too much of the weather, for I have had my full share of enjoyment. During the last few days, I felt like Tantalus. When I was on the Shidik, a glimpse of the lower part of the Viderhorn was sometimes visible through the clouds, and it seemed beyond measure magnificent and sublime. But I only saw the base. On the fall horn, I could not distinguish objects fifty paces off, although I stayed there till ten o'clock in the morning. We went down to the Shidik in a heavy snowstorm, by a very wet and difficult path, which the incessant rain had made worse than usual. We arrived at Grimselspittel in rain and storm. Today I wished to have ascended the Seedlhorn, but was obliged to give it up on account of the fog. The Mayenwand was shrouded in gray clouds, and we had only a single peep of the Finsterahorn when we were on the Furka. We also arrived here in a torrent of rain and water everywhere. But all this does not signify. My guide is a capital fellow. If it rains, he sings and yodels. If it is fine, so much the better. And though I failed in seeing some of the finest objects, objects, still I saw a great deal that was interesting. On this occasion, I have formed a particular friendship for the glaciers. They are indeed the most marvelous monsters in the world. How strangely they are all tumbled about. Here, a row of jagged points, there, toppling crags, and above, towers and bastions, while on every side, crevices and ravines are visible, all of the most wondrous pure ice that rejects all soil of earth, casting up again on the surface the stones, sand, and gravel flung down by the mountains. Then the superb coloring when the sun shines on them and their mysterious advance. They sometimes move on a foot and a half in a single day, so that the people in the village are in the greatest anxiety and alarm. When the glacier arrives so quietly, and yet with such irresistible force, for it shivers rocks and stones when they lie in the way. Then the ominous crashing and thundering, and the rushing of so many springs near and round. They are splendid miracles. I was in the Rosenlaui Glacier, which forms a kind of cave that you can creep through. It looks as if built of emeralds, only more transparent. Above, around, on all sides, you can see rivulets running between the clear ice. In the center of this narrow passage, the ice has left a large round window, through which you look down on the valley, and issue forth again under an arch of ice, and high above, black peaks rear their heads, from which masses of ice roll down in the boldest undulations. The glacier of the Rhone is the most imposing that I have seen, and the sun burst forth on it as we passed early this morning. This is a suggestive sight, and you get a casual glimpse of the rocky peak of a mountain, a plateau covered with snow, cataracts, and bridges spanning them, and masses of crumbling stones and rocks. In short, even if you see little in Switzerland, it is at all events more than is to be seen in any other country. I have been drawing very busily, and think I have made some progress. I even tried to sketch the Jungfrau. It will at least serve as a reminiscence, and I can enjoy the thought that these strokes were actually made on the spot itself. I see people rushing through Switzerland and declaring that they find nothing to admire there, or anywhere else, except themselves, not the least affected nor roused, remaining cold and prosaic, even in presence of the mountains. When I meet such people, I should like to give them a good drubbing, to Englishman and an English lady are at this moment sitting beside me near the stove. They are as wooden as sticks. We have been traveling the same road for a couple of days, and I declare the people have never uttered a syllable except of abuse, that there were no fireplaces either on the Grimsel or here, but that there are mountains here is a fact to which they never allude. Their whole journey is occupied in scolding their guide, who laughs at them in quarreling with the innkeepers and in yawning in each other's faces. They think everything common place, because they are themselves commonplace. Therefore, they are not happier in Switzerland than they would be in Bernau. I maintain that happiness is relative. Another would thank God that he could see all this, and so I will be that other. Flulen, August 19th. A day made for a journey, fine and enjoyable and bracing. When we wished to start this morning at six o'clock, there was such a storm of sleet and snow that we were obliged to wait till nine o'clock when the sun came forth. The clouds dispersed, and we had delightful bright weather as far as this place. But now somber clouds, heavy with rain, have collected over the lake, so that no doubt tomorrow the old troubles will break loose again. But how glorious this day has been, so clear and sunny. 
We had the most charming journey. You know the St. Gothard Road in all its beauty. You lose much by coming down from above, instead of ascending from this point, for the grand surprise of the Urner Lock is entirely lost, and the new road which has been made, with all the grandeur, as well as convenience, of the Simplone, impairs the effect of the Devil's Bridge, inasmuch as close beside it, a new arch, much bolder and larger, has been constructed, which makes the old bridge look quite insignificant, but the ancient crumbling walls look much more romantic and picturesque, though the view of the Andermatt is thus lost, and the new Devil's Bridge, far from being poetical, still you go merrily downhill all day on a delightfully smooth road, flying rapidly past the various localities, and instead of being sprinkled by the foam of the waterfall on the old bridge as formerly, and endangered by the wind, you now pass along far above the stream, between two ranges of solid parapets." We came past Goshenan and Vassen, and presently appeared the huge firs and beech trees close to Amsteg, then the charming valley of Altorf, with its cottages, meadows, and woods, its rocks, and snowy mountains. We rested at Altorf in a Capuchin convent, situated on a height, and finally, here I am on the banks of the Weirwaldstadt Lake. Tomorrow, I propose crossing the lake to Lucerne, where I hope to find letters from you. I shall then also get rid of a party of young people from Berlin who have been pursuing almost the same route with me, meeting me at every turn, and boring me terribly, the patriotism of a lieutenant, a dyer, and a young carpenter, all three bent on destroying France, was peculiarly distasteful to me. Sarnen, the 20th. I crossed the Weirwaldstadt Lake early this morning, in a continued pour of rain, and found your welcome letter of the 5th in Lucerne. As it contained nothing but good tidings, I immediately arranged a tour of three days to Unterwalden and the Brunig. I intend to call again at Lucerne for your next letter, and then I am off to the west and out of Switzerland. I shall take leave of it with deep regret. The country is beautiful beyond all conception, and though the weather is again odious, rain, and storms the whole day and all through the night, yet the Tallenplatt, the Grutli, Brunnen, and Schweiz, and the dazzling green of the meadows this evening in Unterwalden are too lovely ever to be forgotten. The hue of this green is most unique, refreshing the eye and the whole being. I shall certainly attend to your kind precautionary injunctions, dear mother, but you need be under no apprehensions about me. I am by no means careless with regard to my health, and have not, for a long time, felt so well as during my pedestrian excursions in Switzerland. If eating, and drinking, and sleeping, and music in one's head can make a man healthy, then... God be praised. I may well call myself so, for my guide and I vie with each other in eating and drinking, and not less so, unluckily, in singing. In sleeping alone I surpass him, and though I sometimes disturb him by my trumpet or oboe tones, he in turn cuts short my morning sleep. Please, God, therefore, we shall have a happy meeting. Before that time arrives, however, many a page of my journal must yet travel to you. But even this interval will quickly pass, just as everything quickly passes, except indeed what is best of all. So let us be true and loving to each other. Felix, Angelberg, August 23rd, 1831. My heart is so full that I must tell you about it. In this enchanting valley, I have just taken up Sheila's Wilhelm Tell and read half of the first scene. There is surely no genius like that of Germany. Heaven knows why it is so, but I do think that no other nation could fully comprehend such an opening scene, far less be able to compose it. This is what I call a poem, and a beginning. First the pure, clear verse, in which the lake, smooth as a mirror, and all else, is so vividly described, and then the slow, commonplace Swiss talk, and Baumgarten coming in. It is quite glorious. How fresh, how powerful, how exciting. We have no such work as this in music, and yet even that sphere ought one day to produce something equally perfect. It is so admirable in him, too, to have created an entire Switzerland for himself, inasmuch as he never saw it, and yet all is so faithful and so strikingly truthful, the people and life, the scenery and nature. I was delighted when the old innkeeper here, in a solitary mountain village, brought me from the monastery, the book with the well-known characters and old familiar names. But the opening again quite surpassed all my expectations. It is now more than four years since I read it. I mean presently to go over to the monastery to work off my excitement on the organ. Afternoon. 
do not be astonished at my enthusiasm, but read the scene through again yourself, and then you will find my excitement quite natural. Such passages as those where all the shepherds and hunters shout, Save him! Save him! in the close at the Grootli, when the sun is about to rise, could indeed only have occurred to a German, and above all to Sheila, and the whole piece is crowded with similar passages. Let me refer to that particular one at the end of the second scene, where Till comes with the rescued Baumgarten to Staffelshire, and the agitating conference closes in such tranquility and peace. This, along with the beauty of the thought, is so thoroughly Swiss. Then the beginning of the Grootli, the symphony which the orchestra ought to play at the end, I composed in my mind today, because I could do nothing satisfactory on the little organ. Altogether, a variety of plans and ideas occurred to me. There is a vast deal to do in this world, and I mean to be industrious. The expression that Gotha made use of to me, that Sheila could have supplied two great tragedies every year, with its business-like tone, always inspired me with particular respect. But not till this morning did the full force of its signification become clear to me, and it has made me feel that I must set to work in earnest. Even the mistakes are captivating, and there is something grand in them. And though certainly Bertha, Grudenz, and old Attinghausen seem to me great blemishes, still Sheila's idea is evident, and he was was in a manner forced to do as he has done, and it is consolatory to find that even so great a man could for once commit such an egregious mistake. I have passed a most enjoyable morning, and I feel in the kind of mood which makes you long to recall such a man to life, in order to thank him, and inspiring an earnest desire, one day, to compose a work which shall impress others with similar feelings. Probably you do not understand what induced me to take up my quarters here in Ungelberg. It happened thus. I have not had a single day's rest since I left Untersee, and therefore wished to remain for a day at Meringen, but was tempted by the lovely weather in the morning to come on here. The usual rain and wind assailed me on the mountains, and so I arrived very tired. This is the nicest inn imaginable. Clean, tidy, very small and rustic, an old white-haired innkeeper, a wooden house, situated in a meadow a little apart from the road, and the people so kind and cordial that I feel quite at home. I think this kind of domestic comfort is only to to be found among those who speak the German tongue. At all events, I never met with it anywhere else, and though other nations may not feel the want of it, or scarcely care about it, still I am a native of Hamburg, and so it makes me feel happy and at home. It is not therefore strange that I decided on taking my day's rest here with these worthy old people. My room has windows on every side, commanding a view of the valley. The room is prettily paneled with wood, some colored texts, and a crucifix are hanging on the walls. There is a solid green stove, and a bench encircling it, and two lofty bedsteads. When I am lying in bed, I have the following view. I have failed again in my buildings, and in the hills too, but I hope to make a better sketch of it for you in my book, if the weather is tolerable tomorrow. I shall always consider this valley to be one of the loveliest in all Switzerland. I have not yet seen the gigantic mountains by which it is encompassed, as they have been all day shrouded in mist, but the beautiful meadows, the numerous brooks, the houses, and the foot of the hills, so far as I could see them, are exquisitely lovely. The green of the Unterwalden is more brilliant than in any other canyon and it is celebrated for its meadows even among the Swiss. The previous journey, too, from Sarnen was enchanting, and never did I see larger or finer trees, or a more fruitful country. Moreover, the road is attended with as few difficulties as if he were traversing a large garden. The declivities are clothed with tall, slender beeches, the stones overgrown by moss and herbs. Then there are springs, brooks, small lakes, and houses. On one side is a view of the Unterwalden and its green plains, and shortly after a view of the whole Vale of Hasli, the snowy mountains and cataracts leaping down from rocky precipices. The road, too, is shaded the whole way by enormous trees. Yesterday, early, as I told you, I was tempted by the bright sun to cross the Genthil Valley to ascend the yoke, but on the summit the most dreadful weather set in. We were obliged to make our way through the snow, and this was sometimes anything but pleasant. We speedily, however, emerged out of the sleet and snow, and an enchanting moment ensued. When the clouds broke, while we were still standing in them, and far beneath us, we saw through the mists as through a black veil, the green valley of Ungelberg. We soon made our way down and heard the 
silvery bell of the monastery ring out the Ave Maria. We next saw the white building on the meadow and arrived here after an expedition of nine hours. I need not say how acceptable at such a time is a comfortable inn and how good the rice and milk seems and how long you sleep next morning. Today we have had very disagreeable weather, so they brought me Wilhelm Tell from the library of the monastery, and the rest you know. I was much struck by Sheila having so completely failed in portraying Rudenz, for the whole character is feeble and without sufficient motive, and it seems as if he had resolved purposely to represent him throughout in the worst possible light. His words, in the scene with the apple, might tend to redeem him, but being preceded by that with Bertha, they make no impression. When he joins the Swiss, after the death of Attinghausen, it might be supposed that he is changed, but he instantly proclaims that his Bertha is carried off. So again, he has as little merit as ever. It occurred to me that if he had uttered the very same manly words against Gessler, without the explanation with Bertha having previously taken place, and if such a result had arisen out of this in the following act, the character would have been much better, and the explanatory scene not so merely theatrical as it now is. This is certainly very like the egg and the hen, but I should like to hear your opinion on the subject. I dare not speak to one of our learned men on such matters. These gentlemen are a vast deal too wise. If, however, I chance some of these days to meet one of those youthful modern poets who look down on Schuler and only partly approve of him, so much the worse for him, for I must infallibly crush him to death. Now good night. I must rise very early tomorrow. It is to be a grand fete today in the monastery and a solemn religious service, and I am to play the organ for them. The monks were listening this morning while I was extemporizing a little and were so pleased that they invited me to play the people in and out at their festival tomorrow. The father organist has also given me the subject on which I am to extemporize. It is better than any that would have occurred to an organist in Italy. I shall see tomorrow what I can make of this. I played a couple of new pieces of mine on the organ this afternoon in the church, and they sounded rather well. When I came past the monastery the same evening, the church was closed, and scarcely were the doors shut when the monks began to sing nocturnes fervently in the dark church. They intoned the deep bee, which vibrated splendidly and could be heard far down the valley. End of section 18. Section 19 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi from Italy and Switzerland. Translated by Grace Jane Wallace. August 24th to September 3rd. August 24th. This has been another splendid day, the weather bright and enjoyable, and the bluest sky that I have seen since I left Chamonix. It was a holiday in the village and in all the mountains. After long continued fogs and every variety of bad weather, once more to see from the window in the morning the clear range of mountains and their pinnacles is indeed a grand spectacle. They are acknowledged to be finest after rain, and today they looked as fresh as if newly created. This valley is not surpassed by any in Switzerland. If I ever return here, this shall be my headquarters, for it is even more lovely and more spacious and unconfined than Chamonix, and more free than Interlaken. The Spanwater are incredibly grand peaks, and the round titlis heavily laden with snow, the foot of which lies in the meadows, and the effect of the urna rocks in the distance are also well worth seeing. It is now full moon, and the valley is clothed in beauty. This whole day I have done nothing but sketch, and play the organ. In the morning I performed my duties as organist, it was a grand affair. The organ stands close to the high altar, next to the stalls for the patres, so I took my place in the midst of the monks, a very soul among the prophets. An impatient Benedictine at my side played the double bass, and others the violin. One of their dignitaries was first violin. The pater pro septo stood in front of me, sang a solo, and conducted with a long stick as thick as my arm. The ilive in the monastery formed the choir in their black cows. 
an old decayed rustic played on an old decayed oboe, and at a little distance two more were puffing away composedly at two huge trumpets with green tassels. And yet with all this the affair was gratifying. It was impossible not to like the people, for they had plenty of zeal, and all worked away as well as they could. A mass by Emmerich was given, and every note of it betrayed its powder and pigtail. I played thorough bass faithfully from my ciphered part, adding wind instruments from time to time when I was weary, made the responses, extemporized on the appointed theme, and at the end, by desire of the prelate, played a march, in spite of my repugnance to do this on the organ, and was then honorably dismissed. This afternoon, I played again alone to the monks, who gave me the finest subjects in the world, the credo, among others, a fantasia on the latter was very successful. It is the only one that in my life I ever wished I could have written down, but now I can only remember its general purport, and must ask permission to send Fanny, in this letter, a passage that I do not wish to forget. By degrees, various counter-subjects were introduced in opposition to the canto fermo. First, dotted notes, then triplets, at last rapid semiquavers, through which the credo was to work its way. Quite at the close, the semiquavers became very wild, and arpeggios followed on the whole organ in G minor. I proceeded to take up the theme on the pedal in long notes during the continued arpeggios, so that it ended with A. On the A, I made a pedal point in arpeggios, and then it suddenly occurred to me to play the arpeggios with the left hand alone, so that the right hand could introduce the credo again in the treble with A. Thus, etc. This was followed by a stop on the last note, and a pause, and then it concluded. I wish you had heard it, for I am sure you would have been pleased. It was time for the monks to go to Compline's, and we took leave of each other cordially. They wished to give me letters of introduction for some other places in Unterwalden, but I declined this, as I intend to go to Lucerne early tomorrow, and after that I expect not to be more than five or six days longer in Switzerland. Your Felix To Wilhelm Taubert, Lucerne, August 27th, 1831 I wish to offer you my thanks, but I really do not know where to begin first. Whether for the pleasure your songs caused me in Milan, or for your kind letter which I received yesterday. Both, however, are closely connected, and so I think we have already made acquaintance. It is quite as fitting that we should be presented to each other through the medium of music paper as by a third person in society. Indeed, I think that in the former case you feel even more intimate and confidential. Moreover, Persons who introduced anyone often pronounce the name so indistinctly that you seldom know who is standing before you, and they never say one word as to whether the man is gay and good-humored, or melancholy and gloomy, so we are infinitely better off. Your songs have pronounced your name clearly and plainly. They also disclose what you think and what you are, that you love music and wish to make progress. So thus, perhaps I know you better than if we had frequently met. What a source of pleasure it is, and how cheering, to know there is another musician in the world who has the same purpose and aspirations, and who follows the same paths as yourself. Perhaps you cannot feel this so strongly as I do at this moment, who have just come from a country where music no longer exists among the people. I never before could have believed this of any nation, and least of all of Italy, which such rich and luxuriant nature and such glorious inspiriting antecedents but, alas, the occurrences I laterally witnessed there fully proved to me that even more than harmony is dead in that land, it would indeed be marvelous if any music could exist where there is no solid principle. At last I was really bewildered, and thought that I must have become a hypochondriac, for all the buffoonery I saw was most distasteful to me, and yet a vast number of serious people and sedate citizens entered into it. When they played me anything of their own, and afterwards praised and extolled my pieces, I cannot tell you how repugnant it was to me. I felt disposed to become a hermit, with beard and cowl, and the whole world was at a discount with me. In Italy, you first learn to value a true musician, 
that is, one whose thoughts are absorbed in music, and not in money, or decorations, or ladies, or fame, it is doubly delightful when you find that, without your being aware of it, your own ideas exist and are developed elsewhere. Your songs, therefore, gave me a special pleasure, because I could gather from them that you must be a genuine musician, and so let us mutually stretch out our hands across the mountains. I beg that you will also look on me in the light of a friend, and not write so formally as to my counsel and teaching. This portion of your letter makes me feel almost nervous, and I scarcely know what to say. The most agreeable part, however, is your promise to send me something to Munich, and to write to me again. I will then tell you frankly and freely my honest opinion, and you shall do the same with regard to my new compositions, and thus I think we shall give each other good counsel. I am very eager to see those recent works of yours that you have promised me, for I do not doubt that I shall receive much gratification from them, and many things which are only foreshadowed in the former songs will probably in these become manifest and distinct. I shall therefore say nothing today of the impression your songs have made on me, because possibly any suggestion or question may be already answered in what you are about to send me. I earnestly entreat of you to write to me fully and in detail about yourself, in order that we may become better acquainted. I can then write to you what I propose and what I think, and thus we shall continue in close connection. Let me know what you have recently composed and are now composing, your mode of life in Berlin, and your plans for the future. In short, all that concerns your musical life, which will be of the greatest interest to me. Probably this will be obvious in the music you have so kindly promised me, but fortunately both may be combined. Have you hitherto composed nothing on a greater scale, some wild symphony or opera, or something of that kind? I, for my part, feel at this moment the most invincible desire to write an opera, and yet I have scarcely leisure even to commence any work, however small. I do believe that if the libretto were to be given to me today, the opera would be written by tomorrow. So strong is my impulse towards it. Formerly, the bare idea of a symphony was so exciting that I could think of nothing else when one was in my head. The sound of instruments has such a solemn and glorious effect, and yet for some time past I have laid aside a symphony that I had commenced in order to compose on a cantata of Goethe's, merely because it included, besides the orchestra, voices and a chorus. I intend now, indeed, to complete the symphony, but there is nothing I so strongly covet as a regular opera. Where the libretto is to come from, I know less than ever since last night, when for the first time, for more than a year, I saw a German aesthetic paper. The German Parnassus seems in as disorganized a condition as European politics. God help us! I was obliged to digest the supercilious Menzel, who presumed modestly to depreciate Goethe, and the supercilious Grabe, who modestly depreciates Shakespeare and the philosophers who proclaim Schiller to be rather trivial. Is this new, arrogant, overbearing spirit, this perverse cynicism, as odious to you as it is to me? And are you of the same opinion with myself, that the first and most indispensable quality of any artist is to feel respect for great men, and to bow down in spirit before them, to recognize their merits, and not to endeavor to extinguish their great flame? in order that his own feeble rushlight may burn a little brighter? If a person be incapable of feeling true greatness, I should like to know how he intends to make me feel it. And as all these people, with their airs of contempt, only at last succeed in producing imitations of this or that particular form, without any presentiment of free, fresh, creative power, unfettered by individual opinion, or aesthetics, or criticism, or the whole world besides, as this is the case, do they not deserve to be abused? And I do abuse them. Pray do not take this amiss. Perhaps I have gone too far. But it was long since I had read anything of the kind, and it vexes me to see that such folly still goes on, and that the philosopher who maintains that art is dead still persists in declaring that it is so, as if art could in reality ever die. These are truly strange, wild, and troubled times, and let those who feel that art is no more allow it for haven's sake to rest in peace. But however roughly the storm may rage without, it cannot so quickly succeed in sweeping away the dwelling, 
and he who works on quietly within, fixing his thoughts on his own capabilities and purposes and not on those of others, will see the hurricane blow over and afterwards find it difficult to realize that it ever was so violent as it appeared at the time. I have resolved to act thus so long as I can, and to pursue my path steadily, for at all events no one will deny that music still exists, and that is the chief thing. How cheering it is to meet with a person who has chosen the same object and the same means as yourself, and I would fain tell you how gratifying each new corroboration of this is to me, but I scarcely know how to do so. You must imagine it for yourself, and your own thoughts must supply any deficiencies, so farewell. Pray let me hear from you soon and frequently. I beg to send my kindest wishes to our dear friend Berger. I have been long intending to write to him, but have never yet accomplished it. I shall certainly, however, do so one of these days. Forgive this long, dry letter. Next time it shall be more interesting. And now once more farewell. Yours, Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi. Rigi Calm, August 30th, 1831. I am on the Rigi. I need say no more, for you know this mountain. What can be more grand or superb? I left Lucerne early this morning. All the mountains were obscured, and the weather-wise prophesied bad weather. As however I have always found that the very opposite of what the wise people say invariably occurs. I try to make out signs for myself, though hitherto, in spite of their aid, I have found my predictions quite as false as those of the others. But this morning, I really thought the weather very tolerable. Still, as I did not wish to begin my ascent while all was still shrouded in vapor, for the full horn had taught me caution, I spent the whole morning in sauntering round the foot of the Rigi, gazing eagerly upwards to see if the mists were likely to clear off. At last, about twelve o'clock, at Kusnacht, I stood on the cross path leading towards the Rigi, to the right, and immense to the left and making up my mind not to see the Rigi on this occasion, I took a tender farewell of it, and went through the Hole Gasse to the lake of Zug, along a charming path, past the water, to Arth, but could not resist frequently glancing at the summit of the Rigi calm, to see if it becoming clearer, and while I was dining at Arth, it did clear up, the wind was very favorable, the clouds lifted on every side, so I made up my mind to begin the ascent. There was no time to lose, however, if I wished to witness the sunset, so I went along at a steady mountain pace, and in the course of two hours and three quarters I reached the calm, and the well-known house. I then became aware that there were about forty men standing at the top, uplifting their hands in admiration, and making signs in a state of the greatest excitement. I ran up, and a new and wondrous sight it was. All the valleys were filled with fogs and clouds, and above them the lofty snowy crests of the mountains and the glaciers and black rocks stood out bright and clear. The mists swept onwards, veiling a portion of the scenery. Then came forth the Bernese Alps, the Jungfrau, the Munch, and the Finsterharen, then Titlis and the Unterwalden Mountains. At last the whole range was distinctly visible. The clouds in the valleys now also began to roll away, disclosing the lakes of Lucerne and Zug, and towards the hour of sunset only thin streaks of bright vapor still floated on the landscape. Coming from the Alp and then looking towards the Rigi, it was as if the overture and other portions were repeated at the end of an opera. All the spots whence you have seen such sublime scenery, the Wengern Alp, the Wetterhörne, the Valley of Engelberg, here meet the eye once more in close vicinity, and you can take leave of them all. I had imagined that it was only at first, when still ignorant of the glaciers, that so great an impression was made from the influence of surprise, but I think the effect at the last is even more striking than ever. Schwitz, August 31st Yesterday and today I gratefully recalled the happy auspices under which I first made acquaintance with this part of the world. The remembrance of your profound admiration of these wonders, elevating you above everyday life, has contributed not a little to awaken and to quicken my own perception of them. I often today recurred to your delight and the deep impression it made on me at that time. 
So the Rigi is evidently disposed to be gracious to our family, and in consequence of this kindly feeling towards us, conferred on me today a sunrise quite as brilliant and splendid as when you were here. The waning moon, the lively alpine horn, the long protracted rosy dawn which first stole over the cold, shadowy snowy mountains, the white clouds on the lake of Zug, the clear sharp peaks bending towards each other in all directions, the light which gradually crept on the heights, the restless shivering people wrapped in coverlets, the monks from Maria Zum Schune, nothing was wanting. I could not tear myself away from this spectacle and remained on the summit for six consecutive hours, gazing at the mountains. I thought that when next I saw them, there might be many changes, so I wished to imprint the sight indelibly on my memory. People came and went, and talked of these anxious, troubled times, of politics and of the Grand Mountain Range before us. Thus, the morning passed away, and at last, at half past ten o'clock, I was obliged to go. Indeed, it was high time as I wished to get to Einsiedel the same day, by Hacken. On my way, however, in the steep path leading to Lewards, my trusty old umbrella, which also served me as a mountain staff, broke to pieces. This detained me, so that I preferred remaining here, and tomorrow I hope to be quite fresh for a start. Wallenstadt, September 2nd. Years of rains and storms. Motto of the coppersmith. If you can't sing a new song, then begin the old one afresh. Here am I again in the midst of fogs and clouds, unable to go either backwards or forwards, and if fortune specially favors us, we may have a slight inundation into the bargain. When I crossed the lake, the boatman prophesied very fine weather. Consequently, the rain began half an hour later, and is not likely soon to cease, for there are piles of heavy, gloomy clouds, such as you can only see on the mountains. If it were twice as bad three days hence, I should not care. But it would be grievous indeed if Switzerland were to take leave of me with so ill-omened an aspect. I have this moment returned from the church where I have been playing the organ for three hours far into the twilight. An old man, a cripple, blew the bellows for me, and except him there was not a single soul in the church. The only stops I found available were a very weak croaking flute and a quavering deep pedal diapason of sixteen feet. I contrived to extemporize with these materials and at last subsided into a choral melody in E minor, without being able to remember what it was. I could not get rid of it when all at once it occurred to me that it was a litany, the music of which was in my head because the words were in my heart. So then I had a wide field and plenty of food for extemporizing. At length the consumptive deep bass resounded quite alone in E minor, thus And then came in its turn the flute, high up in the treble, with the choral in the same key, and so the sounds of the organ gradually died away, and I was obliged to stop, from the church being so dark. In the meantime, there was a terrible hurricane of wind and rain outside, and not a trace of the grand lofty rocky precipices, the most dreary weather, and then I read some dreary newspapers, and everything wore a grey hue. Tell me, Fanny, do you know Aubert's Parisian? I consider it the very worst thing he has ever produced, perhaps because the subject was really sublime, and for other reasons also. Aubert alone could have been guilty of composing for a great nation, in the most violent state of excitement, a cold, insignificant piece, quite commonplace and trivial. The refrain revolts me every time I think of it. It is as if children were playing with a drum and singing to it, only more objectionable. The words also are worthless. Little antitheses and points are quite out of place here. Then the emptiness of the music, a march for acrobats, and at the end, a mere miserable imitation of the Marseillais. Such music is not what this epoch demands. Woe to us if it be indeed what suits this epoch, if a mere copy of the Marseillais Heim be all that is required. What in the latter is full of fire and spirit and impetus 
is in the former ostentatious, cold, calculated, and artificial. The Marseillais is as superior to the Parisian as everything produced by genuine enthusiasm must be, to what is made for a purpose, even if it be with a view to promote enthusiasm. It will never breach the heart, because it does not come from the heart. By the way, I never saw such a striking identity between a poet and a musician as between Aubert and Clorin. Aubert faithfully renders note for note, but the other writes word for word. Bragadocio, degrading sensuality, pedantry, epicurism, and parodies of foreign nationality. But why should Clorin be effaced from the literature of the day? Is it prejudicial to anyone that he should remain where he is? And do you read what is really good with less interest? Any young poet must indeed be degenerate, if he does not cordially hate and despise such trash. But it is only too true that the people like him. So it is all very well. It is only the people's own loss. Write me your opinion of the Parisian. I sometimes sing it to myself for fun as I go along. It makes a man walk like a chorister in a procession. Sargon, September 3rd, noon. Wretched weather. It has rained all night and all the morning too, and the cold as severe as in winter. Deep snow is lying on the adjacent hills. There has been again a tremendous inundation in Appenzell, which has done the greatest damage and destroyed all the roads. At the lake of Zurich there are numbers of pilgrimages and the processions on account of the weather. I was obliged to drive here this morning, as all the footpaths were covered with mud and water. I shall remain till tomorrow, when the diligence passes through at an early hour, and I intend to go with it up the valley of the Rhine as far as Altstetten. Tomorrow I shall probably have reached or crossed the boundaries of Switzerland, for my pleasure excursion is now over. Autumn is arriving, and I have no right to complain if I pass a few tiresome days after so many enchanting ones that I can never forget. On the contrary, I think I almost like it. There is always enough to be done, even in Sargan, a wretched hole, and in a regular delage like that of today, for happily an organ is always to be found in this country. There are certainly small and the lower octave, both in the keyboard and the pedal, imperfect, or as I call it, crippled, but still they are organs, and that is enough for me. I have been playing all this morning and really began to practice, for it is a shame that I cannot play Sebastian Bach's principal works. I intend, if I can manage it, to practice for an hour every day in Munich, as after a couple of hours' work today, I certainly made considerable progress with my feet. Nota bene sitting. Ritz once told me that Schneider in Dresden played him the D major fugue in the Hul Temperieren Klavier on the organ, supplying the bass with the pedal. This had hitherto appeared to me so fabulous that I could never properly comprehend it. It recurred to me this morning when I was playing the organ, so I instantly attempted it, and I at least see that it is far from being impossible, and that I shall accomplish it. The subject went pretty well, so I practiced passages from the D major fugue for the organ from the F major toccata and the G minor fugue, all of which I knew by heart. If I find a tolerable organ in Munich, and not an imperfect one, I will certainly conquer these and feel childish delight at the idea of playing such pieces on the organ. The F major toccata, with the modulation at the close, sounded as if the church were about to tumble down. What a giant that cantor was! Besides organ playing, I have a good many sketches to finish. In my new drawing book, one was entirely filled in Engelberg, and then I must eat like 600 wrestlers. After dinner, I practice the organ again, and thus a rainy day passes at Sargan. It seems prettily situated, with a castle on the hill, but I cannot go a step beyond the door. Evening. Yesterday at this time, I still projected a pedestrian tour, and wished at all events to go through the whole of the Appenzo. It was a strange feeling when I learned that all mountain excursions were probably at an end for this year. The heights are covered with deep snow, for just as it has rained here in the valley for 36 hours, it has snowed incessantly on the hills above. The flocks have been obliged to come down into the valley from the Alps, where they ought to have remained for a whole month yet, 
so that all idea of any footpath is out of the question. Yesterday I was still on the hills, but now they will be inaccessible for six months to come. My pedestrian excursions are over. Wondrously beautiful they were, and I shall never forget them. I mean to work hard at music, and high time that I should. I played on the organ till twilight, and was trampling energetically on the pedal, when we suddenly became aware that the deep C-sharp in the great diapason went buzzing softly on without ceasing. All our pressing and shaking and thumping on the keys was of no avail, so we were obliged to climb into the organ among the big pipes. The C-sharp continued gently humming. The faulty lay in the belows. The organist was in the greatest perplexity, because tomorrow is a fat day. At last I stuffed my handkerchief into the pipe, and there was no more buzzing, but no more C-sharp either. I played this passage incessantly, all the same. And it did very well. I am now going to finish my sketch of the glacier of the Ron, and then the day will be at my own disposal, which means that I am going to sleep. I will write to you on the next page tomorrow evening, wherever I am, for today I have no idea where I shall be. Good night. 8 is striking in F minor, and it is raining and blowing in F sharp minor, or G sharp minor. In short, in every possible sharp key. End of section 19